Witnesses to Permanent Revolution The Documentary Record Edited and Translated by Richard B. Day and Daniel Gato Preface The year 2005 was the centenary of the RST Russian Revolution. Over the past century, countless volumes have been written on this subject in every language and from every conceivable political viewpoint. One might well wonder what remains to be said. We have discovered that there are new perspectives to consider, and they come from having the foremost participants give their own accounts of the historical forces at work and the prospects they saw for a revolutionary victory that might affect the history of Europe and even the entire world. The theme of our anthology is the rediscovery and elaboration of the concept of permanent revolution in the years 1903-7. In researching this project we have collected and translated into English for the RST time a series of documents that bring fundamental issues to life in a way that no secondary account possibly could. One one of our principal discoveries is that Leon Trotsky, while certainly the most famous and brilliant proponent of permanent revolution, was by no means its sole author, indeed, several major contributions came from a number of other Marxists, some of whom, such as David Ryazanov, have rarely been mentioned in this connection, while others, Karl Koskai in particular, have most often been regarded as pseudo-revolutionaries whose real commitment was always to parliamentary politics. The documents that we have translated demonstrate not only that, Koskai was a key participant in all discussions of permanent revolution, but also that in the years of the RST Russian Revolution his thinking was often closer to Trotsky's than to Lenin's. Historical research is inevitably a cumulative endeavor, and our work certainly owes much to the efforts of countless others. The task of historians is to clarify great issues RST, but the very act of doing so poses new questions. Nuances have to be discerned, hypotheses have to be validated, and great events can only be fully examined when traced to the consciousness of the actors themselves. In rediscovering the debate over permanent revolution, we owe a special debt to Riyadar Larson and Hartmut Meringer, whose books served as uniquely helpful bibliographical guides. Two we had hoped to complete this project for the centenary of 1905. We missed that target because documents had to be retrieved from numerous libraries in places as far apart as Great Britain, the United States, Canada, Germany, Finland, the Netherlands, and Palestine slash Israel. In translating the documents from German and Russian into English, we have divided the work equally and tried to reproduce both the letter and the spirit of the original texts. There is never a perfect substitute for reading a text in the original, nor can a neatly published translation ever reproduce either the thrill that comes from discovering an obscure insight or the frustration of having to translate it from some barely legible micro-LM. We cannot share those experiences with readers, but we do hope that our efforts will generate deeper understanding of an important debate in Marxist historiography. To that end we have minimized the use of ellipses and provided extensive notations for those who may wish to pursue matters further. Richard B. Day Daniel Gato Introduction The Historical Origin of the Expression Permanent Revolution There is a story, possibly apocryphal, which says that Zhou Enlai, Prime Minister of China from 1949 to 1976, was once asked to comment on the long-run effects of the French Revolution. He is said to have replied that it is too soon to tell. Those who debated the possibility of revolution in Russia from 1903 onwards certainly shared the same conviction, for they made continuous references to the French Revolution of 1789, often measured their own prospects by comparison with it, and adopted much of its political vocabulary, including the concept of permanent revolution or revolution and permanence. On June 17, 1789, the representatives of France's third estate proclaimed themselves to be the National Assembly since they represented the overwhelming majority of the nation. King Louis XVI ordered the Hall of the Estates General to be occupied by armed men, forcing the people's representatives to meet in the tennis court of Old Versailles Street where they adopted the following decree. The National Assembly, considering that it has been called to establish the constitution of the realm, to bring about the regeneration of public order, and to maintain the true principles of monarchy, 
that nothing may prevent it from continuing its deliberations in any place it is forced to establish itself, and, Nally, that the National Assembly exists wherever its members are gathered, decrees that all members of this assembly immediately take a solemn oath never to separate, and to reassemble wherever circumstances require, until the constitution of the realm is established and XED upon solid foundations, and that said oath having been sworn, all members and each one individually con RM this unwavering resolution. With his signature. 1. The tennis court oath denied the king's authority to dissolve the National Assembly and set a precedent for the Berlin and Frankfurt National Assemblies in 1848. After a reactionary ministry had been formed in Prussia by royal order on September 21, 1848, the Neue Rhenesk Zeitung, edited by Karl Marx, cited a letter by a deputy that stated, We have just learned beyond doubt that an entirely counter-revolutionary government has been formed. At tomorrow's session this same government will read out a royal message wherein the prospect of the disbandment of the assembly will be held out. The result of this is a declaration of permanence which will probably lead to a new and very bloody revolution. All parties of the National Assembly are consulting permanently in their usual premises. 2. Half a century later, this expression reappeared in Franz Mehring's introduction to his anthology of writings by Marx and Engels in the Neue Rhenesk Zeitung. Mehring described how, though the Prussian Guard had been defeated by the Berlin proletariat in a Earth Street battle on March 18, 1848, the Frankfurt pre-parliament shrank before its own strength and failed to declare itself permanent sich for permanent zeal or clarin or to set up an armed force for its own defense. 3. This reference has a linguistic connection with the theory of permanent revolution developed by Marx and Engels, but the class content is entirely different, in the case of Prussia in 1848, at issue was the permanence of the bourgeois democratic revolution, whereas, for Marx and Engels, revolution in permanence meant going beyond bourgeois democracy to the proletarian socialist revolution. Permanent revolution in the early writings of Marx and Engels. Marx and Engels referred to permanent revolution three times before writing their address of the Central Committee to the Communist League in March 1850, on each occasion referring to the terrorist phase of the French Revolution in 1793. The RST instance occurred in 1843 in Marx's essay on the Jewish question. Of course, in periods when the political state as such is born violently out of civil society, when political liberation is the form in which men strive to achieve their liberation, the state can and must go as far as the abolition of religion, the destruction of religion but it can do so only in the same way that it proceeds to the abolition of private property, to the maximum, to confiscation, to progressive taxation, just as it goes as far as the abolition of life, the guillotine. IT can achieve this only by coming into violent contradiction with its own conditions of life, only by declaring the revolution to be permanent. 4. The second reference came in 1845 in the Holy Family, a polemic by Marx and Engels directed against their fellow left Hegelians, Bruno Bauer and company. Napoleon represented the last battle of revolutionary terror against the bourgeois society which had been proclaimed by the same revolution, and against its policy. Napoleon, of course, already discerned the essence of the modern state, he understood that it is based on the unhampered development of bourgeois society, on the free movement of private interest, etc. He decided to recognize and protect this basis. He was no terrorist with his head in the clouds. He perfected the terror by substituting permanent war for permanent revolution. 5. A third reference to permanent revolution, again concerning the terrorist phase of the French Revolution, occurred in an article on the Magyar struggle that Engels wrote for the Neue Rhenesk Zeitung one month before publication of the Communist Manifesto. Mass Uprising National Manufacture of Arms, Issue of Bank Notes, Short Shrift for Anyone Hindering the Revolutionary Movement, Revolution in Permanence, in short, all the main features of the glorious year 1793 are found again in the Hungary which Kossuth has armed, organized and inspired with enthusiasm. 6. When Karl Koskai later wrote his class antagonisms in 1789, 
which RST appeared in Die Neue Zeit as a series of articles commemorating the centenary of the French Revolution, he evidently drew from these sources, most probably from Marx's Zur Judenfridge, to describe the years 1793-4 in Paris, the time of the supremacy of the sansculottes. As a period of revolution in Permanence 7. The Communist League and the Revolution of 1848-9. The Communist League, the RST International Proletarian Organization, originated in 1836 in the League of the Just Bund der Gerechten, a utopian communist group following the ideas of Gracchus Babeuf. In 1796, Babeuf had been executed for conspiring to provoke a plebeian uprising aimed at replacing the bourgeois directory with a revolutionary dictatorship leading to pure democracy and egalitarian communism. The League of the Just held its RST conference in London in June 1847, when Engels convinced its members to replace the motto All Men Are Brothers with Marx's slogan Working Men of All Countries, Unite. At the same conference, the organization renamed itself the Communist League Bund der Kommunisten. New rules were drawn up by Marx and Engels and approved by a second congress, also held in London in December 1847. Article I read, the aim of the League is the overthrow of the bourgeoisie, the rule of the proletariat, the abolition of the old bourgeois society which rests on the antagonism of classes, and the foundation of a new society without classes. And without private property. Eight Marx and Engels were commissioned to draw up the organization's program, which became the Communist Manifesto. Nine The policy followed by Marx and Engels during the revolutionary wave of 1848-9 involved much more than establishing new sections of the Communist League in Germany. In his article Marx and the Neue Rhenisch-Zeitung, 1848-49, Engels later pointed out that the German proletariat at RST appeared on the political stage as the extreme democratic party, so that when we founded a major newspaper in Germany, our banner was determined as a matter of course. It could only be that of democracy. If we did not want to do that, then there was nothing left for us to do but to preach communism in a little provincial sheet and to found a tiny sect instead of a great party of action. But we had already been spoiled for the role of preachers in the wilderness, we had studied the utopians too well for T. Hat. 10. Declining the role of sectarian agitators, Marx and Engels joined democratic circles in Cologne and eventually took control of their publication, the Neue Rhenisch-Zeitung, which appeared from June 1, 1848 until May 19, 1849. They followed the tactics prescribed by the Manifesto for Communists in Germany, the GHT with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way, against the absolute monarchy, the feudal landowners, and the petty bourgeoisie, but they never cease, for a single instant, to instill into the working class the clearest possible recognition of the hostile antagonism between bourgeoisie and proletariat so that after the fall of the reactionary classes in Germany, the GHT against the bourgeoisie itself may immediately begin. Marx and Engels believed that the bourgeois revolution in Germany, occurring at a more advanced stage of social development and with a much more developed proletariat than that of England was in the 17th, and France in the 18th century, would be but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution 11. Expecting the German bourgeoisie at RST to lead the popular uprising against feudalism and absolutism along the lines of the French Revolution, 12 Marx and Engels referred to the Neue Rhenisch-Zeitung as the Organ der Demokratie, although it soon ceased to receive financial support from the democratic bourgeoisie. But the massacre of the Paris proletariat after the uprising of June 1848, and the capitulation of the German bourgeoisie before the monarchy and the nobility out of fear of the working class, soon persuaded them that no hope could be placed in even the most extreme bourgeois factions. In December 1848 Marx wrote, The German bourgeoisie developed so sluggishly, timidly, and slowly that at the moment when it menacingly confronted feudalism and absolutism, it saw pitted against itself the proletariat and all sections of the middle class whose interests and ideas were related to those of the proletariat. Unlike the French bourgeoisie of 1789, the Prussian bourgeoisie, when it confronted monarchy and aristocracy, 
was not a class speaking for the whole of modern society. From the RST it was inclined to betray the people and to compromise with the crowned representatives of the old society, for it already belonged itself to the old society, it did not advance the interests of a new society against an old one, but represented refurbished interests within an obsolete society. 13. Marx and Engels changed their tactics in February 1849. 14. Together with Joseph Moll and Karl Schaper, they concentrated their efforts in the Workingmen's Union of Cologne, which also had a representative in the District Committee of Democratic Societies. In April 1849, growing friction between workers and Democrats led to a split in the latter organization, the Workingmen's Union. Recalled its representative, and Marx and his supporters resigned from the committee. On April 14, 1849, Marx wrote, we consider that the present organization of the democratic associations includes too many heterogeneous elements for any possibility of successful activity in furtherance of the cause. We are of the opinion that a closer union of the workers' associations is to be preferred since they consist of homogeneous elements, and therefore we hereby from today withdraw from the Rhenish District Committee of Democratic Associations. 15. A call was then issued to summon a general workingmen's congress in Leipzig, which failed to meet, however, due to mounting government repression. The new tactics of the Communist League also led to a sine cant change of editorial policy at the Neue Rhenesk Zeitung. The famous articles on wage labor and capital, systematically expounding Marx's insight into the extraction of surplus value through exploitation of wage labor, appeared in April 1849. But the tactical move to the left was already too late, and on May 18, 1849, the Prussian government halted publication of the new Irenas Reacting in 1885 on the ensuing events, Engels declared that with the crushing of the Paris proletariat on June 13, 1849, the defeat of the May insurrections in Germany and the suppression of the Hungarian Revolution by the Russians, a great period of the 1848 revolution came to a close 16 the ensuing wave of repression saw most leaders of the workers movement sent either to prison or into exile. Engels on the campaign for the German imperial constitution. By the beginning of 1850, most of the old guard of the communist league reassembled in London, where Marx and Engels resumed publishing the new Irenas Zeitung as a journal politische ökonomische review rather than a daily. Six issues appeared between January and November 1850, including Engels's The Campaign for the German Imperial Constitution Die Deutsche Reichsverfassungskampagne. Engels recounted how the Frankfurt National Assembly had convened in May 1848, and by the following April it had produced a constitutional proposal that included civil liberties and national institutions within the framework of a constitutional monarchy headed by the Hohenzollerns. But the Prussian king, Frederick William IV, refused to accept a crown from the gutter, and most of the larger German states declined to recognize the Constitution. Despite its limitations, however, the Constitution remained as the sole achievement of the revolution, and many Gders rose to its defense. Engels himself participated in the Elberfeld uprising and fought against the Prussians, in June and July 1849, as the aide-de-camp of August Willich. He described the battles of Willich as volunteer corps in the last section of his work, To Die for the Republic. In the same section, he also summarized the logic of permanent revolution. From the political point of view, he wrote, the campaign for the imperial constitution was a failure from the very start because of the compromising role of liberals and democrats. He concluded that the next revolution would have to transfer power directly to the proletariat. Ever since the defeat of June 1848 the question for the civilized part of the European continent has stood thus, either the rule of the revolutionary proletariat or of the classes who ruled before February. A middle road is no longer possible. In Germany in particular the bourgeoisie has shown itself incapable of ruling, it could only maintain its rule over the people by surrendering it once more to the aristocracy and the bureaucracy. In the imperial constitution the petty bourgeoisie attempted an impossible arrangement aimed at postponing the decisive struggle. 
the attempt was bound to fail, those who were serious about the movement were not serious about the imperial constitution, and those who were serious about the imperial constitution were not serious about the movement. This does not mean that the consequences of the campaign for the imperial constitution were any the less significant. Above all the campaign simply ed the situation. It cut short an endless series of attempts at reconciliation, now that it has been lost. Tihi revolution can no longer be brought to a conclusion in Germany except with the complete rule of the proletariat. The campaign for the imperial constitution contributed considerably to the development of class antagonisms in those German provinces where they were not yet sharply developed. The workers and peasants, who suffer just as much as the petty bourgeois under the present dictatorship of the Sabre, did not go through the experience of the last uprising for nothing. Besides having their fallen and murdered brothers to avenge they will take care that when the next insurrection comes it is they and not the petty bourgeois who get the reins in their hands. 17. The Address of the Central Committee to the Communist League, March 1850 In March 1850, the Central Committee of the Communist League in London issued a kind of second manifesto, a manifesto of permanent revolution, that was destined to play a central role in all the debates over the class character and political alliances of the Russian Revolution in 1903-7. The address of the Central Committee to the Communist League on Sprach der Zentral Behorden den Bund der Kommunisten vom Mars 1850 began with the conviction that a new revolution was quickly approaching. Reacting their own bitter experiences with even the most promising democratic circles in Germany, Marx and Engels now warn the workers against being deceived by the conciliatory preaching of petty bourgeois democrats or allowing themselves to be degraded to the role of camp followers of bourgeois democracy, the Revolutionary Workers' Party will cooperate with the petty bourgeois democrats against the faction whose overthrow they both desire, but it will oppose them in all points where its own interests arise. 18 Following the overthrow of feudal absolutist reaction, the petty bourgeoisie was expected to use the revolution's success to reform capitalism, but the proletariat must continue to drive events forward. The workers' task was to make the revolution permanent until all the more or less propertied classes have been driven from their ruling positions, until the proletariat has conquered state power and has progressed sufficiently far not only in one country but in all the leading countries of the world, that competition between the proletarians of these countries ceases and at least the decisive forces of production are concentrated in the hands of the workers. Our concern cannot simply be to modify private property, but to abolish it, not to hush up class antagonisms but to abolish classes, not to improve the existing society but to found a new one. 19. Resolutely abandoning the former role of an extreme democratic party, the address urged workers to focus on their own party in opposition to the democratic organizations and to use every possible means to radicalize the revolution. During and immediately after the struggle the workers, as far as it is at all possible, must oppose bourgeois attempts at Pacey Catayan and force the Democrats to carry out their terrorist phrases. They must work to ensure that the immediate revolutionary excitement is not suddenly suppressed after the victory. On the contrary, it must be sustained as long as possible. Far from opposing the so-called excesses, instances of popular vengeance against hated individuals or against public buildings with which hateful memories are associated, the Workers' Party must not only tolerate these actions but must even give them direction. During and after the struggle the workers must at every opportunity put forward their own demands against those of the bourgeois democrats. 20. If democrats demanded a 10-hour workday, the workers' party must demand an 8-hour day. If democrats called for expropriation of the large estates with compensation, the workers must insist on confiscation without compensation. Decisive. Terrorist measures had to be adopted from the very beginning to suppress any organized reaction, and every parcel of conquered territory had to serve further conquests until the last vestiges of class antagonism had been eradicated forever. As Marx wrote to Engels on July 13, 1851, the address of March 1850 to the Communist League was au fond ultimately, nothing less than a plan of campaign against democracy 21. 
Marxism, Blanquism, and Revolutionary Retreat. In the same month in which the address appeared, Marx also published in the Neue Zeitung Part 3 of the Class Struggles in France, 1848-50. Here, he noted that while the petty bourgeoisie may identify with utopian socialism, rejecting class struggle and dreaming of peaceful change through state credit, progressive taxes, limitations on inheritance, state responsibility for large construction projects, and other such measures to slow the concentration of capital. The proletariat rallies more and more around revolutionary socialism, around communism, for which the bourgeoisie has itself invented the name of Blanqui. This socialism is the declaration of the permanence of the revolution, the class dictatorship of the proletariat as the necessary transit point to the abolition of class distinctions generally. 22. One month later, in mid-April of 1850, Marx and Engels participated in creating a short-lived Universal Society of Revolutionary Communists Societe Universelle de Communists Revolutionaires, Weltgesellschaft der Revolutionaren Communisten. Article I of their Declaration of Principles stated, the aim of the association is the downfall of all the privileged classes and subjection of these classes to the dictatorship of the proletariat by maintaining the revolution in permanence until the realization of communism, which is the NAL form of organization of human society. 23 The agreement to establish the new organization was signed by two refugees in London on behalf of the Blanquists, by August Willock, Marx and Engels for the German communists, and by George Julian Harney, editor of the Northern Star, the central publication of the Chartist movement, on behalf of English communists. In 1928 David Ryazanov, the respected Marxist scholar who headed the Marx-Engels Institute in Moscow, compared this agreement with Section 1 of the rules of the Communist League and noted crucial differences. The rule of the proletariat is replaced by the dictatorship of the proletariat, while the revolution becomes a revolution in permanence, la revolution and permanence. If the RST change may be regarded as of an editorial nature, though it resulted from the experiences of the revolution of 1848, especially the events in Paris between February 24 and the June days, the latter formed an addition which was RST resolved upon after 1848-49, although the expression appeared in Marx's early works on the lessons of the Great French Revolution, particularly on the lessons provided by the Jacobins who supported the Revolution and Permanence 24. In June 1850, the Central Committee of the Communist League issued a second circular reporting on the state of the organization in Belgium, Germany, Switzerland, France, and England. It also reformed that the group's purpose was the revolutionary organization of the Workers' Party, which must never subordinate itself to any other party. By late 1850, however, Marx's study of the economic conjuncture convinced him that the industrial crisis of 1847, which had paved the way for the revolution of 1848, had receded, and that a new period of industrial prosperity had set in. He concluded that the revolutionary tide was ebbing and would not return until a new economic crisis created more favorable conditions. In the last section of the class struggles in France, published in the NAL issue, No. 5-6, of the New Irenes Zeitung at the end of November 1850, he wrote. Given this general prosperity, wherein the productive forces of bourgeois society are developing as luxuriantly as possible within bourgeois relationships, a real revolution is out of the question. Such a revolution is possible only in periods when both of these factors, the modern forces of production and the bourgeois forms of production, come into opposition with each other. A new revolution can only be a consequence of a new crisis. The one, however, is as sure to come as the other. 25. Marx's opponents in the League of Communists insisted on forcing a new revolutionary uprising in Germany, which they claimed required nothing more than money and a number of daring individuals 26 in the heat of debate. Marx insisted on reading into the record another sine can't comment that maintained the spirit of permanent revolution but suggested a quite different timetable in view of changed circumstances. The point of view of the minority is dogmatic instead of critical, 
idealistic instead of materialistic. They regard not the real conditions but a mere effort of will as the driving force of the revolution. Whereas we say to the workers, you will have to go through 15, 20, 50 years of civil wars and national struggles not only to bring about a change in society but also to change yourselves, and prepare yourselves for the exercise of political power, you say on the contrary, either we seize power at once, or else we might as well just take to our beds. Whereas we are at pains to show the German workers in particular how rudimentary the development of the German proletariat is, you appeal to the patriotic feelings and the class prejudice of the German artisans, adding them in the grossest way possible, and this is a more popular method, of course. Just as the word people has been given an aura of sanctity by the Democrats, so you have done the same for the word proletariat. Like the Democrats you substitute the catchword of Revolution F or our evolutionary development. 27. Shortly afterwards, the remaining communists in Germany were rounded up, some were condemned to long sentences in prison, and, in November 1852, the Communist League was of Chile disbanded. Although Marx did not return to the subject of permanent revolution after 1851, mention should be made of his letter to Engels of April 16, 1856, which was not published until 1913. There he declared that the whole thing in Germany will depend on whether it is possible to back the proletarian revolution by some second edition of the Peasants' War, Der Deutsche Bauernkrieg, a popular revolt in the Holy Roman Empire in 1524-5, involving hundreds of thousands of peasant insurgents. Given such a combination of urban and rural class forces, Marx thought the affair should go swimmingly. 28 Lenin would later quote this paragraph as an accurate description of the class dynamics of the Bolshevik Revolution of October 1719 through participating in the Communist League's activities from 1847 to 1852. Marx and Engels bequeathed an array of tactics and concepts that would subsequently sustain the opposing views of Mensheviks and Bolsheviks alike. Which was the authoritative Marx, the proponent of extreme democracy who would GHT together with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way, against the absolute monarchy, the feudal landowners, and the petty bourgeoisie, the militant revolutionary who authored the call to permanent revolution in the address of the Central Committee to the Communist League or the sober economic researcher who, in refuting a mere effort of will, anticipated a further 15, 20, 50 years of civil wars and national struggles before the workers might be prepared for the exercise of political power? Engels on the danger of a democratic counter-revolution, 1884-5. Shortly after Marx's death, Engels returned in March 1884 to the theory of permanent revolution and appeared to resolve this confusion. In the Social Democrat he published an article on Marx and the Neue Renaissance 1848-49, declaring that he and Marx had always used the publication to expose the parliamentary cretinism, as Marx called it, of the various so-called national assemblies. When the lefts obtained the majority, the government dispersed the entire assembly, it could do so because the assembly had forfeited all credit with the people. When later I read Bougiart's book on Marat, I found that in more than one respect we had only unconsciously imitated the great model of the genuine Ami du Pupil, not the one forged by the royalists, and that the whole outburst of rage and the whole falsy cation of history, by virtue of which for almost a century only an entirely distorted Marat had been known were solely due to the fact that Marat mercilessly removed the veil from the idols of the moment, Lafayette, Bailey, and others, and exposed them as ready-made traitors to the revolution, and that he, like us, did not want the revolution to be declared closed, but in permanence. 30. We openly proclaimed that the trend we represented could enter the struggle for the attainment of our real party aims only when the most extreme of the of Chael parties existing in Germany came to the helm, then we would form the opposition to it. 31. Expecting that Europe would soon be convulsed by a new revolution in which bourgeois democratic elements would again play a counter-revolutionary role, Engels also wrote to August Babel on December 11, 1884, 
and predicted that the outbreak of proletarian revolution would incite all reactionary forces to coalesce under the banner of democracy. As to pure democracy and its role in the future, obviously it plays a far more subordinate part in Germany than in countries with an older industrial development. But that does not prevent the possibility, when the moment of revolution comes, of its acquiring a temporary importance as the most radical bourgeois party, it has already played itself off as such in Frankfurt, and as the NAL sheet anchor of the whole bourgeois and even feudal regime. At such a moment the whole reactionary mass falls in behind it and strengthens it, everything which used to be reactionary behaves as if it were democratic. 32. Finally, in November 1885, Engels reprinted Marx's essay from 1853, Revelations Concerning the Trial of Communists in Cologne. As an introduction he added a survey of the history of the Communist League, and as appendices he included the March and June 1850 addresses of the Central Committee to the Communist League. Again, he warned of the danger of a democratic counter-revolution and noted that the classical statement of the theory of permanent revolution might still alert workers to the impending danger. The address of March 1850, composed by Marx and myself, is still of interest today, because petty bourgeois democracy is even now the party which must certainly be the RST to come to power in Germany as the savior of society from the communist workers on the occasion of the next European upheaval which is now soon due, the European revolutions, 1815, 1830, 1848 to 52, 1870, have occurred at intervals of 15 to 18 years in our century. Much of what is said there is, therefore, still applicable today. 33. Edward Bernstein and the Revisionist Controversy Despite Engels's effort to fortify the workers' movement ideologically, the long spell of reaction that followed the crushing of the Paris Commune in 1871 led to a revival of bourgeois democratic illusions in the socialist parties of the Second International. In October 1896, the revisionist controversy, provoked by Eduard Bernstein and his supporters, broke out within German social democracy. Originally a close friend of Engels, Bernstein had come under the unions of the Fabian Society during a period of exile in London and undertook to revise Marxism along reformist lines, RST in a series of articles published in Die Neue Zeit and later in his book The Preconditions of Socialism and the Tasks of Social Democracy, published in 1899. 34 Bernstein dedicated the second chapter of his book to Marxism and the Hegelian dialectic, where he repudiated both the pitfalls of the Hegelian dialectical method and the related theory of permanent revolution, which he regarded as a misguided concession to Blanqueism, meaning Putschism. Convinced that the theory of permanent revolution resulted from infatuation with the Hegelian logic of contradiction, he offered the following example. In 1847, the Communist Manifesto declared that, given the stage of development reached by the proletariat and the advanced conditions of European civilization, the bourgeois revolution, on which Germany was embarking, will be but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. In someone like Marx, who had already devoted serious study to economics, such historical self-deception, and a run-of-the-mill political visionary could hardly do better, would have been incomprehensible if it were not seen as resulting from a remnant of Hegelian dialectics. 35. Bernstein recalled how Engels, in his propaganda campaign in 1885 and 1887, 36 had included in the new edition of Revelations Concerning the Trial of Communists in Cologne the two circulars that he and Marx had written in March and June of 1850 to proclaim the revolution in permanence. Engels had thought those tactics were still valid in principle, yet his projected new revolutionary upheaval had yet to occur. Bernstein attributed Engels's mistake to the dialectic taken over from Hegel with its truly miraculous belief in the creative power of force. Hegel's inyance was said to be the treacherous element in Marxist doctrine and the fundamental obstacle in the way of any logical consideration of things 37 above all, 
Bernstein blamed dialectics for the fact that Marx and Engels had advocated revolutionary violence rather than recognizing that steady economic progress would both dictate the need and ensure the possibility for peaceful social reform, every time we see the doctrine which proceeds from the economy. Capitulate before the theory which stretches the cult of force to its limits, we end a Hegelian principle. 38 Bernstein drew a link between Hegel's Indians and Marx's apparent association with revolutionary Blanquism. The theory of secret leagues and the political putsch. The doctrine of the launching of revolution by a small, purposeful party acting in accordance with well-laid plans and committed to revolutionary expropriation 39. Marx's writings for the Communist League, and particularly his call to make the revolution permanent, were said to be permeated throughout by the spirit of Louis Blanqui and Gracchus Babeuf, with the result that all theoretical insight into the nature of the modern economy, all knowledge of the current state of the economic development of Germany, which was still far behind that of France at the time, all economic understanding vanishes to nothing before a program so illusory it could have been set up by any run-of-the-mill club revolutionary. 40. Proletarian Terrorism Bernstein added, would inevitably have reactionary and anti-democratic consequences, a policy modelled on the terror of 1793 would have been the most senseless and futile imaginable, indeed, a crime for which thousands of workers would soon enough have to atone with their lives, and further thousands with their liberty 41 at the instigation of English, Russian, and Polish leaders, Belfort Bax, 42 Plekhanov, Parvis and Rosa Luxemburg in particular, Karl Koskai. The foremost theorist of German social democracy, Nally refuted Bernstein's challenge in Die Neue Zeit. Koskai's articles were collected in 1899 under the title Bernstein und das Sozialdemokratische Programm, in Antikritik, 43 and together with Rosa Luxemburg's famous pamphlet on social reform and revolution, 44 They represented the major orthodox Marxist response to social democratic revisionism. Koskai conceded that Marx and Engels made a mistake when they initially supported German Democrats, but he denied any connection between permanent revolution and Hegelian dialectics. Instead, he pointed out that Marx and Engels had relied on the historical examples of the bourgeois revolutions in England in the 17th century and in France in the 18th century. Their starting point was the rising of the bourgeoisie against feudal absolutism, but they did not stop at that, they were the immediate prelude to the terrorist regime of the petty bourgeoisie and to the beginning of plebeian revolutionary movements, in England the levelers, in France the followers of Bebeuf. Those movements failed because neither the proletariat nor social conditions had sufficiently matured, but since the bourgeois revolution that Marx and Engels expected for Germany in 1847 was going to take place in more advanced conditions, Koskai believed that the Communist Manifesto had correctly judged the potential for a proletarian revolution to follow. If Marx and Engels had made a mistake, it was in failing to see that every demonstration of force on the part of the proletariat pushes the bourgeoisie to the camp of reaction. Their mistake was not to exaggerate the value of the proletariat, but that of the bourgeoisie. 45. One of the lessons Koskai drew from this experience would have important implications for the Russian Revolution. In the debate with Bernstein, he determined that a revolutionary seizure of power by the workers must be governed by the objective logic of class interests. He developed this theme most extensively in his series of articles on revolutionary questions, included in this anthology, which led Leon Trotsky to conclude in 1905 that once the Workers' Party took political power in Russia it must also pursue economic measures leading to a socialist republic 46 as Koskai wrote. The dictatorship in the factory will necessarily accrue to the proletariat once it has conquered state power. The position of the capitalists who still remain after the nationalization versus Dottlesjung of the cartels and trusts must then become untenable. Simply by the logic of class interests, the transition to socialist production will then necessarily impose itself on the victorious proletariat even if this was not its goal from the outset. In other words, capitalist production and the political rule of the proletariat are mutually incompatible. NE Society 
will drive the victorious proletariat to replace capitalist by socialist production. 47. An equally important scholarly response to Bernstein came from Franz Mehring, a widely respected historian of German socialism who meticulously corrected Bernstein's factual errors. 48. In the RST place, Mehring pointed out, Marx and Engels had never advocated any Puchist tactic, even when the temptation was very great, for instance during the Cologne uprising of September 1848, as well as in May 1849, when the struggle for the imperial constitution began. They only called the workers to take up weapons in the Prussian crisis of November 1848 when the Berlin Assembly, which had adopted a decision calling for refusal to pay taxes, was dissolved by the sword, when the possibility of a great national uprising existed. Just as little did Marx and Engels overestimate at that time the creative power of revolutionary force for the socialist transformation of modern society. For them the only thing that mattered was to seize as many positions of power as possible from the counter-revolutionary powers, in that sense they opposed the cowardly Philistine clamour for closure of the revolution and demanded instead the revolution in permanence. Had the Berlin and Frankfurt assemblies followed their advice, they would not have perished so ignominiously as they did. 49. The events that Mehring cited to explain the tactics of Marx and Engels in 1849-50 could just as well have been a script for the Russian Revolution. In both cases, the summons to permanent revolution came in response to bourgeois betrayal and the willingness of propertied classes to compromise with reaction rather than risk power passing to the proletariat. It was in these circumstances, Mehring pointed out, that the March 1850 address of the Central Committee had given precise instructions, in the event of an imminent new outbreak of the revolution, for the communists everywhere to mobilize the workers in order to make the revolution permanent. Bernstein had accused Marx of ignoring economic conditions, yet Mehring noted that when conditions improved by the autumn of 1850, Marx and Engels changed course and actually preferred to accept the dissolution of the Communist League, rather than give in to Blanquist putschism, to belief in the miraculous power of violence 50 speaking for himself, Mehring thought. The question of whether the political revolution is rightly or wrongly considered an indispensable precondition of socialism, of whether the triumph of the working class can be brought about with or without violent catastrophes, can ultimately be answered only by the actual course of history. 51. Given the striking political similarities between Germany in 1848-50 and Russia in 1905, it was no surprise that, six years later, Leon Trotsky would publish in Nakalo, a newspaper that he Brewy edited together with Parvis, a new article by Mehring entitled The Revolution in Permanence. In that article, which we have included in this volume, Mehring frankly concluded that it is precisely by means of the revolution in permanence that the Russian working class must reply, and, judging by the news to date, has already replied, to the bourgeois cries of anguish for peace at any price 52. Despite the critical responses of Mehring, Koskai, and others, the RST practical application of the principles of revisionism occurred in 1899, when the French socialist deputy Alexander Milrand joined the bourgeois government of Republican defense headed by René Waldeck Rousseau, together with the butcher of the 1871 Paris Commune, General Galifet, using as an excuse the Dreyfus trial. In what is to be done? Lenin bitterly ridiculed Milrand's illusions. If social democracy is merely a party of reform, then not only has a socialist the right to join a bourgeois cabinet, but he must always strive to do so. If democracy means the abolition of class domination, then why should not a socialist minister charm the whole bourgeois world by orations on class collaboration? Why should he not remain in the cabinet even after the shooting down of workers by gendarmes has exposed, for the hundredth and thousandth time, the real nature of the democratic collaboration of classes? Why should he not personally take part in greeting the Tsar, for whom the French socialists now have no other name than hero of the gallows, nout, and exile nautur, penjur et deportator? 
and the reward for this utter humiliation and self-degradation of socialism in the face of the whole world, for the corruption of the socialist consciousness of the working masses, the only basis that can guarantee our victory, the reward for this is pompous projects for miserable reforms, so miserable in fact that much more has been obtained from bourgeois governments. 53. Bernstein's theories of peaceful reform were condemned in September 1903 at the Dresden Congress of the German Social Democratic Party, as was Milleran's ministerialism a year later at the Amsterdam Congress of the Second International. In the meantime, Mehring published in 1902 the third volume of his edition of early writings by Marx and Engels, covering the period from May 1848 to October 1850. In his introduction to the second part of the volume, 54 he commented that while Marx and Engels in 1848 had every right, historically and politically, to adopt a policy of driving the bourgeoisie forward, their subsequent change of course provided remarkable proof of how the elementary instinct of the workers' movement can correct the conceptions of even the greatest thinkers 55 by 1905, Mehring hoped the instincts of Russian workers would likewise correct the mistaken expectations of Plekhanov and others, who still ignored Marx's change of tactics in February 1849 and thought liberals and Democrats would be necessary allies in the struggle against Tsarist autocracy. In Vorwarts, the of Chael Daly of the German Social Democratic Party, Rosa Luxemburg reviewed the last two volumes edited by Mehring. 56 She, too, noted that Marx's plan had initially been to play the role of a left wing to bourgeois democracy, 57 and that the policy was just the ed. For a moment in which the modern bourgeoisie made its RST debut on the political stage. At that time, to believe in the earnestness of its struggle against feudalism and in the possibility of pushing it forward through the resolute behavior of a left, socialist wing was the right and the duty of every genuine revolutionary and practical politician. Moreover, Marx could hardly do otherwise, for an independent socialist workers' party did not yet exist. German socialism was limited in the 1840s to a few exile colonies in Brussels, London, and Paris, some short-lived socialist journals in Germany and some loose workers' circles in the Rhineland. The Neue Rhinesk-Zeitung could not therefore represent in the March Revolution what actually did not exist, a separate class policy of the proletariat. 58 As a result, during the revolution the Neue Rhinesk-Zeitung did not come to a real, therefore thoroughly socialist, opposition, that should have begun in the Tricolor Republic 59. With this in mind, the behavior of the Neue Rhinesk-Zeitung appears as a well-considered, clever tactic, aimed at using the bourgeois uprising as a preliminary stage for the NAL proletarian one, to push it to its limits, where it would collapse and make room for a second, more radical cycle of the revolution. Seen from that point of view, the tactics of the Neue Rhinesk-Zeitung were not an abdication of socialism to help clear the way for the rule of the bourgeoisie but, on the contrary, a conscious utilization of the rule of the bourgeoisie as a short preliminary stage, calculated at most to last a few years, for the proletarian victory. 60. Luxembourg's review spoke of the peculiar conception that Marx and Engels had of the March Revolution, the hope in a so-called revolution in permanence, but she did not yet recognize it as a distinctly new policy, necessitated by the betrayal of the German bourgeoisie and petty bourgeois Democrats. She did, however, link it with Marx's expectation that the bourgeois revolution would be only a RST act, that it would be immediately followed by a petty bourgeois and nally by a proletarian revolution. Just three years later, she would herself interpret Russian events in terms of permanent revolution. The title of her article, which we include in this anthology, would be after the first act. Marxism and Russian Populism If the lines between orthodoxy and revisionism were clearly drawn in the West European context, the same could not be said of Russia. It was obvious that Bernstein's belief in a peaceful parliamentary road to socialism had no relevance to a country that had yet to secure political representation or the most elementary constitutional rights. However, there was just as obviously no agreement on the question of how such fundamental changes could be forced upon the autocrat, Tsar Nicholas II. 
The documents in this volume reveal an array of opinions ranging from Plekhanov's conviction that a bourgeois revolution was pending, even if it must be led by the workers, to the opposite position shared by Ryazanov, Parvis and Trotsky, namely, that a permanent revolution would rapidly point beyond bourgeois democracy in the direction of socialism. And, just as Marx's changing tactics in 1848-50 helped to frame the West European debates over revisionism, with regard to Russia Marx made equally controversial appraisals of the village commune and its potential to provide a basis for socialism without enduring the torment of primitive capitalist accumulation. Marxism emerged in Russia in a struggle against revolutionary Narodnik populism, but during and after the 1905 revolution the echoes of previous disputes with the Narodniks were still apparent in assessments of Russia's peculiar characteristics given by Ryazanov, Trotsky, and even Lenin 61. The Narodniks held that Russian backwardness provided a unique opportunity to reach socialism through traditional forms of land tenure 62 the peasant commune, the Obshkina, regulated social and economic life at the village level, the Mir, by periodically redistributing strips of land according to family size, the number of able-bodied workers per household, or some other collectivist principle. Within each commune, a patriarchal assembly, the Skod, which included the head of each family and one or more village elders, decided how and when land repartition, planting, and harvesting would take place. While Russian Marxists regarded the commune as an archaic obstacle to modernity, the Narodniks emphasized its collectivist character, which distinguished Russia from capitalist Europe and created the prospect of bypassing capitalism on the way to a socialist future. The most famous revolutionary populist organization was the People's Will Narodnaya Valya, formed in 1879 after the failure of previous attempts to radicalize the countryside through going to the people with peaceful propaganda. Members of Narodnaya Valya succeeded in assassinating Tsar Alexander II in 1881, but the wave of repression that followed, and the failure of the expected popular uprising to materialize, resulted in a major ideological and organizational crisis. Narodnaya Valya split apart, and a rival group emerged, Chernyi Paretal, or Black Repartition, whose more prominent members, Georgi Plekhanov, Pavel Axelrod, Leftoich, and Vera Zasulich, in September 1883 founded Russia's RST Marxist organization, Osvobozdeni Truda, the Emancipation of Labor Group. According to Andrei Weilicki, in his excellent book on the controversy between populists and Marxists over the prospects of Russian capitalism, Marx and Engels were more impressed by the revolutionary Narodniks in the years just prior to Marx's death than by Plekhanov, who had been living in Geneva since January 1880, and did not, in fact, return to Russia for another 37 years. Since 1877 they had been convinced that Russia stood on the threshold of revolution and that this revolution would usher in a new revolutionary era in the whole of Europe. The founders of Scientisi Socialism were enthusiastic supporters of the will of the people and felt proud of their contacts with it, Plekhanov's party Black Repartition was treated by them ironically, as a party that while preaching the need to work among the people went abroad and shirked real revolutionary activity. Even Plekhanov's conversion to Marxism was, at RST, met by Engels, Marx was not alive by then, with a certain reserve and distrust. Plekhanov's criticism of the will of the people seemed to him premature and too doctrinaire 63. The RST Russian thinker whom Marx took seriously was N.G. Chernyshevsky, an ardent Westerniser who simultaneously hoped his country would reach socialism without enduring the agony of capitalism. Criticizing philosophical prejudices against the Obshkina, Chernyshevsky projected the possibility that Russia might bane T from Europe's experience to skip all the intermediate stages of development or at least enormously reduce their length and deprive them of their power. 64 In the preface to the RST German edition of Capital, Marx made a nearly identical remark. He wrote that the country that is more developed industrially only shows, to the less developed, the image of its own future. In the same place, he added that while no country could clear by bold leaps or remove by legal enactments the obstacles offered by the successive stages of its normal development, 
it was nevertheless possible to shorten and lessen the birth pang 65 these statements by Marx are frequently quoted in the documents we have translated. Moreover, the Russian proponents of permanent revolution often sounded remarkably like Chernyshevsky. Long before Trotsky, Chernyshevsky understood perfectly how history could be accelerated when a backward country imports the experience of others that are more advanced in order to accelerate its own development. This acceleration consists of the fact that the development of certain social phenomena in backward nations, thanks to the inances of the advanced nation, skips an intermediary stage and jumps directly to a high stage. 66. Comparing history to a grandmother very fond of its grandchildren, Chernyshevsky hoped Russia would fulfill the biblical saying that the last shall be RST 67 in his notes to a translation of John Stuart Mill's work in political economy, he projected a socialist Russia economically organized through state-supported agricultural and industrial cooperative 68. In the afterword to the second German edition of Capital, Marx spoke highly of Chernyshevsky's work on Mill and referred to him as a mastermind and a great Russian scholar and critic 69 in 1875. Marx further specified that it was West European countries that were seeing capitalist expropriation of the peasantry. When another Russian populist, Angie Mikhailovsky, misinterpreted the section of capital dealing with primitive accumulation to mean that the transformation of English peasants into wage earners portended the fate of all countries, Marx protested to the populist journal Ateshist Venai Zapisky notes on the fatherland. He explicitly rejected the view that his sketch of the genesis of capitalism in Western Europe was a supra-historical theory of the general path imposed by fate upon every people, whatever the historic circumstances in which it NDS itself. On the contrary, events strikingly analogous but taking place in different historic surroundings often led to totally different results. The question of whether Russia must begin by destroying the rural commune in order to pass to the capitalist regime, or whether it could instead appropriate all its fruits by developing its own historical peculiarities ses propres duns historiques, could not be answered by reference to a universal scheme. By the late 1870s, Marx's study of Russian conditions led him to think that if Russia continues to pursue the path she has followed since 1861 the year of the emancipation edict that abolished serfdom, she will lose the nest chance ever offered by history to a nation, in order to undergo all the fatal vicissitudes of the capitalist regime. 70. But what if Russia did not continue along that path? What if revolution intervened? In 1881, Vera Zasulich, who, two years later, became one of the pioneers of Russian Marxism, again queried Marx concerning the role of the village commune. In one draft of his response Marx wrote that a Russian revolution is required if the commune is to be saved, and if the revolution occurs in time. The rural commune will develop as an element in the regeneration of Russian society, as a point of advantage when compared to the nations enslaved by the capitalist system. 71. A year later, Marx and Engels wrote a preface to a new Russian edition of the Communist Manifesto that represented Marx's NAL pronouncement on the subject. If the Russian Revolution becomes the signal for a proletarian revolution in the West, so that the two can supplement each other, then present Russian communal land ownership can serve as a point of departure for a communist development. 72. Marx became more responsive to populist ideas at the very moment when Plekhanov and his associates, in the name of Marxism, were parodying populist writers as reactionary utopians. In Socialism and the Political Struggle, written in 1883, Plekhanov ridiculed his former Narodnik comrades for fearing capitalist development, which was historically necessary in order to produce the modern proletariat as a real revolutionary force. Instead of recognizing capitalism's inevitability, Russia's anarchists, Narodniks, and Blanquists expected old mother history to mark time while they laid new, straighter and better roads for her 73 Plekhanov replied that serious revolutionaries must turn away from the villages to concentrate on urban workers. The rural population of today, living in backward social conditions, is not only less capable of conscious political initiative than the industrial workers, 
it is also less responsive to the movement which our revolutionary intelligentsia has begun. And besides, the peasantry is going through a difficult, critical period. The previous ancestral foundations of its economy are crumbling, the ill-fated village commune itself is being discredited. The process of Russian social development is creating new social formations by destroying the age-old forms of the peasants' relation to the land and to one another. 74. While it is true that, after Marx's death in 1883, Engels tended to side with Plekhanov, by 1892 Engels regarded the Obshkina as a dream of the past that must give way in future to a capitalist Russia 75, the issue remained a focus of contention for at least another decade. In a monumental study of The Development of Capitalism in Russia, 1899, 76 Lenin supported Plekhanov with a plethora of statistical data intended to refute both Narodnik terrorism and reformist populists such as V.P. Vorontsov and Nikolai Danielson, translator of Marx's Capital into Russian, both of whom hoped revolution might be avoided through reforms initiated by the Tsarist state. Like Chernyshevsky, Vorontsov saw the privilege of backwardness in Russia's ability to import foreign achievements. But fearing that private capital accumulation would further impoverish the peasant commune, he hoped for a painless transition to socialized labor through state-led industrialization. 77 In The Heritage We Renounce, Lenin condemned Vorontsov for his idealization of the peasantry and his reactionary attitude 78 Narodism was the ideology of Russia's peasant democrats and a manifestation of petty bourgeois economic romanticism, the same kind of romanticism that characterized all under-consumptionist theories that denied the possibility of capital accumulation on the grounds that ruin of small producers would eliminate the domestic market 79 by the time of the RST. Russian Revolution, however, the fate of the commune was becoming a secondary issue among Marxists and Lenin explicitly hoped for an American style of capitalist agriculture that would accelerate class differentiation and multiply rural allies of the proletariat. However, the question of abbreviating history remained, and the advocates of permanent revolution, Trotsky in particular, could draw upon another element of Russian historiography when emphasizing the creative role of state power. 80 In a foreword to Marx's writing on the Paris Commune, Trotsky declared in December 1905 that the state is no end in itself. It is, however, the greatest means of organizing, disorganizing, and reorganizing social relations. Depending upon whose hands control it, it can be either a lever for profound transformation or an instrument of organized stagnation. 81. Leptik Homerov, the chief theoretician of Narodnaya Valya, had similarly argued that the Tsarist state was an independent social force, the supreme organizer of social life, and for precisely that reason must be destroyed in order to fulfill the will of the people. 82 Notwithstanding the distractions posed by the commune, Russian Marxists from the outset did have one conviction in common with the Narodniks, the prospects. Trotsky acknowledged that the autocracy played no small part in transplanting the factory system of production onto Russian soil. Under the pressure of capitalistically more advanced Western Europe, a pressure that was transmitted through the military state organization, the state in its turn strove to force the development of social differentiation on a primitive economic foundation. Thus, the Russian state, erected on the basis of Russian economic conditions, was being pushed forward by the pressure of the neighboring state organizations, which had grown up on a higher economic basis. From a certain moment, especially from the end of the 17th century, the state strove with all its power to accelerate the country's natural economic development. New branches of handicraft, machinery, factories, big industry, capital, were, so to say, already chaly grafted on the natural economic stem. Capitalism seemed to be an offspring of the state. C. L. Trotsky 1969, Chap. Impending revolution in Russia could not repeat the pattern of France in 1789. Plekhanov told a Paris Congress of the Socialist International in 1889 that the revolutionary movement in Russia will triumph only as a working class movement or else it will never triumph. 
83 Unlike previous bourgeois revolutions, in which artisans and proletarians provided shock troops for the bourgeoisie, the Russian working class would this time appear as an independent force with its own leadership and its own class consciousness. But, given the low level of development of the productive forces in Russia, Plekhanov also thought the strategic goals of the sui generis bourgeois revolution could not go beyond the framework of democratic civil rights and capitalist relations of production, it would be a bourgeois democratic revolution based on an alliance between capitalists and workers against absolutism and the landlords. Although this element of Plekhanov's thinking was obviously incompatible with any notion of revolution in permanence, he also believed that capitalism in Russian would be much abbreviated compared to Western Europe, our capitalism will fade before it has time to blossom completely, a guarantee for which we end in the powerful unions of international relations. 84 The manifesto adopted by the RST Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party in 1898, written by Peter Struov, expressed a similar conviction. The further to the east of Europe, and Russia, as we know, is the east of Europe, the weaker, more cowardly and baser in its political attitude is the bourgeoisie, and the greater the cultural and political tasks that fall to the proletariat. 85. David Ryazanov on the draft program of Iskra, 1903. The concept of permanent revolution was RST introduced into Russian social democratic literature by David Ryazanov. In 1902-3 the Bourbier struggle group, the tendency within the Russian party to which Ryazanov belonged, published three studies in Geneva under the general title Materials on the Program of the Workers' Party. 86 The second document, a commentary. On the draft program of Iskra and the tasks of Russian social democrats, for the RST time systematically interpreted Russian history with reference to an impending permanent revolution. Since Ryazanov's study was 302 pages in length, we have selected the most relevant sections for inclusion in this volume. Readers will be struck not merely by the scholarly depth of its analysis, but even more by the remarkable way in which it anticipates all of the arguments set forth by Trotsky three years later in his famous Results and Prospects. For Ryazanov and Trotsky alike, the rise of Russian capitalism was an exception to the West European pattern. Much of Russian industry had been recently nanced from abroad and thus incorporated the latest technology. Large-scale industry meant the working class had better opportunities to organize, and the bourgeoisie was at the same time more vulnerable. These circumstances suggested that Russian liberalism would be politically ineffective and that social democracy would RST lead the revolution against Tsarist autocracy and subsequently move towards socialism, with support from the peasant masses and from rapidly ensuing revolutions in Western Europe, where economic conditions were already more highly developed. Ryazanov's prescience owed much to his knowledge of, and his evident respect for, the earlier Narodniks. He declared that the great ones of history are never resurrected, but they reappear in the activities of future generations, who are brought up on the experience of their great predecessors 87 If Ryazanov understood Marx from within this exceptional Russian context, Plekhanov did the opposite, interpreting Russia in terms of what he took to be Marx's universal laws of history. In the 1880s Plekhanov had struggled mightily and written volumes of scholarly and polemical literature to denounce Narodnik terrorist conspiracies and to initiate the organization of a modern social democratic workers' party. Since Plekhanov, together with Lenin, was a principal author of the new party program being promoted by the journal Iskra in 1903, his prudential interpretation of Marx led him to write a blistering reply to Ryazanov's call for permanent revolution. In his article Orthodox Pedantry, also included in this collection, he denounced Ryazanov as a pretentious bookworm, an artisan of clever phrases and revolutionary fantasies that revealed a complete ignorance of Marx's method. While Ryazanov carefully explained how Marx and Engels had corrected their tactical errors of 1848, Plekhanov denied that any such errors had ever occurred, Marx had always subscribed to precisely the tactic that Plekhanov insisted must also apply to Russia, namely, organizing the workers to lead a bourgeois revolution that would enshrine the civil and constitutional rights needed for further growth of the social democratic movement. 
Plekhanov and Lenin succeeded in denying the Bourbier group any of Chael representation at the Second Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, which was held in London and Brussels in the summer of 1903. This Congress resulted in the famous split between Bolsheviks and Mensheviks over organizational issues. On this occasion, Ryazanov denounced Lenin for his commitment to a centralist party of professional revolutionaries at the expense of a mass workers' party with internal democracy. 88 Though a detailed analysis of these organizational questions is beyond the scope of this volume, it is worth noting that four of the most prominent representatives of the theory of permanent revolution, Trotsky, Luxembourg, and Parvis, in addition to Ryazanov, were all opposed to Lenin's high-handed view of centralist party control. The Russo-Japanese War of 1904-5 If the immediate cause of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 was the First World War, the Revolution of 1905 was likewise the product of another imperialist carnage, the Russo-Japanese War, a con ICT that grew out of the rivalry between Russia and Japan over Manchuria and Korea. The war was declared on February 10, 1904, and after a series of bloody land and naval battles it ended in crushing defeat for Russia. The Russian PCCEET was trapped at Port Arthur, which after a long siege nally fell to the Japanese on January 2, 1905. The Baltic EET was also destroyed shortly thereafter in the Battle of Tsuzhima, Hima, May 27-28, 1905. U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, fearing the strengthening of Japan, which could become a potential obstacle to America's own imperialist plans in Asia, e.g. the occupation of the Philippines, in which more than a quarter of a million Filipinos died, and the open-door policy in China, offered to mediate between Russia and Japan. Roosevelt's intervention led to the signing of a peace treaty at the U.S. Navy facility of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, on September 5, 1905. By then, the number of casualties had reached more than 72,000 deaths, of which more than 25,000 were Russians, and 300,000 wounded. Ironically, the prototypical imperialist Roosevelt, who led an aggressive American foreign policy in Panama and elsewhere, would earn a Nobel Peace Prize for his effort. By the terms of the Treaty of Portsmouth, Russia ceded the southern half of Sakhalin Island to Japan and granted it leasehold rights for 20 VE years in Port Arthur. Russia further agreed to evacuate Manchuria and to recognize Korea, which Japan later annexed in 1910 as part of the Japanese sphere of Indians. Shortly after the declaration of war, Parvis, Alexander Israel Help Hand, published a series of articles in Iskra where he analyzed its causes and possible consequences. 89 In a panoramic account of economic and geopolitical forces, he asserted that the war had begun as a dispute over Manchuria and Korea but had rapidly become a question of hegemony over the whole of East Asia. It therefore not only threatened a political crisis for the Russian autocracy but also entailed a radical alteration of the balance of imperialist forces. Since every developed capitalist country periodically suffered from lack of markets, all the great states of Europe, together with America, Russia, and Japan, were engaged in a titanic struggle. Russia alone among these imperialist contenders, with its weakly developed economy, sought conquests for reasons other than the internal contradictions of the capitalist mode of production, the mindless quest of the Russian government for successes in foreign affairs is imperative in order to hide the empire's internal weakness. With its poorly equipped peasant army, Russia had precipitated a con ICT that would destroy the political equilibrium of the entire world. The principal victim of the crisis would be its initiator, Tsar Nicholas II, whose overthrow by Russian workers would launch the permanent revolution that could open up worldwide perspectives for international socialism. 90. Parvis and Trotsky on Permanent Revolution in Russia the Russian Revolution of 1905 erupted on the bloody Sunday of January 22, January 9 by the Julian calendar, which was still in use at the time. When a peaceful demonstration by striking workers and their families arrived at the Winter Palace, intent upon delivering a petition of protest to the Tsar, they were ruthlessly read upon by the Imperial Guard. 
After decades of European reaction following the massacre of the Parisian Communards in 1871, the foremost theoreticians of Russian and West European social democracy saw the prospect of a great revolution that would begin in St. Petersburg and then surge westwards. All social democrats eagerly awaited news of the Tsar's overthrow, 91 but opinions differed widely as to who might replace him, liberals, petty bourgeois democrats or armed workers intent upon a socialist republic. For both Parvis and Trotsky, the issue was never in doubt. At the close of 1904 they entered a unique political and intellectual partnership that culminated in their leading roles in the St. Petersburg Soviet until its suppression in December 1905. Their collaboration began when Parvis wrote a preface, what was accomplished on 9 January, to one of Trotsky's most famous early essays, up to the 9th of January. Both documents are included in this anthology along with several others that followed soon afterwards. Parvis and Trotsky rejected any arty chale limitation of the Russian Revolution to bourgeois demands and upheld the idea that a workers' government, and for Trotsky, even the dictatorship of the proletariat, could be established in backward Russia, where serfdom had only been abolished as late as 1861. Both men believed that given the insipid character of Russian liberals and petty bourgeois democrats, the workers alone, with the support of the poorest peasants, could dispose of the autocracy. Unlike Lenin, who advocated a revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry, they also denied any possibility of the peasantry becoming a coherent political force 92 following an argument already set forth by Karl Koskai in his polemic with Bernstein and later in his essay Revolutionary Questions, Trotsky believed that the proletariat, once in power, would be compelled to go beyond democratic tasks and place collectivism on the order of the day, just as Marx and Engels had urged in their March 1850 address to the Central Committee of the Communist League. The Russian Revolution, Trotsky declared, could triumph only as a socialist revolution, and the survival of a workers' government, once confronted by armed counter-revolution, would, in turn, depend on the victory of socialist revolution in the West. 93 The central themes of Trotsky's writings on permanent revolution have long been familiar to English-speaking readers, but the series of documents that we have translated here make it possible for the RST time to trace the origins and development of those ideas that eventually culminated in results and prospects, his most famous revolutionary statement from the years 1905-6. It is important to add parenthetically that use of the expression permanent revolution during 1905 was not connected to social democratic circles. It was also used by the socialist revolutionaries, a party that regarded itself as heir to Narodnaya Valya. The SR's work of agitation and organization occurred mainly among the peasantry, and their tactics placed much emphasis on eliminating the most hated Tsarist of Chales through acts of individual terrorism. But an article in the SR journal Revalia Chinea Rossia, No. 70, dated July 1, 1905, attacked Bolsheviks and Mensheviks alike for assuming that the revolution would be bourgeois democratic in character. According to the anonymous author, apparently Mikhail Rafailovic Gotz, a leading member of the SR Central Committee and co-editor of the journal along with Viktor Chernov, the working people of Russia should be encouraged not only to destroy the autocracy but also to prevent any ensuing bourgeois entrenchment. The forthcoming revolution Perevorot will be achieved mainly by the efforts of the workers, the proletarians and peasants. They should take from this revolution all that the social conditions permit them to take, and the most important of these conditions is the extent of their own consciousness. They should not restrict the scale of this revolution in advance for the banity of the bourgeoisie, but on the contrary they should turn it into a permanent permanent new one, oust the bourgeoisie step by step from the positions it has occupied, give the signal for a European revolution, and then draw new strength from there. 94. Lenin on Uninterrupted Revolution The revolution of 1905 led to a programmatic break between the two main tendencies within Russian social democracy. While Mensheviks clung to the idea that the future of the democratic revolution depended on an alliance between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, Lenin adopted an intermediate position between Plekhanov and Trotsky. For him, 
the aim of the revolution was to create the best possible conditions for the development of capitalism, and its central problem was the agrarian question. The bourgeoisie was incapable of resolving this task. Out of fear of the mass struggle, the capitalists were ready to reach a compromise with landowners and the Tsar, which would lead to a slow and painful development of Russian capitalism along Prussian lines. Lenin argued that the revolution could only triumph through an alliance between the proletariat and the peasantry, and that it would therefore be forced to make more serious inroads into private property than the classical bourgeois revolutions. These two classes, upon seizing power, would establish a joint democratic dictatorship and proclaim the republic, the eight-hour workday and the most radical agrarian reform, including land nationalization, which would enable Russia to embark on what Lenin called the American path of bourgeois development. 95 Lenin almost certainly developed this idea from an article by Karl Koskai on the agrarian question in Russia, which included long quotations from Marx's criticism of Henry George's single tax proposals as well as an explicit reference to the American homestead system. 96 Lenin praised Koskai's work as a splendid essay that sets forth the general principles of the social democratic views on the subject. 97 He expected nationalization of the land to free the peasants from landlord exploitation, but, until a socialist revolution occurred in the West, the Russian Revolution would stop short of full scale nationalization of all the means of production. In the exhilarating atmosphere of the time, Lenin also occasionally made other statements that went beyond that schema. For instance, in September 1905 he famously commented that From the democratic revolution we shall at once, and precisely in accordance with the measure of our strength, the strength of the class conscious and organized proletariat, begin to pass to the socialist revolution. We stand for uninterrupted revolution. We shall not stop halfway. 98 but such remarks were outbursts of enthusiasm that contradicted of Chael's statements of Bolshevik policy as elaborated in Lenin's own subsequent writings. A few months later, in a note that was not published until 1926, Lenin worried that defeat of the Russian workers would be certain unless the West European socialist proletariat came to their assistance. The second victory will be the socialist revolution in Europe. The European workers will show us how to do it, and then, together with them, we shall bring about the socialist revolution. 99. Koskai, Lenin and Trotsky Because Lenin ultimately led the Bolsheviks to victory in 1917, histories of the period often exaggerate his inions at the time of the RST Russian Revolution. As the documents we have collected clearly demonstrate, no real understanding of the debate over permanent revolution is possible without RST acknowledging the key role of Karl Koskai. The center of Marxist theoretical elaboration before the outbreak of the First World War was not Russia but Germany, the home of Marx and Engels and of the Social Democratische Partei Deutschlands, SPD, which was the major party of the Second International. Even the leaders of the most extreme sections of Russian social democracy considered themselves faithful disciples of the SPD leaders Babel and Koskai. As Trotsky put it, up to August 4, 1914, Lenin considered Koskai as his teacher and stressed this everywhere he could. Speaking of Menshevism as the opportunistic wing of social democracy, Lenin compared the Mensheviks not with Koskiism but with revisionism. Moreover he looked upon Bolshevism as the Russian form of Koskiism, which in his eyes was in that period identical with Marxism. 100. According to Trotsky, Lenin saw Bolshevik doctrine as only a translation into the language of Russian conditions of the tendency of Babel Koskai 101 in the 1922 introduction to his book 1905, Trotsky gave this assessment of Koskai's role. The debate over the character of the Russian Revolution had, even during that period, gone beyond the conness of Russian social democracy and had engaged the attention of the leading elements of world socialism. The Menshevik conception of bourgeois revolution was expounded most conscientiously, that is to say, most badly and candidly, in Jerevanin's book. 102 As soon as it appeared, the German opportunists seized hold of it with glee. At Koskai's suggestion I wrote an analytical review of Jerevanin's book in Nuizite. 103 At the time, 
Koskai himself fully identified with my views. Like Mering, now deceased, 104 he adopted the viewpoint of permanent revolution. Today, Koskai has retrospectively joined the ranks of the Mensheviks. He wants to reduce his past to the level of his present. But this false Ekatayan, which satisfies the claims of an unclear theoretical conscience, is encountering obstacles in the form of printed documents. What Koskai wrote in the earlier, the better period of his scientific and literary activity, his reply to the Polish socialist Lgisnia, 105 his studies on Russian and American workers, 106 his reply to Plekhanov's questionnaire concerning the character of the Russian Revolution, 107 etc., was and remains a merciless rejection of Menshevism and a complete theoretical vindication of the subsequent political tactics of the Bolsheviks, whom thick heads and renegades, with Koskai today at their head, accuse of adventurism, demagogy, and Bakuninism. 108. By the subsequent political tactics of the Bolsheviks Trotsky obviously meant his own tactics of permanent revolution, which were adopted de facto by Lenin in the April Theses of 1917-109 but Koskai was the RST West European Marxist to employ the theory of permanent revolution in connection with events in the Russian Empire. He helped to initiate the debate over permanent revolution with his article The Slavs and Revolution, published in Iskra on March 10, 1902. And his 1903 introduction to a Polish edition of the Communist Manifesto contained an explicit reference to the March 1850 address of the Central Committee to the Communist League and to a bourgeois revolution that, in becoming permanent, grows beyond its own limits and develops out of itself a proletarian revolution 110 after the outbreak of revolution in 1905, Koskai also repeatedly employed the expression permanent revolution in a series of articles published in July in Dinuizite. Under the title The Consequences of the Japanese Victory and Social Democracy 111 this was the second mention of the phrase in the West European Marxist press, following Rosa Luxemburg's article after the first Act 112 in December 1905 Koskai published the article Old and New Revolution, where he stated that the Russian Revolution promises to inaugurate an era of European revolutions that will end with the dictatorship of the proletariat, paving the way for the establishment of a socialist society. 113 in the following month, he reprinted the section of his book on the French Revolution that described the policy of the Sansculottes in 1793-4 as one of permanent revolution. That document appeared in the Festschrift 1649-1789-1905, which was published in commemoration of the RST anniversary of Bloody Sunday 114. Finally, in November 1906, he wrote his response to Plekhanov's inquiry on the character of the Russian Revolution and the tasks of Russian socialists, the driving forces and prospects of the Russian Revolution, 115 which Trotsky called the best theoretical statement of my own views 116 all these articles by Koskai have been included in the present anthology. While Trotsky considered Koskai's reply to Plekhanov to be an endorsement of his own theory of permanent revolution, Lenin also described it as a brilliant vindication of the fundamental principles of Bolsheviks' tactics, which focused instead on the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry. Lenin commented, Koskai's analysis satisfies us completely. He has fully conromed our contention that we are defending the position of revolutionary social democracy against opportunism, and not creating any peculiar Bolshevik trend 117. Lenin also returned to this idea in his book The Agrarian Program of the Social Democracy in the First Russian Revolution, 1905-07. The Bolsheviks Ever since the beginning of the revolution in the spring and summer of 1905. Clearly pointed to the source of our tactical differences by singling out the concept of peasant revolution as one of the varieties of bourgeois revolution, and by denying the victory of the peasant revolution as the revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. Since then Bolshevism won its greatest ideological victory in international social democracy with the publication of Koskai's article on the driving forces of the Russian Revolution. 118. 
The fact that Trotsky and Lenin could both claim Koskai's endorsement resulted from Koskai's carefully phrased response to Plekhanov. Unable to read Russian documents in the original language, Koskai had no wish to exacerbate differences between Trotsky and Lenin concerning the prospective role of the peasantry. He did make it clear, however, that given the correlation of class forces in Russian society, a bloc of the Workers' Party with the bourgeois liberal cadets, which Plekhanov contemplated, was out of the question. Agrarian reform was at the heart of the democratic revolution. And the bourgeoisie would never support confiscation of the landed estates without compensation. The urban petty bourgeoisie, in turn, was too weak to play the role it had assumed in the Paris Commune during the French Revolution. Accordingly, the social democratic workers would be forced to seize power together with the peasants, and thereafter a whole series of possible variants would develop according to the extent of peasant war and the spread of revolution beyond Russia's borders. On the whole, it must be said that Koskai's argument lent more support to Trotsky's formula of the dictatorship of the proletariat leaning upon the peasantry than to Lenin's democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. Whatever the case, there is no doubt that Koskai was widely respected in all circles of Russian social democracy, and all were equally anxious to invoke his authority. Karl Koskai and Rosa Luxemburg during the RST Russian Revolution Koskai's own radicalization during this period partly resulted from the inions of Rosa Luxemburg, who was yent in Polish and Russian and frequently endorsed permanent revolution together with use of the mass political strike both in Russia and in Western Europe. The nature of this inions can be gauged from the four items by Luxemburg included in this anthology, one of which, after the first act, appeared in the West European Social Democratic Press following Bloody Sunday, 119 while another, The Russian Revolution, December 20, 1905, was published in the same collection as Koskai's Old and New Revolution to mark the RST anniversary of that event. A brief anecdote reveals how Koskai and Luxembourg defended each other at the time not only against bourgeois enemies but also against the right wing of the German SPD, who resented Luxembourg's call for adopting the mass strike. In April 1906, Koskai was forced to support Luxembourg, who was then leading the revolution in Warsaw and had been arrested together with Leo Jogi Ches on March 4, 1906. According to one of the trade union publications, the Zeitschrift für Gravure UNDZ Seller, there were witnesses of Esch and Bone to attest that Comrade Luxembourg in a Berlin assembly had driveled about the trade unions being an evil. Koskai replied that it was not Comrade Luxembourg who undermined the relations between the party and the unions, but those union of chales and editors that have taken Recauser 120 as a model. The narrow-minded hatred of these elements against any form of the labor movement that sets itself a higher goal than V.E. pennies more per hour is indeed an evil. Dismissing the union leader's accusations, Koskai furthermore protested. It is new in our movement, indeed unheard of, for comrades to hurl such nonsensical and frivolous accusations against a leader of the proletarian class struggle precisely at that moment when the hangman of all freedom has arrested her and made her defenseless because of her tireless work in the service of the proletariat. Even our bourgeois opponents, at least the more decent ones, to be sure they are not many, avoided attacking comrade Luxembourg. Yet a trade union organ is going hand in hand with the most infamous and shameless press unkies of capitalism and the aristocracy junkerdom. 121. Besides their shared expectations of revolutionary victory in Russia, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Koskai also had common misgivings concerning the increasingly conservative nature of German trade union, and later, also party, of Chales. Koskai raised the issue of growing bureaucratization in September 1906 at the party's Mannheim Congress. The background to the Congress was a bitter dispute between the leaders of the General Commission of Free, Social Democratic, Trade Unions and the SPD executive over the political mass strike, which had been employed with crippling effectiveness in the struggles against the Russian Tsar. On 22-7 May, 1905, the FTH Congress of the Free Trade Unions, which met in Cologne, directly opposed any use of the political strike. The General Commission's spokesman on this issue, 
Theodore Bommelberg, who was also president of the Construction Workers' Union, attacked not only the SPD left-wing but even Edward Bernstein, who saw in the general strike not a revolutionary means to overcome reformist parliamentarism but merely a way of defending parliament and democratic rights from reactionary attacks. Bommelberg proclaimed that in order to expand our organization, we need peace and quiet rua in the labor movement. 122 The resolution adopted by the Cologne Congress rejected the mass strike as a political tactic and prohibited even the propagation, i.e. propaganda or discussion, of this means of struggle. It also argued that the mass strike was being promoted by anarchists and persons without any experience in economic struggles and warned workers to avoid being hindered in the everyday work of strengthening the workers' organizations by adoption and promotion of such ideas 123 Nevertheless, on 17-23 September 1905, the Jena Congress of the German Social Democratic Party approved in principle the use of the political mass strike. Against the decision of the Cologne Trade Union Congress, it adopted a resolution endorsing the strike in the GHT for electoral and democratic rights, though, at the insistence of Babel, the strike was also described as a defensive tactic against an expected assault by the bourgeoisie on the growing gains of the socialist movement. 124 But on February 16, 1906, the SPD executive and the General Commission held a secret conference that resulted in an agreement by which the party leaders pledged to prevent a mass strike, if possible, and to assume the sole burden of leadership should it break out. News of the secret agreement leaked out and provoked a scandal among the revolutionary wing of the SPD. It was against this background that Rosa Luxemburg published, in the same month as the Mannheim Congress, September 1906, her famous brochure The Mass Strike, The Political Party and the Trade Unions, which defended the tactic of the mass strike as the main lesson of the RST Russian Revolution and emphatically contrasted the spontaneous revolutionary initiative of the masses with the conservative policies being endorsed by the trade union leadership. 125. In his speech to the Mannheim Congress, Koskai openly posed the question of the rising bureaucratization of the party itself. Our own party, as it grew larger, has become in a certain sense a rather cumbersome apparatus. It is not easy to bring new ideas and actions into this apparatus. If now the trade unions want peace and quiet, what perspectives open up for us if they are fastened to the already cumbersome party body as breaks? 126. The Mannheim Congress eventually produced a compromise between the SPD executive and the General Commission, which gave the union leaders de facto veto over any employment of the mass political strike. The radical Lepiziger Volkszeitung drew the bitter conclusion that ten years of struggle against revisionism had been in vain, for the revisionism we have killed in the party rises again with greater strength in the trade unions 127 The ability of the union leaders to impose their own line on the SPD derived from two main sources, the vast membership of the unions and their even larger natural resources vis a vis the party 128. The 5th, London, Congress of the RSDLP, May 1907. Rosa Luxemburg's essay on the mass strike, the political party and the trade unions sought to breathe the spirit of the Russian Revolution into the ossifying apparatus of German social democracy. By 1907, however, the Russian Revolution was in retreat at the same time as German social democracy suffered its own major setback. The Fifth Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party met in London from April 30 to May 19, 1907 and followed the infamous Hottentot elections in Germany, in which a wave of imperialist chauvinism resulted in loss of 38 social democratic seats in the Reichstag 129 the Russian Congress was attended by 336 delegates, 105 Bolsheviks, 97 Mensheviks, 57 Bund members, 44 Polish Social Democrats, 29 Latvian Social Democrats and 4 non-factional delegates. The Bolsheviks, with support from the Poles and Latvians, secured a stable majority. 130 As the prospect for permanent revolution was evidently receding, in his speech on the attitude towards bourgeois parties Lenin again emphasized the centrality of the peasantry and the agrarian question in Russia. The Bolsheviks 
maintained unequivocally that in its social and economic content our revolution was a bourgeois revolution. This means that the aims of the revolution do not exceed the bounds of bourgeois society. Even the fullest possible victory of the present revolution, in other words, the achievement of the most democratic republic possible, and the confiscation of all landed estates by the peasantry, would not in any way affect the foundations of the bourgeois social system. Private ownership of the means of production, or private farming on the land, irrespective of its juridical owner, and commodity economy will remain. The contradictions of capitalist society, and the most important of them is the contradiction between wage labor and capital, will not only remain, but become even more acute and profound, developing in a more extensive and purer form. 131. For Lenin, the key to intensifying the revolutionary struggle in Russia was to seize the estates of the landlords and the royal family and to open the way for small-scale private farming in place of both feudal landlords and the atrophying village commune, Conscation of all landed estates and their equal division would signify the most rapid development of capitalism, the form of bourgeois democratic revolution most advantageous to the peasants 132 a victory for the peasants presupposed. The complete destruction of landlordism, and the proletariat alone was capable of consummating that victory by getting a large section of the peasantry to follow its lead. Lenin repeated a familiar conclusion, the victory of the present revolution in Russia is possible only as the revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. 133 With regard to Trotsky, who spent most of own speech criticizing the Menshevik expectation of a bourgeois revolution, Lenin added this comment. A few words about Trotsky. I have no time to dwell here on our differences with him. I shall only note that in his book in defense of the party Trotsky expressed, in print, his solidarity with Koskai, who wrote about the economic community of interests between the proletariat and the peasantry in the present revolution in Russia. Trotsky acknowledged the permissibility and usefulness of a left bloc against the liberal bourgeoisie. These facts are sufficient for me to acknowledge that Trotsky has come closer to our views. Quite apart from the question of uninterrupted revolution, we have here solidarity on fundamental points in the question of the attitude towards bourgeois parties 134. Lenin's reference to Koskai concerned the latter's essay, The Driving Forces and Prospects of the Russian Revolution, which was Koskai's response to Plekhanov's earlier inquiry. Since Trotsky was in limbo between the Bolshevik and Menshevik factions, the Congress organizers allotted him 15 minutes to speak as the representative of a special tendency 135 Trotsky used the occasion to remind Plekhanov of his own past. I want to establish only one thing, if, as Plekhanov predicted, the revolutionary movement in Russia triumphs as a workers' movement, then the victory of the proletariat in Russia is possible only as a revolutionary victory of the proletariat, or else it is not possible at all. In his book The Permanent Revolution, Trotsky recalled that on this occasion, Lenin did not forgive me my conciliatory attitude toward the Mensheviks, and he was right, he expressed himself upon my speech with a deliberately emphasized reserve. Because I did stand outside the Bolshevik faction. In spite of that, or more correctly, precisely because of that, his words leave no room for false interpretations. Lenin established solidarity between us on the fundamental points of the question concerning the attitude toward the peasantry and the liberal bourgeoisie 136. By the spring of 1907, Trotsky found himself in the increasingly awkward position of being neither Menshevik nor Bolshevik, the two factions that dominated the Congress, but on the question of the proletariat's relationship to other classes he declared his own solidarity with Rosa Luxemburg whose address on the question of relations with the bourgeois parties we have also translated for the RST time in this volume. 137 Conveying of Chael Greetings to the Russian Congress from the SPD, Luxembourg attributed both the recent electoral losses in Germany and the difficulties of the Russian Revolution to the treachery of liberals who had become pathetic toadies of reaction. Dismissing the Menshevik idea of revolutionary liberalism as an invention and a phantom, she also disputed Lenin's hope that the peasants could ever 
produce a coherent party capable of joint action with the workers in some sort of left bloc. The peasants could at best mount a spontaneous jacquerie, but peasant movements are completely unable to play an independent role and are subordinated in every historical context to the leadership of other classes that are more energetic and more clearly denet. 138. For Luxembourg, as for Trotsky, the only genuinely trustworthy allies of Russian workers were comrades in other countries upon whose support the Russian Revolution ultimately depended. Centrism and Marxism, Karl Koskai and Rosa Luxemburg after 1910. While Trotsky and Luxemburg linked the prospect for permanent revolution with events in Western Europe, there is also a passage in Trotsky's results and prospects which, though written in 1906, clearly anticipated the further decline of revolutionary commitment in the SPD once enthusiasm over the Russian Revolution abetted. Speaking of the danger of internal inertia, Trotsky worried that growing conservatism in the German party might drain it of revolutionary purpose. As a consequence, social democracy as an organization embodying the political experience of the proletariat may at a certain moment become a direct obstacle to the open con ICT between the workers and bourgeois reaction. In other words, the propagandist socialist conservatism of the proletarian parties may at a certain moment hold back the direct struggle of the proletariat for power. 139. When Trotsky wrote these lines, the last person he had in mind was Karl Koskai. Nevertheless, within a few years, Koskai succumbed to the enervating tendencies within the German party about which he had been one of the RST to sound the alarm. The War of Attrition, waged for more than a decade by German trade unionists against the mass strike and the party's left wing, ended in a merger of interests between party of Chaldum and the trade union apparatus. With its parliamentary caucus to protect, the party became as anchored in the political status quo as the unions were committed to peaceful collective bargaining. In The Road to Power, published in 1909, Koskai was still writing of a new period of revolutions, possibly involving the general strike 140 on September 26 of the same year, he complained in a letter to Victor Adler about the overgrowth of bureaucratism, which nips in the bud any initiative and any boldness. He wrote that only when the action comes from the masses can one reckon with the necessary impetus and enthusiasm, whereas in Germany the masses have been drilled to wait for orders from above while those above have been so absorbed by the administrative needs of the huge apparatus that they have lost every broad view, every interest for anything outside the affairs of their own of CES. This bureaucratic paralysis had RST emerged in the trade unions, but now we see it also in the political organization 141 yet, despite these repeated misgivings, or perhaps because of them, in the following year Koskai broke off his relationship with Rosa Luxemburg and emerged as the main spokesman of the SPD's prevailing center faction. According to Merrick Waldenberg, his best biographer, Koskai wrote to Ryazanov in June 1910 and attributed his break with Luxemburg to the need to distance himself from her extremely unpopular image in the union bureaucracy. 142 When Luxembourg submitted an article urging the strike as a means of securing universal suffrage in Prussia, while simultaneously posing the demand for a republic in the hope of provoking revolutionary action, Koskai refused to publish it. 143 This resulted in a severing of his relations not only with Luxembourg but also with Franz Mering, who was removed from the editorial board of Die Neue Zeit in 1912 as well as in a series of bitter polemics in Die Neue Zeit with several other leading representatives of social democracy's left wing. It was in the course of these debates that Koskai developed his so-called strategy of exhausting the enemy or Madden strategy, as opposed to Luxembourg's call for defeating the enemy Niederwerfung strategy. Whereas Belfort Bax had once labeled Edward Bernstein our German Fabian convert, now it was Karl Koskai who found himself endorsing the strategy of Fabius Kunktator 144 with Anton Panikok. Koskai quarreled over mass action and the proper attitude towards parliamentarism, and with Paul Lynch and Karl Radek he debated the issues of imperialism and disarmament, which were assuming growing urgency with the approach of the First World War. On these issues, too, Koskai was in full retreat, 
denying that imperialism was an economic necessity inherent in capitalism and recommending a solution to international conists through arms limitation agreements. 145 As Roddick remarked, Koskai was forced to revise his earlier theory that militarism is an inevitable outgrowth of imperialism, not because imperialism had changed its nature but because his Fabian strategy of wearing out the enemy could not be sustained by his former analysis 146 when Koskai began to refer to members of the left wing as our Russians, Rosa Luxemburg called attention to the fact that just a few years earlier he too had been labeled both a Russian and a preacher of revolutionary romanticism, whereas now his centrist politics involved nothing but parliamentarism 147 at the outbreak of the controversy between the left and center factions of the SPD, most Russian revolutionary leaders failed to take Luxembourg's side. In July 1910, Trotsky wrote to Koskai that no one in the Russian party, not even among the Bolsheviks, dared to side with Luxembourg, and that while he admired her noble impatience he considered it absurd to raise it to a leading principle for the party 148 The most insightful comment on German factional disputes came from Parvis, who pointed out to Koskai that the whole affair is an amusingly faithful copy of the discussion between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks before the Russian Revolution. 149 Although Lenin considered himself Koskai's faithful disciple, for him the moment of revelation came when Koskai failed to oppose war credits to the Kaiser in August 1914. At a special session of the SPD caucus, Koskai instead recommended that approval of credits be made conditional on assurances as to the objectives of the war 150 as Lenin subsequently recalled, this was the moment when Koskiism Nally revealed all its repulsive wretchedness. With the coming of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, the debate over permanent revolution and the dictatorship of the proletariat ended in two completely contradictory outcomes. In Russia, Lenin adopted Trotsky's view when he resolved to seize power from the provisional government, but, in Germany, Koskai took exactly the opposite position, the same position that Marx and Engels had condemned in terms of democratic counter-revolution in 1849-50. To add to the irony, even Rosa Luxemburg expressed grave misgivings about the Bolshevik action. 152 The difference, of course, was that, in 1919, Luxemburg gave her life in the GHT to carry the revolution to Germany, whereas Koskai made peace with the Weimar Republic and devoted the remainder of his days to condemning Bolshevism as a betrayal of Marxism and a new tyranny from which Stalinist totalitarianism followed as a matter of course. Faithful to the concept of permanent revolution, Luxembourg never accepted the counter-revolutionary argument that Russia was not ripe for social revolution due to economic backwardness 153 by 1918 she did, however, acknowledge that a proliferation of small holding peasants would create insurmountable obstacles to socialist agriculture, 154 she did worry that Bolshevik dispersal of the constituent assembly might end by replacing dictatorship of the class with that of a party or of a clique, 155 and she did repeatedly warn that socialism was inconceivable without direct participation of the masses. Socialism in life, she wrote, demands a complete spiritual transformation in the masses degraded by centuries of bourgeois class rule. Decree dictatorial force of the factory overseer, draconic penalties, rule by terror, all these things are but palliatives. The only way to a rebirth is the school of public life itself, the most unlimited, the broadest democracy and public opinion. 156. Though she reproached Lenin and Trotsky, she also emphasized that even the greatest energy and the greatest sacri CES of the proletariat in a single country must inevitably become entangled in a maze of contradictions and blunders 157 The duty of revolutionaries in other countries was therefore perfectly clear, to make the revolution. Koskai, in contrast, assumed precisely the counter-revolutionary positions he had repeatedly denounced in 1905-6. Although he had always believed that the stages of development in Russia could only be shortened given political rule by the workers in Western Europe, 158 he now denounced both Lenin and Trotsky for blanqueism, for abandoning democracy by dissolving the Constituent Assembly, 
and for provoking civil war through instituting proletarian dictatorship as a form of government. Now he argued that Marx and Engels, when speaking of the dictatorship of the proletariat, had in mind only a condition of working class supremacy deriving from universal suffrage, which presupposed a proletarian majority, not a governmental form in which a single party repressed all others and systematically excluded one section of the population after another from democratic political life 159 by dispersing the Constituent Assembly on January 6, 1918, and concentrating power in the Soviets. Instead, the Bolsheviks had escaped all political constraints and embarked on reckless misadventures in which civil war became the sole remaining method of adjusting political and social antagonisms 160 in these circumstances, he decided that the Bolshevik commitment to the dictatorship of the proletariat was nothing but a grandiose attempt to clear by bold leaps or remove by legal enactments the obstacles offered by the successive phases of normal development. They think it is the least painful method for the delivery of socialism, for shortening and lessening its birth pangs. But, their practice reminds us more of a pregnant woman, who performs the most foolish exercises in order to shorten the period of gestation. And thereby causes a premature birth. The result. Is. A child incapable of life. 161. With this single ironic comment, Koskai encapsulated all of the themes that had preoccupied Russian revolutionaries, Narodniks, and Marxists alike since Marx R.S.T. praised the work of Chernyshevsky in 1873. In the 1905 debate over permanent revolution, Koskai had been the ally of Trotsky and Lenin in the struggle against Plekhanov and others who would limit the revolution to establishing a liberal constitutional regime. By 1918, he committed the ultimate betrayal when he concluded that the revolution had turned out be nothing more than a repetition of 1789. The revolution has only achieved in Russia what it effected in France in 1789. By the removal of the remains of feudalism. It has now made of the peasants. The most energetic defenders of the newly created private property in land. 162. In 1905 he had written that. The breaking up of the great private landed estates will constitute a tie that will bind the peasants indissolubly to the revolution. It is easily possible that differences may arise between the peasants and the urban proletariat, but the former will ght tooth and nail to defend the revolution against anyone seeking to re-establish the old aristocratic landed regime, even by foreign intervention. Yet, in 1918, he decided that the very act of abolishing feudal agriculture must inevitably set the peasantry against the proletariat and result in a peasant state 164 committed to a bourgeois social order. Koskai wrote three books in defense of the democratic counter-revolution, the RST two of which were answered by Lenin and Trotsky. In reply to Koskai's The Dictatorship of the Proletariat, Lenin wrote The Proletarian Revolution and The Renegade Koskai. Trotsky's Terrorism and Communism answered Koskai's work with the same title. Koskai's third book, From Democracy to State Slavery, A Discussion with Trotsky, has never been translated into English. 165 No one expressed the Bolsheviks' dismay better than Leon Trotsky in his 1919 preface to a new edition of Results and Prospects. Talking of the attitude of the Mensheviks to the revolution, one cannot but mention the Menshevik degeneration of Koskai. In 1905-6 Koskai, true, not without the Baini Chalinians of Rosa Luxemburg, fully understood and acknowledged that the Russian Revolution could not terminate in a bourgeois democratic republic but must inevitably lead to proletarian dictatorship. Koskai then frankly wrote about a workers' government with a social democratic majority. He did not even think of making the real course of the class struggle depend on the changing and super chail combinations of political democracy. Now, when the prospects outlined 15 years ago have become reality, Koskai refuses to grant a birth certificate to the Russian Revolution for the reason that its birth has not been duly registered at the political of CE of bourgeois democracy. What an astonishing fact! What an incredible degeneration of Marxism! One can say with full justice that the decay of the Second International has found in this Philistine judgment on the Russian Revolution, 
by one of its greatest theoreticians, a still more hideous expression than in the voting of war credits on August 4, 1914. 166. But this was not Trotsky's NAL judgment. For that we must turn to the obituary that Trotsky wrote on the occasion of Koskai's death in 1938. There was a time, Trotsky recalled. When Koskai was in the true sense of the word the teacher who instructed the international proletarian vanguard. I in Germany, in Austria, in Russia, and in the other Slavic countries, Koskai became an indisputable Marxian authority. The attempts of the present historiography of the Stalinist come in turn to present things as if Lenin, almost in his youth, had seen in Koskai an opportunist and had declared war against him, are radically false. Almost up to the time of the World War, Lenin considered Koskai as the genuine continuator of the cause of Marx and Engels. Recognizing that Koskai leaves behind numerous works of value in the eld of Marxian theory, Trotsky concluded that in the NAL analysis he was only half a renegade. We remember Koskai as our former teacher to whom we once owed a great deal, but who separated himself from the proletarian revolution and from whom, consequently, we had to separate ourselves. 167. Readers will nd that Trotsky's judicious assessment of Koskai's best years is fully conremed by the documents we have translated for this anthology. By the 1930s, Trotsky had his own past to uphold in response to an endless torrent of Stalinist lies and Vili Katayan. Trotsky was exiled from the Soviet Union in 1929 and assassinated in Mexico by Stalin's agent in 1940. But in the intervening years he struggled tirelessly to clarify his own historical legacy and to deny that he and Lenin ever had irreconcilable differences concerning either the theory of permanent revolution or the political role it implied for the Russian peasantry. The comprehensive documentary record that follows will allow readers to make their own judgment. The theory of permanent revolution has been a focus of debate for decades, not only between Trotsky's followers and his critics but also amongst academic historians. But in the court of history, as Trotsky understood very well when judging Koskai, fairness and decency require that participants be assured every opportunity to speak for themselves. With that conviction in mind, we have produced this anthology. Chapter 1 The Slavs and Revolution, 1902, Karl Koskai At the time when this article appeared, one Karl Koskai was regarded as the preeminent spokesman of Marxist orthodoxy in Western Europe. His article on the revolutionary potential of the Slavic peoples introduces an important context for the documents translated in this volume. For the previous two decades, Russian Marxists had struggled against the heritage of the Narodniks and their commitment to revolutionary terrorism. In the Narodnik view, Russia was an exception to the West European pattern of development and would establish a socialist society on the basis of the village commune, with its traditional collective tenure of the land and periodic redistribution based upon need and the ability to work. Yet, at the very moment when Russian Marxists were nally moving towards formal party organization, with a seemingly coherent social democratic program authored principally by G.V. Plekhanov and V.I. Lenin, it was none other than Koskai who cited the heroic Narodnik tradition in expounding Russia's current revolutionary potential. The proponents of permanent revolution certainly shared neither the populist ideology nor the terrorist convictions of the Narodniks, but they did disagree profoundly with Plekhanov in their appraisals of Russia's revolutionary prospects. While they supported their arguments with citations from Marx, the spirit of their work was often closer to the revolutionary temperament of Narodniks than to the rigid economic determinism or revisionist denials of socialist revolution that were increasingly prevalent among many West European social democrats. For advocates of permanent revolution, one thing was clear, the liberal bourgeoisie in Russia was a stillborn political force and the revolution, even if it were bourgeois in nature, would be accomplished mainly by the proletariat. To anticipate Russian workers overthrowing the Tsar was one thing, but to explain the consequences was quite another. Would socialist workers lead a revolution in order to introduce capitalism, as Plekhanov expected, or would they immediately begin a movement towards socialism, as the theory of permanent revolution suggested? These questions recur continuously in this volume. 
it is a remarkable irony that Karl Koskai, who subsequently denounced the Bolshevik Revolution and was famously condemned by both Lenin and Trotsky as a traitor and a renegade, too in fact played a key role prior to 1905 in inspiring Russian Marxists. Koskai's gravitas and undisputed authority lent unexpected support to a conception of Russian history that simultaneously confounded Plekhanov's view of orthodoxy and breathed new spirit into Russian social democracy. In the spring of 1920, Lenin quoted this document in defense of the Bolshevik Revolution against Koskai's criticism. Recalling how Koskai believed in 1902, when he was still a Marxist, that the spirit of the Russian proletariat would provide a model to Western Europe, Lenin concluded, how well Koskai wrote 18 years ago. 3. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Slavs and Revolution 61. The Slavs and Revolution. A little more than half a century has elapsed since the revolutionary struggle of the March days. For although this is only a brief interval in the life of society, a whole world separates us from that epoch. The great transformation that has occurred since that time demonstrates even more clearly, perhaps, the relation between the Slavs and the revolution. With very few exceptions, the Slavs in 1848 still comprised a single reactionary mass. Apart from the minor gentry and intelligentsia in Poland, we could say that one part of the Slavs regarded the great struggle for the freedom of peoples with blind indifference, while the other part threw itself into the struggle with the aim of defeating the cause of freedom. The Slavs achieved this end with great success. The fate of the revolution was already decided in Paris at the time of the June days. 5. But if the revolution in Germany and Hungary was so utterly defeated and destroyed, if absolutism in Austria could so completely restore its domination, then that outcome was due to the intervention of the Czechs, the Croats, and the Russian armed forces. The fall of Vienna in the October days of 1848, and the surrender of the Hungarian army to the Russian general Paskovic VI at Vilgos, on August 13, 1849, Sine had the same defeat of the revolution in the East as had occurred during the June massacre in the West. It is no wonder that German revolutionaries, however strong their consciousness of international solidarity, were seized by such ardent hatred for the Austrian Slavs that they began to regard them as degenerate peoples, to Germans it seemed that the revolution would have to step over such degenerates. The Slavs appeared to be nations of slaves and peoples born to vegetate in servitude. But the cause of the anti-revolutionary behavior of the Slavs lay not in some hidden predisposition towards servitude, but, rather in the economic conditions in which they lived. With the exception of the Czechs, they were purely peasant peoples and were completely incapable of understanding the political and social requirements of bourgeois society. It is true that, in Bohemia, there was already a developed urban life and capitalist large-scale industry, but the Czech people consisted of peasants, a petty bourgeoisie, and proletarians who had no class consciousness and whose whole way of thinking followed at the tail end of the petty bourgeoisie. It is true that in 1848 the petty bourgeoisie was still a revolutionary class, yet even then it proved everywhere to be unreliable. The semi-bourgeois, the semi-proletarian, and the petty bourgeois leaned RST one way and then the other, rushing RST to the side of revolution and then to reaction, rising to revolutionary rage and then lapsing into humble submission, but never possessing any RM convictions. The Czech lower middle classes behaved the same way, RST displaying their revolutionary and then their reactionary side, rising up in July against Weindeskritz, who bombarded Prague in response, yet in October sympathizing with the same Weindeskritz when he marched against the hated Vienna. Seven apart, of course, from the unreliability of the petty bourgeoisie, such behavior also reacted national antagonisms. For the Czech peasant, petty bourgeois, and proletarian, the German was the enemy, the exploiter, and the oppressor. Not only was capital in Bohemia German, but the same was also true of the upper layers of the bureaucracy, the priesthood, the army, and much of the nobility. Moreover, in Bohemia the revolution was a German product, its adherents were Germans, and its goal was to unify and strengthen the German nation. It is no surprise that, after a short period of revolutionary intoxication, 
the Czech people threw themselves into the embrace of the counter-revolution. But how everything has changed today. Since 1848 capitalism has made its way through Germany and has reached the Slavs. It has already fully subordinated to itself a Sinecant part of the Slavic world and is progressing rapidly not only in Germany and Poland, but also in Russia and among the Slovenes, the Croats, and the Serbs. Everywhere it is creating proletarians and giving rise to the antagonism between capital and labor, out of which sooner or later grows proletarian class consciousness and an independent proletarian politics that is necessarily a revolutionary politics. The time has long passed, therefore, when the Slavs could be thought of as the embodiment of servile obedience, they have now joined the ranks of peoples with their own revolutionary classes, and there is now taking place among them a great cultural struggle for the emancipation of the working class and with it the whole of humanity. But that is not all. This transformation of the Slavs has been obvious to everyone for quite some time, at least for a quarter of a century. Today, it seems not only that the Slavs have joined the ranks of revolutionary peoples, but even that they are more and more at the center of revolutionary thought and action. The revolutionary center is moving from the west to the east. In the RST half of the 19th century it was in France and occasionally in England. In 1848, Germany joined the ranks of revolutionary nations, from which England shortly afterwards departed. After 1870, the bourgeoisie in all countries began to lose its NAL remnants of revolutionary ambition. From that time onwards, to be a revolutionary also meant to be a socialist. It was during precisely this epoch that the events following the Franco-Prussian War moved the center of gravity, both for socialism and for the European revolutionary movement, from France to Germany. The new century is beginning with the kind of events that suggest we are now seeing a further movement of the revolutionary center, namely, to Russia. It has already happened once, in the late 70s and early 80s, that the heroic struggle of the Russian revolutionaries amazed all of Europe and exerted a most profound inyance on the socialist movement of all cultured countries. Eight along with the insurrection and heroic demise of the Paris Commune, and the incredible growth of German social democracy in its struggle against the Great Bismarck, nothing had such a fertile inyance on the socialist movement of the 70s and 80s, and nothing gave it such encouragement and inspired such self sacrice as the desperate struggle that a handful of Russian revolutionaries fearlessly, and at times with the greatest success, waged against the frightful force of autocracy. This desperate struggle ultimately ended with the exhaustion of Gers who did not yet have the backing of a revolutionary class. But, since that time, there has emerged among the Russian people a new generation of heroes, and now they are more than just individuals. Within the Tsarist Empire there is also growing up a powerful proletariat, which is producing its own heroes and providing the support that was previously lacking for revolutionary heroes from other strata of the people. This means that we are now entering a new epoch of revolutionary struggle in Russia, a struggle that is developing on a much wider basis than a quarter of a century ago but also one that, in terms of the zeal of its gears, in terms of the brutal cruelty and meanness of the oppressors, and in terms of the heroism and devoted self CES of the revolutionaries, is just as impressive as the struggle of the Russian movement in earlier periods. But the struggle that we now see beginning in Russia involves more than physically pitting force against force. The revolutionizing of minds advances alongside the revolution of STS. The now awakening strata of the people are being seized by a passionate thirst for knowledge and are attempting to clarify for themselves their historical tasks so that they might learn to resolve the most complex and difficult problems, rising above the small events of the daily struggle to survey the great historical goals that it serves. And from this awakening of minds we can expect great deeds that cannot fail to inyance Western Europe. Having absorbed so much revolutionary initiative from the West, Russia itself may now be ready to serve the West as a source of revolutionary energy. The revolutionary movement that is airing up in Russia may become the most powerful means for overcoming the spirit of Abbey Philistinism and sober-minded politicking that is beginning to spread through our ranks, it may reignite the aim of commitment to struggle and passionate devotion to our great ideals. In relation to Western Europe, 
Russia has long ago ceased to be merely a bulwark of reaction and absolutism. Today, the exact opposite is probably closer to the truth. Western Europe is becoming the bulwark of reaction and absolutism within Russia. The rotten throne of the Tsars is falling apart and might have collapsed long ago had the West European bourgeoisie not continuously reinforced it with its millions. 9 In 1848, the Tsar lent his might to support Europe in suppressing the uprising of the European bourgeoisie, now that same bourgeoisie is sending its own powerful support to Russia to give the Tsar the strength to suppress all the freedom-loving movements within his own country. The Russian revolutionaries might have dealt with the Tsar long ago if they had not been compelled to wage a simultaneous struggle against his ally, European capital. Let us hope that they will succeed this time in dealing with both enemies, and that the new Holy Alliance 10 will collapse more quickly than its predecessors. But no matter what the outcome of the current struggle in Russia, the all too numerous martyrs that it produces will not sacri see either blood and happiness for nothing. They will fertilize the shoots of social revolution throughout the entire civilized world and cause them to grow ever more rapidly and abundantly. In 1848, the Slavs were the hard frost that killed the blossoms of the spring of peoples. Now, Perhaps, they are destined to be the tempest that will break the ice of reaction and irresistibly bring a new, blessed springtime for the peoples. Chapter 2 The Draft Program of Iskra and the Tasks of Russian Social Democrats, 1903, and Ryazanov. David Borisovic Gol Dendik, Ryazanov, was born in Odessa in 1870 and executed by Stalin in 1938. Although he played a secondary role in social democratic politics, Ryazanov was without question one of the foremost Marxist scholars of his time. In The Rise of Social Democracy in Russia, the historian John Keep described him as an energetic and talented writer who was Lenin's contemporary and more than his equal in Marxist scholarship 1 VA. Smirnova, a Russian biographer writing in 1989, spoke of him as a brilliant individualist who combined a thorough approach to scientific problems with the indomitable and volcanic temperament of Egder, propagandist and Erst debater to his independence of mind was legendary, in his autobiography, Max Beer recalls Lenin's joking description of the Soviet Union as a dictatorship mitigated by Ryazanov. Like most Russian revolutionaries of his generation, Ryazanov was either in prison, in the years 1887, 1891 to 6, and 1907, or in exile during much of the period prior to the revolution of 1917. In 1905 to 6, he was actively involved in organizing trade unions and strikes, RST in Odessa and then in St. Petersburg, where he worked closely with Parvis. For in 1907, he left Russia for Germany where August Babel introduced him to the archives of the German Social Democratic Party, including the papers of Marx and Engels. At the time, the papers had never been systematically organized or catalogued, with partial exceptions such as Eleanor Marx's edition of her father's articles on the Crimean War V and Franz Mehring's edition of Marx and Engels' early writings. Six many papers had been borrowed and not returned, a substantial number were kept by Eduard Bernstein in his own home, others were held by Marx's daughter Laura and her husband Paul Lafargue in Paris, and numerous letters and other items were scattered in private libraries. Following the deaths of Paul and Laura Lafargue in 1911, Ryazanov sorted their papers for the archive and added them to other documents found in libraries in London, Paris, Rome, Florence, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. From 1909 to 1917, he worked with the German Social Democratic Party, collecting and editing the works of Marx and Engels from the 1850s and 1860s, which were published in German in 1917. 7. While conducting this research, writing for German and Austrian party journals, delivering lectures, and gathering material for another project on the history of the First International, Ryazanov discovered some 250 previously unknown articles and items of correspondence by Marx and Engels. 8. Ryazanov was neither a Bolshevik nor a Menshevik prior to 1917. He participated in the Zimmerwald Anti-War Conference of 1915, 
and upon returning to Russia in April 1917 he briefly associated with Trotsky in the non-party interdistrict organization, the Mezrayanksa, until both men joined the Bolshevik party in the summer of 1917. 9 from 1918 to 20, he was active both in trade union work and in the Commissariat of Education. Although he was a regular participant at party congresses during the 1920s, he was principally committed to archival work and academic research. From 1918 to 20 Ryazanov headed the new state archive administration and helped to establish both the Socialist Academy and the Marx-Engels Institute, where he served as director from 1921 to 1931. During the 1920s, he acquired numerous library collections from abroad, and, by 1930, the Marx-Engels Institute possessed more than 450,000 publications in addition to 175,000 copies of documents, including the material by Marx and Engels from the German Social Democratic Archives. During his time at the Institute, Riazano published the collected works of Marx and Engels, 10, as well as those of Plekhanov and Hegel, together with numerous pre-Marxist classics of political economy. By 1930, the Institute had published 150 major works, almost all of them edited by Riazanov. This scholarly work ended when Riazanov was arrested in February 1931 after being implicated in the trial of the so-called Menshevik Center. In a report to the Society of Militant Dialectical Materialists, called to denounce both mechanistic revisionism and Menshevising idealism, M.B. Maiden, one of the most abhorrent of Stalinist philosophers, recalled Ryazanov saying in 1924, I am neither a Bolshevik nor a Menshevik, I am a Marxist. According to Maiden, it was impossible to be a Marxist without being a Leninist, to be a Marxist without being a Bolshevik. 11 On March 8, 1931, Trotsky responded to Ryazanov's arrest with an article entitled The Case of Comrade Ryazanov in which he recalled Lenin's comments. Speaking of his strong side, Lenin had in mind his idealism, his deep devotion to Marxist doctrine, his exceptional erudition, his honesty in principles, his intransigence in defense of the heritage of Marx and Engels. That is precisely why the party put Ryazanov at the head of the Marx-Engels Institute which he himself had created. Had Ryazanov alluded somewhere, even if only in a few words, to the fact that Marx and Engels were only forerunners of Stalin, then all the stratagems of these unscrupulous youngsters would have collapsed. But Ryazanov did not accept this. Ryazanov fell victim to his personal honesty. 12. Ryazanov was accused of wrecking activities on the historical front, expelled from the party and exiled to Saratov, where he worked for six years in a university library. In 1937, he was arrested again and charged with involvement in a right opportunist Trotskyist organization. On January 21, 1938, the military collegium of the USSR Supreme Court condemned him to death by ring squad. The sentence was carried out the same day. Neither in 1931 nor in 1938 did Ryazanov acknowledge any guilt. He was posthumously rehabilitated in legal terms in 1958, and in political terms by the Communist Party in 1989. In the years prior to the 1905 revolution, Ryazanov's most sinecant theoretical contribution came in 1902-3, when Lenin and Plekhanov were drafting a new program for the journal Iskra. Ryazanov was associated with the Bourbier Struggle Group, which was formed in Paris in the summer of 1900 and took its name in May 1901. It included, besides Ryazanov, the prominent Marxist historian Yuri E. M. Steklov, Nevzorov, and E. L. Hurovich, V. Danovic, Y. Smirnov. Bourbier published several volumes on programmatic issues. One of those, which we have edited and translated here, devoted 302 pages to an assessment of the Iskra program and to criticism of Lenin in particular, from a point of view which Riadar Larson, the historian who rediscovered Ryazanov and the Bourbier tendency's role in the development of the theory of permanent revolution after a lapse of almost 70 years, described as revolutionary economism 13 at the time, 
Ryazanov considered Lenin to be not only ill-informed in terms of the history of Marxism but also inclined towards an opportunist compromise with Russian liberalism. Ryazanov's critique of the Iskra program is remarkable because it anticipates in almost every detail the theory of permanent revolution, which is conventionally associated with Leon Trotsky's famous work Results and Prospects. For Ryazanov and Trotsky alike, the rise of Russian capitalism appeared to be an exception from the pattern of Western Europe. Much of Russian industry was nanced from abroad and thus incorporated the latest technology. Large-scale industry meant the working class had better opportunities to organize and the bourgeoisie was more vulnerable. These circumstances suggested that Russian liberalism would be politically ineffective and that social democracy would lead the revolution against Tsarist autocracy. The theme of Russia's exceptionality was not new. In the 1840s, Slavophile writers had claimed that Russia was morally superior to capitalist Europe. Alexander Herzen, initially a Westernising critic of the Slavophiles, subsequently shared their interest in the village commune and, by the early 1850s, hoped that Russia might bypass capitalism and move directly to socialism. The emergence of Russian Marxism in the 1880s was a tale of struggle between revolutionary Narodniks, who thought terror would precipitate an immediate socialist transformation, and the Marxist group Osvobozdany Truda, the Emancipation of Labor Group, which claimed Russia was subject to universal laws discovered by Marx and Engels. Georgi V. Plekhanov, the principal leader of Osvobozdany Truda, had no doubt that Russia would follow the capitalist pattern of development. But in the 1883 program of Osvobozdany Truda, he also emphasized certain peculiarities of the impending class struggle. In a country where capitalist production was not yet dominant, the middle class was incapable of taking the initiative in the struggle against absolutism, meaning that social democracy must struggle not only against the state and the bourgeoisie, as in Western Europe, but also against remnants of serfdom. The working population of Russia is oppressed directly by the whole burden of the enormous police despotic state and at the same time suffers all the miseries inherent in the epoch of capitalist accumulation. Present-day Russia is suffering, as Marx once said of the West European continent, not only from the development of capitalist production, but also from insufficiency of that development. 14. Since the bourgeoisie was too weak to take the initiative against absolutism, the overthrow of the monarchy and creation of a democratic constitutional regime would fall principally to the organized proletariat. As he told the International Workers' Socialist Congress in Paris in 1889, the revolutionary movement in Russia will triumph only as a working class movement or else it will never triumph. 15. In attempting to refute Narodnik theories of Russian exceptionalism, Plekhanov really succeeded only in rephrasing the question. This became evident when a new program for the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party was being prepared in 1902-3. In that context, Lenin added two new elements to the debate, RST, he emphasized in what is to be done. 16. The importance of a professional organization of revolutionaries at the expense of economistic preoccupation with trade unions. Second, he methodically reworked social democracy's agrarian program. Convinced that industrial workers would require support from the rural proletariat, Lenin believed that remnants of the serf owning system must be abolished by returning to the peasants the land they had lost, the so called cut offs, at the time of the Emancipation Edict in 1861. By encouraging development of capitalist agriculture, Lenin hoped to accelerate class differentiation in the countryside, promote rural class struggle, and ensure peasant support for the workers' GHT against autocracy. Although the new program was intended to unify social democratic factions with a clear statement of principles and demands, Lenin himself did not escape the dilemma of Russia's apparent exceptionality. In 1901, he had written that Russian social democrats had abandoned Narodnik ideas of the exceptionalist development of Russia, 17 yet, in 1902, he premised the party's agrarian program explicitly on Russia's exceptional circumstances. We demand a complete and unconditional eradication of the survivals of serf ownership, we hold that the lands which the government of the nobility cut off from the peasantry, 
and which to this day still serve to keep the peasants in virtual bondage, are the peasants' lands. Thus, we take our stand, by way of exception and by reason of the specie historical circumstances, as defenders of small property. 18. Whereas West European socialists were ding to overthrow capitalism, Lenin also believed the Russian Revolution would most directly banity the emerging bourgeoisie. In 1901, he had written that social democrats and liberals would end common ground in the struggle against Tsarist autocracy. The Russian social democrats never closed their eyes to the fact that the political liberties for which they are RST and foremost being will banity primarily the bourgeoisie. If the liberals succeed in organizing themselves in an illegal party, we will support their demands, we will endeavor to work so that the activities of the liberals and the social democrats mutually supplement each other. But even if they fail to do so, which is more probable, we shall not give them up as lost, we will endeavor to strengthen contacts with individual liberals, acquaint them with our movement, support them by exposing in the labor press all the despicable acts of the government and the local authorities, and try to induce them to support the revolutionaries. Such an exchange of services between liberals and social democrats is already proceeding, it must be extended and made permanent. 19. Ryazanov thought Lenin's solicitous attitude towards small property and bourgeois liberals was the antithesis of a proletarian revolutionary program. In 1850, Marx and Engels had declared that the battle cry of the workers must be the permanent revolution 20 in his commentary on the Iskra draft program, Ryazanov concluded the work we have translated here with a similar call for revolution in permanentia. He intended to submit his criticism to the Second Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, meeting in Brussels in the summer of 1903, but he was denied that opportunity. Convened in the hope of unifying the party, the Second Congress actually produced the irreconcilable split between Mensheviks and Bolsheviks. The immediate dispute concerned the denition of the responsibilities of a party member, but the greater issue involved two rival views of working class organization. The Mensheviks hoped for a mass movement similar to that in Germany and other West European countries. In what is to be done, however, Lenin argued that the only serious organizational principle for the active workers of our movement should be the strictest secrecy, the strictest selection of members, and the training of professional revolutionaries. 21. Ryazanov condemned the narrowness of Lenin's formulation. In his pre-Congress commentary on the draft program, Ryazanov protested. We must never forget that social democracy is the party of a class, not a sect, that it is a party of the masses, not of individuals, and that it aims to make history, not histories. History is made only by the masses. Following Lenin's victory at the Congress, Ryazanov wrote an account of the party split and denounced organizational fetishism, sectarianism, and an emerging person and cultist 22 like Rosa Luxemburg, he believed the NAL goal for social democracy is simultaneously the starting point. Socialist emancipation could not begin with working class obedience. In a party conceived as a conspiracy, the organization will become an assembly of sheep, and the functionaries will transform themselves from its servants into its dictators, 23. Hitherto the party committees served the workers, now the workers serve the committees. Unconditional obedience is demanded of everyone, workers are to obey the committees, which in turn obey the central committee, and the latter, under supervision of the central organ Iskra, which is counting on working masses who are ready to be subordinated, prepares, orders, and produces the general armed uprising. 24. Ryazanov's criticism of Lenin won him a notoriety among Bolsheviks that was endlessly recited from 1931 onwards and ultimately made him a victim of the party degeneration he had predicted more than a quarter of a century earlier. Although he never grew prominently as a political leader after the struggles of 1903, his scholarly contribution remains enormous and beyond dispute. 25 In the work translated below, he distinguished himself not only as a Marxist thinker, but as one who could respect Marx's accomplishments while also frankly discussing his tactical mistakes. 
Ryazanov's commentary on the draft program of Iskra and the tasks of Russian Social Democrats provides unique insight into the principles at stake in early party debates. Addressing the issue of Russia's exceptionality, Ryazanov was the RST Marxist to translate the burden of backwardness into the historical possibility of permanent revolution. That insight alone earns him a place alongside Leon Trotsky as one of the outstanding visionaries of the RST Russian Revolution. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The draft program of Iskra and the tasks of Russian Social Democrats 26. Part I, Questions of Theory. What must we demand of the program? The party program must be a brief, clear, and consistent exposition of principles. A program is not the same as a manifesto, which is simultaneously an indictment of the existing order and a defense of the newly arising order of things. A program is a declaration of war against the existing system, one that takes into account, in advance, all the factors leading to victory while also showing the opponent a picture of his own future and his inevitable defeat. A program is a kind of credo of the party and a memento mori 27 for ITS opponents. As a theoretical expression of capitalist society and a formulation of the material and intellectual elements of the socialist system it creates, as a diagnosis of its sickness and a prognosis of its impending fate, the program must be thoroughly international in content. But the general theoretical content of the program is complicated by one element. However common the principles of social democracy may be, and however inevitable it is that the workers' movement will adopt them at a certain stage of its development, the actual process of adoption occurs in the context of diverse conditions that depend upon the particular development of the country in question and the combination of international economic and political conditions prevailing at a particular time. 28. If we wish to emphasize the orthodox character of our program, then we must not merely indicate our goal but also underline the means by which we social democrats, as distinct from all other socialist parties, attempt to achieve that goal. Bernstein's formula that the movement is everything, the NAL goal nothing is meaningless nonsense in every respect. This is a formula devoid of content. A movement without a goal makes no sense. 29. Collectivism, communism, socialism, this is the NAL goal of the economic movement occurring before our eyes, whose laws of development were RST discovered by Marx and Engels. The development of the capitalist system itself is preparing all the material and economic prerequisites for the socialist system. Socialism has already become an economic possibility. But how can the possibility be realized? Reality itself gives us the answer to this question too. And what does it say? It says that history is the history of class struggles, that every major change of social relations results from the struggle of one class against another, and that the only idea with any prospect of being realized is the one with an organized class behind it. That class's revolutionary dictatorship is the necessary precondition for such realization. But is there a class in today's society whose interest would be the realization of socialism? In the opinion of social democrats, the answer is yes. That class is the proletariat. T-H-E-N-A-L goal of social democracy, that is, of the proletariat. Is social revolution and the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. Such a N-A-L goal. Dictates with iron logic the form of movement leading up to it, and it determines clearly and precisely every aspect of tactics. Social democracy, consciously aspiring to become and to remain the class movement of the proletariat, comes out forcefully against any attempt to conceal the class struggle that is occurring in front of us. And regarding the class struggle of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie, when waged to its natural end, as the sole road to emancipation of the working class, it must energetically resist every attempt to replace that struggle with any form of collaboration between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. As Koskai says, the goal and the movement of social democracy are closely tied together, and the one must not be separated from the other. The NAL goal for social democracy is simultaneously the starting point. It is precisely because the contradictions of the existing system can be nally resolved only by socialism, 
that social democracy makes socialism the starting point of its direct revolutionary struggle and the center of gravity for all its propaganda and agitation 30. If not in essence, then in form the struggle of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie is at RST a national struggle. The proletariat of every country must RST of all niche off its own bourgeoisie. 31 But precisely because the great emancipatory movement of the proletariat is a national struggle only in terms of form, the program of social democracy must also express, by implication, the international functions of the working class of the particular country. The most immediate national task of the Russian working class is at the same time one of the major tasks of the entire international proletarian movement. The overthrow of Russian absolutism, the main instrument of European reaction, will eliminate one of the greatest obstacles in the way of the great emancipatory struggle of the international proletariat. The Russian working class will derive renewed strength. From the knowledge that it is shouldering the task of emancipating all of Russia from Tsarist despotism, and also the entire international movement from one of its most dreadful enemies. 32. Development of the capitalist mode of production has completely transformed both world trade and, together with it, the universal market. As Parvis says, the national production of different countries is becoming interconnected with the result that it is losing its national character, in place of internationalism comes cosmopolitanism. National production is losing its independence. It is being subordinated as production activities in different countries become the interconnected and mutually conditioning parts of a single production whole, not located in any particular nation, it becomes precisely a universal market. 33. It is precisely this development that creates in each country a proletariat whose interests are not merely identical in different countries but also common. Consciousness of this fact is spreading increasingly amongst the working classes of different countries, and the old utopian notion of the international brotherhood of peoples is giving way more and more to the international brotherhood of the working classes in a common struggle against the ruling classes and their governments 34. Orthodox Marxists have never claimed that the proletariat, the working class, already comprises an enormous majority of the population, only that it will become the majority. When Russian social democracy RST had to struggle for its right to exist, when it demonstrated that the revolutionary movement in Russia can triumph only as a revolutionary movement of the workers, it met with the objection that in Russia, out of a population of 100 million, there are only 800,000 workers united by capital, and that the worker who is capable of exercising a class dictatorship hardly even exists. How did the theorists of Russian social democracy respond? Tihe appealed to the dynamic of our social life and to the incontestable growth of the working class. This statement of fact was far more important to them than belaboring the question of the number of workers at any given moment. 35. We are dealing with the program of Russian Social Democrats. We have, therefore, the right to expect an analysis of Russian reality. No one nowadays debates the question of whether Russia is or is not passing through the phase of capitalist development. That question was decided long ago. It is obvious not only that capitalism is becoming overpowering, but also that it is in fact already overpowering. This does not mean, however, that our capitalism is at the same stage of development as capitalism in Western Europe, and even their capitalism is not everywhere the same. What we end are different stages of capitalism, which develops in each country according to specific circumstances. All that is common are the characteristic features of capitalism and the tendencies of its development. 36. Part 2, Questions of Practice General Issues Facing Social Democracy Social democracy is the party of the proletariat that has become conscious of its class interests. It is a socialist party because it sees the principal cause of all the evils of the capitalist system in the existence of private property in the means of production, and it adopts the goal of abolishing these evils by transforming the means of production into social property. It is a democratic party because full democratization of the state and the social system, a democratic republic. 
is the fundamental condition for free development of the proletariat's class struggle. It is a revolutionary party because it can only reach its goal through revolution. 37. Even though it is not the majority of the population, the party of social democracy still represents the class that expands and develops with the growth of capitalism while other classes decline and disappear. Moreover, it is also the only party that, while directly involved in the present, is already today the party of the future. 38. If social democracy puts forth the principle of class struggle, it is only in the sense that, being the party of the proletariat, it cannot help but be unconditionally opposed to all attempts to suppress the class struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and, in its place, to substitute peaceful coexistence or collaboration between these classes. If social democracy defends the interests of the oppressed classes better and more decisively than any other democratic party, that is simply because it is the party exclusively of the proletariat and represents its class interests alone. The simple reason for this is that only the interests of this class are those of progress and social development. The class interests of the proletariat are the sole criterion that makes it possible to make our way in the labyrinth of the present. As the most advanced party, it must stand at the head and be the vanguard of the entire revolutionary movement against the existing system. For this purpose, however, it has no need to recruit other classes, it must attract them through example, through being the party of the most revolutionary class. Any curtailment of the class demands of the proletariat, in order not to jeopardize a general consensus of the moment, is therefore a betrayal not only of the proletariat's cause but also of the interest of social development. Conversely, the emphatic expression of these narrow class interests is at present the very best tactic for social democracy 39. How does class consciousness emerge? Know yourself, that is what social democracy never tires of saying to the working class. Close scrutiny of its own existence, of its conditions of life, leads the working class to consciousness of its historical mission, which is dictated precisely by those living conditions. Hand in hand with this must also emerge its grasp of the conditions of its emancipation, which is not possible without understanding the organization of contemporary bourgeois society. The objective precondition of this self-knowledge on the part of the working class is crystallization of the different professional groups that make up the proletariat into a class that is united in the consciousness of its common interest, or in Marx's words, the conversion of the working class from a class and such into a class fur such. 40. See Omrad Lenin. Does not agree with these truisms. H.E. is trying to push us towards the following view. Class political consciousness can be brought to the workers only from without, that is, only from outside the economic struggle, from outside the sphere of relations between workers and employers. 41. Bringing class political consciousness to the working class from without is just as absurd as attracting the masses into active political struggle. Lay extremes se touchant. All the debates of recent years essentially come down to one main point, some people consider the working class to be a passive element that must be inoculated with social democratic principles with the help of some homeopathic injection so that it might gradually be attracted into active. Quotation is, class political consciousness can be brought to the workers only from without, that is, only from outside the economic struggle, from outside the sphere of relations between workers and employers. The sphere from which alone it is possible to obtain this knowledge is the sphere of relationships of all classes and strata to the state and the government, the sphere of the interrelations between all classes. For that reason, the reply to the question as to what must be done to bring political knowledge to the workers cannot be merely the answer with which, in the majority of cases, the practical workers, especially those inclined towards economism, mostly content themselves, namely, to go among the workers. To bring political knowledge to the workers the social democrats must go among all classes of the population, they must dispatch units of their army in all directions. Lenin 1902 H, P 422. Political struggle, while others believe that the working class, by virtue of its circumstances, is the most revolutionary class in Russia. 
the active protest of the working class arises just as inevitably from given social political conditions as does the working class itself. Therefore, the view that socialism is brought to the proletariat from without, by the bourgeois intelligentsia, is just as mistaken as the view that social democracy grows up on its own from within the proletariat. That kind of thinking accords the proletariat both too much honor and too much to see a newer 42. People of science were needed to work out the economy of the proletariat, and because of historical circumstances they are naturally recruited from the ranks of the intelligentsia. As Yuk people are from the intelligentsia, but they are not bourgeois. In the great majority of cases they are representatives of the thinking proletariat, 43 who cannot tolerate a social system that converts science into an instrument of rule by the exploiters and subordinates arts and craftsmanship to their enjoyment. Nor can one say that the class consciousness of workers develops outside of the relation between workers and employers. The class consciousness of the working class develops when the class struggle begins between the proletariat and Thib Arjwasi. Despite all the pushing by Comrade Lenin, we cannot understand the claim that the only sphere from which it is possible to obtain this knowledge is the sphere of relationships of all classes and strata to the state and the government, the sphere of the interrelations between all classes. 44. Comrade Lenin goes too far. Social Democrats cannot develop the consciousness of the working class without awakening consciousness of opposition between its interests and those of all other classes. Precisely because the proletariat is the sole genuinely revolutionary class, and precisely because it is the class of have-nots that is deprived of private property, the starting point for social democratic propaganda cannot be the interrelations between all classes. The fundamental condition for the success of social democratic propaganda and agitation is, therefore, emphasis upon the spicy C-class position of the proletariat. Only after emphasizing what sets the proletariat apart can we enter without risk into the sphere of relationships of all classes, only then can we refer to the points of contact between the working class and other social classes, particularly those in opposition, provided that we never fail to point out at the same time the class character of the state, which in turn alters attitudes towards it on the part of the propertied classes and those that are properly s. I cannot understand, despite all the pushing by comrade. Theoretical work of social democrats should aim at studying all the species features of the social and political condition of the various classes. But extremely little is done in this direction as compared with the work that is done in studying the spicy C features of factory life. In the committees and study circles, one can meet people who are immersed in the study even of some special branch of the metal industry, but one can hardly ever end members of organizations, obliged, as often happens, for some reason or other to give up practical work who are especially engaged in gathering material on some pressing question of social and political life in our country which could serve as a means for conducting social democratic work among other strata of the population. In dwelling upon the fact that the majority of the present-day leaders of the working class movement lack training, we cannot refrain from mentioning training in this respect also, for it too is bound up with the economist conception of close organic connection with the proletarian struggle. The principal thing, of course, is propaganda and agitation among all strata of the people. The work of the West European Social Democrat is in this respect facilitated by the public meetings and rallies which all are free to attend, and by the fact that in Parliament he addresses the representatives of all classes. We have neither a Parliament nor freedom of assembly, nevertheless, we are able to arrange meetings of workers who desire to listen to a Social Democrat. We must also end ways and means of calling meetings of representatives of all social classes that desire to listen to a democrat, for he is no social democrat who forgets in practice that the communists support every revolutionary movement, that we are obliged for that reason to expound and emphasize general democratic tasks before the whole people, without for a moment concealing our socialist convictions. He is no social democrat who forgets in practice his obligation to be ahead of all in raising, accentuating, and solving every general democratic question. Lenin 1902 H, P 425. Lenin, why social democrats, in order to bring class political consciousness to the workers, 
must go among all classes of the population. 45. Comrade Lenin makes a cruel mockery of our movement with the following comment. At the present time, gigantic forces have been attracted to the movement. The best representatives of the younger generation of the educated classes are coming over to us. Everywhere in the provinces there are people, resident there by dint of circumstances, who have taken part in the movement in the past or who desire to do so now, and who are gravitating towards social democracy, whereas in 1894 one could count the social democrats on the injures of one's hand. A basic political and organizational shortcoming of our movement is our inability to utilize all these forces and give them appropriate work. 46. Alas, this is but a dream. Our problem is precisely the fact that we have too few people capable of going to the workers with the living word of social democratic propaganda. And word of mouth commentary is far more important than anything in print. At present, when our practical tasks are becoming all the more complex, when we must prepare the Russian working class for the decisive battle, we social democrats must ourselves go to the workers and summon the best representatives of the younger generation. What exactly are the tasks we face? The special characteristics of Russia and the tasks of Russian social democrats. There are many prejudices still circulating among Russian social democrats that should have been criticized long ago. These prejudices result from the fact that in our appraisals of Russian conditions, we were guided by the pattern of Western Europe. This happened because in the debates with our proponents of exceptionalism 47 we overemphasized developmental similarities between Russia and the West European countries while setting aside or overlooking Russia's peculiarities. The fact is, however, that Russia is developing in a very unique way. The activity of our party can only be effective in historical terms if, while following the general principles of scientific socialism, we also begin with an accurate analysis of all the peculiarities in Russia's historical development. 48. All that is required is to keep in mind that we are talking about the specific features of Russia's historical development, which in no way prevent it, in general terms, from passing through all the same phases as Western Europe did. But each of these phases, even apart from differences in duration, has its own specific features that are attributable to the equally powerful inances of international relations. The phase in which Russia presently NDS itself is the eve of the bourgeois revolution, which the main countries of Western Europe passed through a long time ago, and the position of Russia is really quite unique. 49. A. The RST peculiarity, capitalism under open surveillance of socialism. Not a single country in Western Europe, on the eve of its bourgeois revolution, had the same degree of large-scale industry as Holy Russia. Not a single West European country experienced the same breakneck speed of capitalist development as our country. In Western Europe, the technological and economic revolutions took place over hundreds of years, whereas in Russia they have been concentrated in a period of scarcely 100 years. W.E. can say that capitalism in Russia, once freed from serfdom, has completed in just four decades a greater work of destruction and construction than it did in England over a period of several centuries. At the same time, a socialist movement has also been developing that in terms of intensity has no equal even in the history of the German revolutionary movement before 1848. Since the 1850s we have had an uninterrupted tradition not only of socialist thought, but also of socialist practice. By the 1880s, this movement gathered all its strength with the aim of giving Russia the opportunity to bypass capitalism and move to socialism. Disregarding the laws of history, in the late 1870s the Naradovoltsi 50 made an extremely audacious attempt to niche off absolutism and capitalism at one fell swoop. They were convinced that the collapse of absolutism would be a direct prologue to the collapse of capitalism. They were cruelly punished for their audacity, and today they are still sometimes being severely reprimanded for their sociological ignorance. But the fact is that were it not for their remarkable sociological practice and their bitter experience, we would hardly understand scientici socialism any better today than the pure Marxists of the 1870s did 51. 
The highly important circumstance that the socialist movement in our country began already when capitalism was still in the embryo must not be lost on us. This peculiarity of Russian social development was not invented by the Slavophiles 52 or the pro-Slavophile revolutionaries. It is an indisputable fact. Which we are all aware of and which will be of great banity to the cause of our working class on the condition that the Russian socialists do not waste their energy building castles in the air after the style of the Principality and Vesh epoch. 53. Or, as we would now add, even in the style of the capitalist epoch. 54. The process of laying the foundations of capitalism in our country has always been exposed to socialist criticism. Russian Social Democrats have seen to this, and they will have to continue doing so all the more forcefully. Exposing all the methods of primitive accumulation, they will stigmatize every step that our capitalism takes in its peaceful progress, they will also reveal the hypocritical reality behind all the talk about economic progress, civilization, and culture, with which it attempts to hide the rapacious exploits of capitalists of every category. Having at their disposal a wealth of experience in Western Europe, they will use these exploits to develop the class consciousness of the proletariat and to warn other exploited classes of the danger they face, they will also resist every attempt to speed up the development of capitalism with arty chale means. Struggling against every reactionary undertaking by the petty bourgeoisie, they must also avoid ever becoming advocates for the capitalists. 55 There is no need to defend the exploits of some particular groups of capitalists in order to show the historical importance of capitalism. That job, along with immediate concerns about economic progress, can be left to the capitalists themselves along with their toadies 56. And attitudes were later adopted in Modi ed form by the Narodniks, who defended Russia's collective agriculture through revolutionary struggle against the Tsarist state. Only in this way will none of the responsibility for capitalism's development fall on the socialists even though that development works to the socialists' banity. This is the only way in which social democracy can demonstrate to the entire toiling masses that in representing the interests of the proletariat, it simultaneously wages a struggle in modern society not just against the exploitation of hired labor, but also against every other form of exploitation and oppression. That same unique feature also helps us in making propaganda for socialism, in which one of the most important conditions for success is the proletariat's understanding that the capitalist process of production has an historical, transitional character. In other countries, where capitalism has existed from time immemorial, its development was accompanied by formation of a kind of working class that, because of its education, tradition, and habits, looks upon the demands of this mode of production as if they were obvious laws of nature. All the countless torments and suffering that are costs of development for this form of production, all the blood that was spilled in the history of primitive capital accumulation, all this is obscured by thick layers of dust built up over a history of many centuries. An example can be seen in Holland, where capitalism developed very early. With the passage of time, Social life in that country was molded in certain stable forms, and Holland was transformed into a kind of bourgeois China. We can see the same thing in England. But today the tempo of industrial development is accelerating more and more, especially in young countries. Not only the development of capitalism in Russia cannot be as slow as it was in England, for example, its very existence cannot be so lasting as it has been fated to be in the West European countries. 57 It is also understandable that capitalism's more rapid tempo of development accelerates the development of its consequences. All. His academic irritation with Marxism to embrace liberal demands for civil rights in a constitutional monarchy. At every step of the way, he tries to show that capitalism is not generally responsible for the evils attributed to it. These kinds of solicitous melodies abound in the writings of our legal Marxists. Here is one example, whence, indeed, does it follow that the efforts of our entrepreneurs to utilize the advantages of pre-capitalist methods of production should be charged to our capitalism, and not to those survivals of the past which retard the development of capitalism and which in many cases are preserved by force of law. V. Ilion, Rajvatai Kapitalism of Erosi, p. 394. 
in the following pages, we shall have more occasions to refer to this writer. Vladimir Ilyin was in fact Lenin, whom Ryazanov is comparing here to Struve and the legal Marxist toadies. See Lenin 1899, p. 495. The XED and Fossi least relations dissolve even more rapidly, and the result is that the people, including the proletariat, are all the more compelled to take a hard look at their own mutual relations and their conditions of life. These circumstances explain the more rapid growth of social democracy in Germany, Austria and Italy, and at the same time permit us to hope that in our country the development of social democracy will occur even more quickly. 58. b. The second peculiarity, the political sterility of our bourgeoisie. Political reforms are not the task of the Socialist Revolutionary Party. That whole business has to be left to the people who call themselves liberals. But those people are absolutely impotent in our country, for whatever reasons, they have turned out to be incapable of giving Russia free institutions or guarantees of personal rights. Such institutions are so vitally necessary that without them no activity is possible. For this reason, the Russian Socialist Revolutionary Party is obliged to take upon itself the responsibility for crushing despotism and giving Russia the political forms within which ideological struggle will become possible. 59. That is how the Naradovoltsi, mainly Jlyabov, formulated their views at the Voronezh Congress. 60. Tihi Osvobazdani Truda 61 group also pointed out. The inability of our middle class to take any initiative in the struggle against absolutism. This thinking was set out in the RSTD Raft P. Ragrama. 62. The second draft was written in Sine Cantley different conditions. A middle class had irresistibly emerged along with the development of capitalism. This reinforced the belief that in Russia, the Social Democratic Party would go along with the bourgeoisie because the latter is revolutionary in its struggle against absolute monarchy, feudal land holding and the petty bourgeoisie 63. Comrade Axelrod wrote that the Western pattern indicates that the overthrow of absolutism led to the rule of the bourgeoisie, ergo, it was a bainy tea for the bourgeoisie above all 64 this same pattern suggests that the bourgeoisie raised the banner of struggle against the autocracy. But let us look at the issue more closely. It is true that, in Western Europe, different strata of the bourgeoisie waged the struggle against autocracy, but, even there, it was waged more successfully when the proletariat actively participated in the struggle and drove the bourgeoisie on. The most resoluteers for democracy were the petty bourgeoisie in the cities. The big and middle industrial bourgeoisie fought much less consistently. The only exceptions were England and France, where these strata of the bourgeoisie defended constitutional guarantees, a limited monarchy, in the struggle against absolutism, which was supported by the feudal landowners and the nanchal aristocracy. In Germany, it was already the case that the bourgeoisie had the misfortune to arrive too late 65 it failed even to win undivided power, and now, having secured for itself the political conditions necessary for free development of its passion for surplus value, it has ceded power to the reactionaries. It was frightened by the insurrection of the French proletariat, which did not herald particularly cheerful prospects for the bourgeoisie, and it was hoary at to learn that the German proletariat, which in the 1840s had already expressed its dissatisfaction with what the bourgeoisie saw as mere imperfections in the political regime, was now ready to use revolution to secure the conditions needed for free development of its own class struggle against the bourgeoisie. Someone might well ask, but doesn't this contradict the manifesto of the Communist Party by Marx and Engels? The point is that Marx and Engels overestimated the progressive character of the German bourgeoisie. They only knew the experience of England and France, which suggested that the historical mission of the bourgeoisie is the conquest of political freedom. They were convinced, therefore, that the coming revolution would result in the rule of the bourgeoisie, that the social and political conditions accompanying this rule would become a weapon in the hands of German workers against the bourgeoisie itself, and that this new struggle would begin immediately after the fall of the reactionary classes in Germany. In that case, 
the bourgeois revolution would necessarily serve as the immediate prologue to the workers' revolution. The tactics that Marx and Engels adopted in 1848-9 logically followed from these views. They wanted to go along with the bourgeoisie, and they quite deliberately took a position on the extreme left wing of bourgeois democracy, differentiating themselves only by their more extreme political demands. During all of 1848 and the beginning of 1849, they helped the bourgeoisie to wage its political struggle, dictated its program of action at each step of the way, energetically pushed it in the direction of determined opposition, and themselves took the initiative in refusing to compromise. But all the work and efforts of Marx and Engels were in vain. The fact is that the workers and the most radical strata of the petty bourgeoisie made the revolution. The bourgeoisie, as Engels said, only endured the revolution, and he and Marx soon understood that they had excessively idealized the bourgeoisie, which turned out to be completely incapable of fulfilling its own historical mission. Moreover, while Marx and Engels were expending their energy in giving a push to the bourgeoisie, the already emerging workers' movement saw its turn to act. The League of Communists began its own activity too late, and it accomplished nothing in the sense of linking its NAL goal to the workers' movement, which behaved perfectly spontaneously. While the communists worked in the ranks of bourgeois democracy and providing it with leadership, the workers were busy with strikes, workers' unions, and production associations, forgetting that the main point at issue was to win for themselves, with the help of a political victory, the space without which the stable existence of such things was impossible. 66. Marx and Engels soon recognized their mistake in light of the experience of the new Irenus Xidu. While inciting the bourgeoisie, they were unable as devoted communists, despite their best intentions, to function merely as the extreme left wing of bourgeois democracy or to hide the fact that by pushing the bourgeoisie they only ended up all the sooner at loggerheads. As a result, they ended up pushing away the bourgeoisie, who had no interest in continuing a revolution that had been foisted upon them. It became obvious that the working class could not wait for a bourgeois victory as a precondition for taking up its own task. But it was already too late. The bourgeoisie was already so frightened that it rushed to surrender itself to the wrath and mercy of absolutism at the expense not only of the workers but also of the peasants. I have said that Marx and Engels made a mistake. But there are different kinds of mistakes. To use Marx's words, this was a mistake of world historical character that was rooted in objective conditions. But if we want to avoid repeating that mistake, if we want to avoid making our own strictly subjective mistake, then we must not close our eyes to one of Russia's special characteristics, namely, the fact that our bourgeoisie has shown itself to be emphatically incapable of taking any revolutionary initiative whatever. Our national bourgeoisie is every bit as reactionary as its counterparts in Western Europe. All of its interests bind it to the autocratic system. Its purely political inyance is attenuated by the fact that the Russian state controls the main reservoirs of the entire country's circulation of money and credit, and also by the fact that foreign loans play the predominant role in the system of state credit. As for any active opposition role on the part of the big and middle industrial bourgeoisie in our country, it is practically non-existent. They do not even dream of carrying that role any further than so-called representation of the interests of industry. Only our commercial bourgeoisie is liberally inclined, along with that section of the landowners who have succeeded in becoming industrial capitalists, that is, who are concerned not only with the appropriation of surplus value but also with its production. It is around these people that the bourgeois intelligentsia are gathered. All of these elements are constrained under absolutism and would have no objection to limiting it, but any such desires are poisoned before they can take root. Apart from that, the hensite of our liberalism is constrained by the indecisive mood of social strata that are not accustomed to political life. If the German bourgeoisie could still gratify itself up to 1848 with the illusion that events such as the uprising of the Silesian weavers were due merely to imperfections of the political system, its Russian counterpart has already eaten so much from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that it is oblivious to any such illusions. 
it fears nothing so much as the mortal threat of revolution, even though, according to the pattern, it is supposed to bane T from the revolution above all others. It fears not merely the proletariat, but also the growing dissatisfaction of the petty bourgeoisie. In other words, in Russia the ideology of the bourgeoisie, liberalism, has faded even before it blossomed 67 the growth of production in our country is being measured by hours rather than by days. The underdeveloped condition of the middle class has receded into legend, but they still resist any conscious awareness of their own emancipatory mission. Our honest and incorruptible, wise and educated liberals, who truly sympathize with their suffering motherland, 68 are amazingly gracious when they compare Chernyshevsky, Dobrolyubov and others to IES fouling the picture painted by a great artist, referring to the epoch of great reforms, 69 and our Russian radicals and constitutionalists, amongst whom, in Comrade Lenin's words, there are many wise people, cannot even reason their way to the most fundamental basic right, the right of every citizen to participate in the political life of the country. The general absence of people in the liberal camp, as Comrade Martov 70 puts it, was never revealed as strikingly as it is now. Comrade Plekhanov, along with Iskra, is still hoping for a rebirth of Russian liberalism. Comrade Plekhanov is convinced that when the idea spreads through the ranks of Russian liberals that the political awakening of the Russian proletariat is not a myth but an absolutely indisputable truth, then a serious liberal movement will emerge in our country. Inspired by this prospect, Comrade Martov optimistically anticipates the men of the future, who will breathe new life into Russian liberalism, and he predicts that we shall have great cures in our own Johann Jacobi's end. Lafayette 71 where now we have only the depressing spectacle as Comrade Martov's voice becomes choked with tears of nights of peaceful cultural development. Abandon hope, all yet who enter 72 into this world of people who are neither alive nor dead as they rejoice in the celebration of nonsense. History has played a cruel trick on our liberalism. The reality is that a serious liberal movement can only emerge where the political awakening of the proletariat is precisely a myth and not an indisputable fact. The revolutionary struggle of the Russian proletariat is so spirited that it cannot have any other effect than to awaken people, even people as lethargic as our liberals. But even as they are just wiping their eyes, they begin to think to themselves, is there not a pro tea to be made from this? Our future Jacobis and Lafayettes, preferring to hide under the tree of moderation, are already beginning to count the chestnuts that they will have others pull from the re. Although they are devoted supporters of law and order, who oppose the use of force by anyone, high or low, they also know perfectly well that a revolution non olet. 73 Together with their new leaders, they say to themselves. A moderate party with a clever tactic can pro t from intensifying struggle between extreme social elements, and as hard-headed realists in politics, and, of course, as idealists outside of politics, they are already becoming cretinous proponents of parleying a truce with absolutism in anticipation of the time when they will be the cretins of parliamentarism. But at this point I will be struck down by the author of the lead article in number 16 of Iskra Lenin, who says, it is particularly in regard to the political struggle that the class point of view demands that the proletariat push forward every democratic movement. We will not forget, however, that if we want to push someone forward, we must continuously keep our hands on that someone's shoulders. The party of the proletariat must learn how to grab hold of any liberal at the moment when he contemplates moving by a Vershik and force him instead to advance by an Arshin. 74 And if he hesitates, then we will go forward without him and over him. 75. The party of the proletariat may push forward the liberals from time to time, but that only requires using the lash of merciless criticism against every Philistine banality of their noncommittal moderation. The experience of Iskra demonstrates the hopelessness of this business of pushing forward the liberals. However elegantly gloved is the hand that rests on the shoulders of the liberals, and however gently it deals with our wise and educated, honest and incorruptible liberals, who truly sympathize with the suffering of their motherland, 
76 are future Jacobis and Lafayettes have enough of a class-based sense of smell to sniff out anyone who, with his other hand, hopes to detect every false E.R. of revolutionary Marxist theory on the plane of ideas. We are supposed to send greetings to our new allies. Lenin says we are to help them. You can see that they are poor, they can only put out a small Lee-E.T., issued in a worse form than the Lee-E.T.S. of the workers and students. We are rich. We shall publish it in printed form. You can see that they are weak, they have so little contact with the people that their letter passes from hand to hand as if it were actually a copy of a private letter. We are strong. We can and must circulate this letter among the people, and primarily among the proletariat, which is prepared for and has already commenced the struggle for the freedom of the whole people 77. With this kind of honeyed and unctuous language, Iskra encouraged the old Zemtsi in connection with their letter of March 1902. And just two weeks later the poor Zemtsi were already revelling in the moderate voice of their own man Struve. A new planet appeared on the horizon of illegal literature, not a quasi, but a real periodical, Osvobazdini. 78 But Iskra was still not happy, having no wish to accept the liberals as they really are. It leaves that to the Philistines. Sufficient unto itself, it retained its holy displeasure with life. It wasn't you that I pushed forward, you are not the one I encouraged. And with an angry hand it now pushes away the liberal who appears before it in the esh. Good riddance. And he leaves without even receiving a greeting. But I, a secret and unconscious supporter of economism, 79 nevertheless greet Osvobazdini and wish it success with all my heart. I do so not merely because Mr. Struve cleared out of the Marxist camp. Like many orthodox people, he only had a reputation of being a Marxist. And we can only celebrate the fact that he cleared out of the circle of our most inyential Marxists. A good quarrel is always better than a poor truce, especially with people who are moderate. There is one further reason why I welcome Osvobazdini and wish it success with all my heart, now that our liberals have nally shown their cards and spoken up clearly, they are no longer any threat. There is no need to tear from this bourgeoisie any ideological cover that they used in other countries to disguise their class interests. What we see before us is the naked interest of the property owner and the heartless cash of political calculation 80. Every illusion is harmful, and this is especially true of class illusions, but the most harmful of all are illusions concerning another class. The sooner such illusions are abandoned, the better off we shall be. 81. It is also time for Iskra to abandon its illusions. Of course, we ought not to take the liberals just as they are. We must take them as they will become, and in that context it is all the more urgent to get rid of illusions, especially when we have other means to do so than the use of honey. 82. Nevertheless, however disgusting our liberal bourgeoisie may sometimes be, and expecting nothing from them for ourselves, we must always support, and we will always support, any ray of light in this grey kingdom, any sparkle of political decency in their midst. But this support must by no means imply that we will prepare ourselves so that the proletariat, in the event that any Zemstvo that is at all honest is insulted by the Tsarist government, will be able to reply with demonstrations against the Pompadour governors, the desperado gendarmes, and the Jesuit censors 83 here, too, Iskra is overdoing it. It is touched by the miserable appearance of the poor Zemtsi and, like a good little mother, it has a duty to care for all its children and to be especially tender with those that are diseased or anxious. I would prefer it if the honest Zemstvos responded themselves, not with demonstrations, they are too respectable for that but at least with petitions against the most egregious insults to the proletariat and the peasantry. But, to borrow your energetic style, Comrade Lenin, I have run out of patience waiting. So, what is to be done? You are an eminent Spartan, I am just a bourgeois doctrinaire. At the risk of passing for an economist, or even being promoted to the higher rank of secret economist, may I be so bold as to inform you, with no intention of any offense or injury, 
that our support must go no further than pointing out to the working class the need for solidarity with liberal tendencies in one question or another, or in one task or another, in the struggle against absolutism. We will publicly stigmatize the vile swindles that our government perpetrates even on gentle liberals. Our German comrades also wanted to have a different kind of bourgeoisie. But the party of the German proletariat never laid a hand on the shoulder of the liberals. The Russian proletariat, likewise, has too much of its own work to do. We could, of course, along with Jeremiah Martov, grieve as much as we want over the fact that there are no Jacobis and Lafayettes in our country, but we have more rewarding things to do. The point is that we must not be distracted by a pattern. And as Comrade Lenin quite rightly said, we have no use for slavish, worse, apish, imitation 84 what we do need is an intelligent and critical attitude towards the experience of Western Europe that will enable us to appraise it independently, while always setting our own course according to such reliable criteria as the principles of scientific socialism. History does not repeat itself. The only thing that is repeated is the sequence of the main phases of social development, but they occur each time in a completely new historical context depending on the unique course of the historical development of any given social organism. And if we wish to avoid seeing something that RST occurred as tragedy repeating itself as farce, we must closely study the particular characteristics of our own situation. Establishing the fact that our bourgeoisie is incapable of any resolute initiative in the struggle with absolutism, we must, I repeat, take matters into our own hands. This will be all the easier in view of the fact that our particular circumstances have already given birth to another uniqueness of Russian history that is becoming increasingly evident. The point is that in the struggle for Russia's political emancipation, which, as the Hannibals of liberalism say, 85 is the impending task of our time, the Socialist Party has itself taken the initiative and has from the very beginning been actively supported by the working class. That was the everlasting contribution of Narod Nyavalya. And, in keeping with the manifesto of the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, we can say that, as a socialist movement and tendency, the RSDRP continues the work and the traditions of all previous revolutionary movements in Russia. With the complete conquest of political power as its principal and most immediate goal, social democracy pursues the same objective that was already clearly set out by the glorious curse of Narod Nyavalya. 86. Of course. The Naradovoltsi were merely a small band of heroes from the socialist intelligentsia and the working class. The peasants were indifferent to their struggle. But things have changed since then. Now we have a class that by virtue of its position is the implacable enemy of Russian absolutism, the kind of enemy that cannot be satisfied either by great or not so great reforms. This is the only social class whose minimal political demand is universal suffrage. It will settle for nothing less, and it has no choice but to stand at the head of the movement for emancipation of all the oppressed classes and strata of contemporary Russia. The task is difficult but because of Russia's unique development the proletariat must shoulder it. This does not mean, of course, that it will complete this task on its own. Besides certain strata of the bourgeoisie mentioned previously, there are also other elements in our country that are capable of marching side by side with the working class in its struggle for political emancipation. Even in Russia, the political emancipation of the working class will only be completed with the help of all the various elements of the petty bourgeoisie. These helpers will come from both the urban and the rural petty bourgeoisie, that is, the peasants in the proper sense of the word. We use the expression side by side with the working class, and these words actually summarize the whole difference between the position that Russia NDS itself in on the eve of its bourgeois revolution and that of Germany in the corresponding epoch. There, the communists wanted to march side by side with the bourgeoisie, they assigned it the role of hegemon in the political struggle with the intention of beginning their own struggle and mounting their own opposition after the bourgeoisie's victory. But it turned out that the task was too difficult because the proletariat was unable to adapt to the slow pace of the bourgeoisie and ended up getting ahead of it. In our case, 
the Social Democrats must from the very beginning take upon themselves the struggle against absolutism and leave it to the bourgeoisie either to move along side by side with the working class or else fall behind it. In other words, the principal initiator and the most decisive and energetic der for Russia's political emancipation cannot be anyone else but Russian social democracy, which represents the interests of this class. It must play this role. It is supported not just by the heroism of individual personalities but also by the heroism of the masses, which in historical terms is incomparably more fruitful. It is supported by all the objective conditions of social development. It is supported not just by practice but also by theory, by the most revolutionary theory that the world has ever known because it is the theory of the most revolutionary class that the world has ever known. I have already said that the Narodovoltsi waged their struggle reluctantly. Like all the Narodniks of the 1870s, they were convinced that the task of a social revolutionary party was not political reforms. An echo of this attitude could still be heard in the words of the RST program of the Osvobozdeni Truda group. They considered the underdeveloped condition of the middle class to be one of the most harmful consequences of the backward state of production, and they believed this was the only reason why the socialist intelligentsia would have to take upon itself such an unusual role. 87 Social Democracy has now abandoned this prejudice. Every class struggle is a political struggle. This means that the proletariat cannot help but take on political tasks. And if it does not have its own policy, other parties, bourgeois parties, will inevitably take it in tow. In the West European countries the proletariat often fought absolutism under the banner and the supreme leadership of the bourgeoisie. Hence its intellectual and moral dependence on the leaders of liberalism, its faith in the exceptional holiness of liberal mottos and its conviction of the inviolability of the bourgeois system. In Germany it took all Lassely's energy and eloquence merely to undermine the moral link of the workers with the progressivists. Our society has no such unions on the working class, and there is no need or use for the socialists to create it from scratch. They must show the workers their own, working class banner, give them leaders from their own, working class ranks, Bri why, they must make sure that not bourgeois society, but the workers' secret organizations gain dominating unions over the workers' minds. This will considerably hasten the formation and growth of the Russian Socialist Workers' Party, which will be able to win for itself a place of honor among the other parties after having, in its infancy, promoted the fall of absolutism and the triumph of political freedom. 88. The last 20 years have demonstrated that historical conditions are now much more favorable for the creation of a Russian Socialist Workers' Party to lead the struggle against absolutism. This means it is all the more important for us to get rid of the prejudice to the effect that political freedom, for which Russian Social Democrats are the main doers, will be of banity primarily to the bourgeoisie. 89 This harmful prejudice creates the illusion of common political tasks for the Russian proletariat and the bourgeoisie, which is impossible because the political tasks of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat are not identical. Political freedom, for which social democrats are the main doers, presupposes universal suffrage. Is this something that our liberal bourgeoisie wants? This prejudice is also harmful because it implies a community of interest between economically opposing classes and creates the illusion of all classes marching against the main enemy of the Russian people, the autocracy. In reality, this illusion closes our eyes to the fact that the bourgeoisie might take from the proletariat the fruits of its victory unless we concentrate all of our efforts on preparing the worker masses for the political struggle that they face. That is why we must not be distracted by the struggle against the main enemy of the Russian people, we must not forget that the more prepared the working class is for the struggle against the whole of bourgeois society, the more it will gain from the fall of absolutism. At a time when other oppositional and revolutionary parties are more concerned with overthrowing the autocracy than with anything else, social democracy, representing the interests of the social class that is most opposed to the autocracy, must never forget that the more clearly the working class sees the connection between its economic needs and its political rights, the more pro t it will derive from its political struggle 90 and for this purpose, all that is necessary is that Russian 
Social Democrats thoroughly absorb the principles of modern social democracy and, without restricting themselves to political propaganda, constantly make it known to their listeners that economic emancipation is the great end to which every political movement ought to be subordinate as a means 91 no one among us can say when the revolution will break out. But even in the opinion of Iskra it is not that far off. And we must make every possible effort even in the pre-constitutional period to change the existing relation of Russian social forces to the advantage of the working class, so that in the very opening period of the constitutional life of Russia our working class will be able to come forward as a separate party with the denied social and political program 92 we will achieve this only when social democracy becomes the leading leader of the most advanced class. Only if the proletariat is organized as a menacing revolutionary force before and during the revolution, will it become the backbone of the whole movement for emancipation and the main army to which supplementary detachments sent out by other social classes will be attracted. Sooner or later, the day will come when Russia will see the dawn of political freedom. The more our party works for that great day, the more actively it participates today in every single event, the more closely it links its activity with every aspect of working class life, the more rapidly and successfully will it develop on the day after the revolution, and the less will be the danger that in the arena of political life it will run into some bourgeois party that will rely on it for help and then drag along behind itself a part of the working class. We already see how actively our party is participating in a wide range of current events, and how favorable the conditions are in creating the possibility for it to take the lead in the movement to emancipate all the toiling and oppressed people of Russia. We shall also see now that a third special feature has already made it possible for our party to link all of its activities with every manifestation of the life of the working class, and that this opportunity will be all the greater if it only knows how to make use of it. 93. C. The Third Peculiarity the gigantic growth of the workers' movement within the limits of the autocratic system. We have already mentioned that not a single country in Western Europe, on the eve of its bourgeois revolution, had such a highly developed large-scale industry as Russia 94. This also explains the fact that, even before the bourgeois, discussing the scale and concentration of Russian industry prior to the Bolshevik revolution, at the same time that peasant land cultivation as a whole remained, Right up to the revolution, at the level of the 17th century, Russian industry in its technique and capitalist structure stood at the level of the advanced revolution. The working class developed nowhere else with the same speed. Prior to the revolution in England, the proletariat appeared on the historical scene just as another class that suffered more than the rest, even in the Leveller movement 95 it was completely lost among the petty bourgeoisie and the craftsmen at the time of the glorious revolution. An independent movement of the proletariat only arose where capitalist relations originally formed, that is, in the village, but there it remained an isolated phenomenon. In France, the working class was a more active element, even before the revolution it made its presence felt in a whole series of strikes and rebellions that frequently broke out just before the revolution. Even in the mid-18th century, 1757, the working people produced from their midst an avenger in the person of Damiens, 96 who, to the great horror and indignation of the encyclopedists and philosophers of enlightenment, wanted to remind the beloved father of his people, by stabbing him, of the sufferings and torments of his children. In 1789, the urban workers already played the decisive role in overthrowing the old order. The attempt by Babeuf's 97 followers, in alliance with remnants of the revolutionary democrats, to win a better share of the spoils for the proletariat, ended in failure and served as one of the main factors in the formation of the Bonapartist Empire whose mission was to defend the bourgeois order in general against the proletariat. Germany was better off in this respect as the Communist Manifesto already noted, the revolution is bound to be carried out under more advanced conditions of European civilization and with a much more developed proletariat than that of England in the 17th century, or that of France in the 18th century. 98 But Germany still did not have a workers' movement in the proper sense of the word. Large-scale industry was at a rudimentary stage. Most of the famous rebellions and strikes were the affairs of handicraftsmen. 
It is true that there were others who took part in the revolutionary movement of the 30s and 40s besides members of the intelligentsia, but right up to the formation of the League of Communists most of the workers were artisans. Germany had no organized strike movement before the revolution of 1848. The League of Communists was formed too late to sink deep roots among the workers. It hardly managed even to publish its manifesto before the revolution broke out. We have already seen how, by the time of the revolution, Marx and Engels, as the RST theorists of the proletariat, attributed enormous importance to the economic struggle that had occurred up to 1848. They thought their task was only to be the vanguard of the working class, but to avoid ending up in the tragic position of Blanky 99 and his followers, they had no choice but to serve as the vanguard of democracy. While they were busy with the purely political struggle, allying with the Democrats and devoting all their revolutionary passion to the attempt to win complete political freedom, the working class was busy with strikes, etc., mainly under the leadership of Born. 100 The mistake of Marx and Engels was compounded by the mistakes of Born and his comrades. A revolution requires organization, but once the revolution has begun, the slogan of the revolutionary party is not organization but struggle à outrance. We, unfortunately, have no Marx or Engels among us, but we do nd ourselves in much more favorable historical circumstances. There is no doubting the gigantic growth of the workers' movement even before the bourgeois revolution. It began as early as the 1870s. And along with the growing numbers of revolutionaries from the working class, the strike movement is also expanding irresistibly. 101. Obviously, this presupposed certain material conditions, which, as we have seen, were not present during the corresponding periods in England, Germany, or France. But in addition to these material conditions, the intellectual conditions must also exist. And they do exist in the form of social democrats. A characteristic peculiarity of Russia is the fact that the economic struggle and the trade union movement are developing among the workers in direct proportion to the development of social democratic propaganda. The full force of the idea of the emancipation of the working class was required in order to awaken among the workers a consciousness of their professional interests and thus to create a conscious strike movement. The trade union movement in Russia is a direct offspring of social democracy, and the more effectively social democratic propaganda is waged, the more rapidly and consciously will the economic struggle grow, a struggle that is so beloved but also so badly misunderstood by our economists. Let us consider the most talented among them, the author of The Workers' Cause in Russia. 102 Firmly convinced that the workers must initially appear as a class in economic terms, he regards socialism only as a source of inspiration. Then, when the working class has continuously developed in a free state, through class struggle and participation in state affairs and political life, and senses itself to be strong enough, it will naturally assume the task of changing the very foundations of the system that creates inequality between rich and poor and necessitates the class struggle between them. 103. That social democrats must begin with this task even in the labor movement, that they must take it as their starting point, this is something that our economist from the Iskra group cannot understand for the simple reason that for him socialism has never been anything but the NAL goal. He cannot grasp why it is so important that the economic struggle be led by none other than social democrats, that is, by a party that aims from the outset to change the very foundations of the existing order. Like any typical economist, the author of the workers' cause in Russia lives exclusively in the present. To think that the economic struggle of the proletariat can be used for the revolution causes his esh to creep and puts him in mind of blankeism. He has no wish to impose an inappropriate task on the workers. He is patiently waiting until the working class matures of its own accord. He has only the vaguest idea of the great educational role of social democracy, which leads every manifestation of working class activity and directs it towards a single goal, the development of class consciousness. Even under the autocratic regime, the working class is already waging the economic struggle despite the extremely unfavorable conditions imposed upon it in our country. 
and the duty of social democracy is to rush to its assistance, to whatever extent is possible under the autocratic regime. A political organization of revolutionaries must make possible the new means of struggle that will come with political freedom. But so long as social democracy is social democracy, it must also defend every small need and every small demand of the workers. There are no purely economic demands, even if they only amount to adding a kopeck to a rubble. Every such demand must be linked to general political conditions and used to awaken the political and class consciousness of the working masses. By defending these small needs and being the sole advocate of the working class, an advocate with no interests on the side, social democracy at the same time clearly demonstrates to the workers that even within the limits of the existing political conditions our party alone is the most resolute gear for improvement in the position of the working class 104. Our proletariat has already begun its economic struggle, and the mass workers' movement, in the sense understood by practical people, will grow stronger in Russia the more quickly capitalism develops. We are not the ones who create it or call it forth, but we do have a duty to help it everywhere and in every way we can. It is precisely because we are revolutionary social democrats that we must respond now with economically ETS to every manifestation of the economic struggle 105 The important issue is not whether we put out Li ETS that have a political or an economic character, it is more important, incomparably more important, that those Li ETS be put out by social democrats whose task is to integrate every small fact of the proletariat's life and activities into a single whole. Only social democrats are able to struggle successfully against every distraction that arises from various local, professional, and nationality differences. And since the best means of preventing the emergence and growth of various forms of a purely labor movement is to lead the proletariat's economic struggle, we must never forget the words of the Bourbier Group 106 in its declaration concerning publications. By ignoring the matter of organizing the proletariat, or by leaving it exclusively to economists of one type or another, revolutionary social democracy would also inadvertently help to promote the development of conditions in which the working class might fall under the political unions of non-socialist elements or even elements that are hostile to socialism. Moreover, by helping the working class to clarify and express its immediate demands, through drawing upon its own experience and the history and practice of the West European workers' movement, Revolutionary social democracy must completely integrate immediate demands with the tasks of the movement as a whole, and do everything possible to make the mass workers' movement a social democratic movement. Standing, so to speak, at the cradle of the workers' movement, carefully attending even to its smallest needs, and fearlessly defending its interests, revolutionary social democracy is creating traditions among the working class that will never allow bourgeois democracy however revolutionary it may be, to take the workers' movement in tow. 107. Social democracy must make every effort to ensure that now, before the downfall of the autocracy and on the eve of the revolution, the workers' movement becomes all the more closely aligned with socialism. Only in this way will revolutionary social democracy ensure that at the time of the revolution the working class will use all its energy and all its revolutionary passion to demand complete political freedom, without being distracted from this, the main task, and without expending its resources in economic experiments. We must make every effort to ensure that the working class knows that the highest form of its class struggle is the political struggle, and this will only happen if we revolutionary social democrats lead the economic struggle. Only in these circumstances can we assure ourselves of the most favorable circumstances for our activity on the day after the revolution. By signicantly reducing the risk of a purely labor movement emerging, we also reduce the risk of a split between the social democratic workers' movement and the mass workers' movement 108. D. Conclusions what does the experience of German social democracy teach us? The practical tasks of Russian social democracy are complicated, as we can see, by all the special features of Russia's historical development that we have been discussing. The tasks that even German social democracy could only accomplish incrementally now stand full-blown before Russian social democracy at a time when we do not yet have the corresponding political conditions. But even if there is no single pattern, 
we must still be familiar with the experience of the West European workers' movement. The colossal successes of German social democracy were in large measure due to the fact that they knew how to draw upon the experience of the English and French workers' movements. Coming onto the scene much later, the German workers' movement, as Engels said, grew up on the shoulders of the English and the French movements and made use of their hard-won experience to avoid repeating their mistakes. Our movement appeared even later than the German movement, and for that reason it can and must take advantage of its lessons. That is why knowledge of the history, theory, and practice of German social democracy is so important to us. Unfortunately, the case of Comrade Lenin demonstrates that this knowledge is sadly missing even among our political chiefs. Lenin writes. Let us recall the example of Germany. What was the historic service that Lassalle rendered to the German working class movement? It was that he diverted that movement from the path of progressivist trade unionism and cooperativism, towards which it had been spontaneously moving, with the benign assistance of Schulz de Litzsch and his like. 109. Lassalle diverted the German workers' movement from the path of progressivist trade unionism, just how can you take up your pen to write such nonsense? Poor comrade Lenin. How he struggles against this trade unionism. Marx, Engels, Lassalle, Liebknecht, all of them, of course, did nothing else but GHT against trade unionism. Lassalle's historic service lies in the fact that he laid the foundation for an independent workers' party. Perhaps he would have tried, like those who followed him, to divert the workers' movement from the road of trade unionism, had he not died before the appearance of a German trade union movement. And Liebknecht? Do you know, Comrade Lenin, just what historic service he and his comrades contributed? Of course, they fought against progressivist trade unionism, like you, they made a kind of bugaboo of the word trade unionism. Is that not so? Alas! This too is just a dream. The fact is that Liebknecht and his comrades, far from diverting workers from this path, actually pushed them forward. And how did they do that? They, Liebknecht and the other Eisenachers, decided to take an active part in the movement of craftsmen that began in the latter half of the 1860s. They understood its enormous sine cans for the organization of large masses of workers, and fearing that, left to itself, it would attract the proletariat to the kind of palliative sought in England, they took upon themselves the initiative in this matter and thus established a close bond between socialist propaganda groups and the craftsmen's organization. Thanks to their understanding of the principles and instruments of the workers' movement, the new socialist party succeeded in sinecantly raising the social consciousness and sense of self-worth among the masses of workers, and they saved the all-German union from demoralization. 110. For Liebknecht and Babel, socialism was never merely a NAL goal. The main point of all their activity, and the most urgent task of the present, to which all others were subordinated, was to change the foundations of an order that rests upon class antagonisms. F or them, socialism absorbed the workers' cause. In other words, however important economic and political organization of the proletariat may be in themselves, they must be subordinated to organization in the name of social revolution, that is, to social democratic organization. The immediate interests of the proletariat, whether economic or political, are never self-contained, they are always subordinate to the interests of the future, to the interest of the social revolution, if they are merely immediate and self-contained, they will never reach beyond the limits of bourgeois society. The only class interest of the whole proletariat is the idea of the social revolution. I say again, therefore, that it is only in ding for socialism that we can also GHT properly for the workers' cause. The more resolutely and energetically we work as social democrats, the more resolutely and energetically we will also be struggling for immediate interests and for improving the position of the working class. The only way we can improve its position in capitalist society is by leading it towards the NAL goal of that society, which is socialism. It is precisely because Liebknecht and Babel were social democrats that they fought to shorten the working day, to raise wages, 
and to create conditions that would counteract the physical, mental, and moral degradation of the working class. It is also precisely because Liebknecht and Babel were social democrats that they fought for political freedom and a democratic republic. It is only in conditions of complete political freedom that the class struggle of the proletariat can freely develop, and it is only in a democratic republic that the proletariat can come to power. 111. That is what the experience of German social democracy teaches us, that is what makes its policies the model for social democratic parties in all countries. However, the brilliant successes of German social democracy also had another side. They condemned German liberalism to a miserable life, as Comrade Molotov quite justly ably noted in an article that I strongly recommend to Comrade Lenin. One of the reasons for the powerful development of German social democracy was undoubtedly the fact that the German workers at a comparatively early date organized themselves in an independent political party with a social revolutionary program. Of course, in doing so they simultaneously undermined the sine cans not only of bourgeois liberalism, but also, to an even greater degree, the sine cans of petty bourgeois democracy, and drove both of them to the wall. The result was to unite the mass of workers, to enable them to stand on their own feet, and to awaken them to political life when otherwise they would have remained outside of politics in a state of indifference and apathy. 112. We have already seen that the peculiarities of Russia's historical development have created the most favorable conditions possible for the organization of an independent political party of the working class. It is time for us to forget about keeping a hand on the shoulder of the liberals, it is also time to understand that if historical conditions have condemned our liberals to sterility, then the organization of a social democratic party will diminish their sine cans even further. So stop grieving, comrade Martov, and shake off the miserable state of mind that you are burdened with because of the general lack of people in the liberal camp. Let's just get on with organizing the Social Democratic Party and let it demonstrate that it is the most revolutionary party, and then our future Jacobis will appear only in order immediately to join the ranks of social democracy, just as Johann Jacobi did in 1871 after the heroic act of Liebknecht and Babel. 113 And as for Lafayette's who will shoot people down in Kazan Square, 114 Our liberalism will provide more than enough of them, without your tears comrade Martov, and without your pushing them forward comrade Lenin. Therefore, the tasks of the Russian Social Democratic Party are the following. The organization of an independent political party of the working class with a revolutionary social democratic program for these purposes, social democratic education of the working class by means of exposing the class character of the whole of modern society and the state, development of class consciousness through propaganda and agitation, leadership of both the economic and the political struggle of the proletariat, coordination of its economic struggle against the bourgeoisie, the factory owners, and its political struggle against the government in a social democratic struggle against class society and its class state, subordination of the economic and political organization of the proletariat to its social democratic organization for the sake of the idea of social revolution, as the class interest of the proletariat, which inherently distinguishes it from all the other classes of modern society. And struggle of the social democratic party against capitalism with the goal of diminishing the suffering that inevitably accompanies the expropriation of the toiling masses in such a system. These are the tasks of Russian social democracy that are dictated by the peculiarities of Russia's historical development. They are the tasks that must determine both the organization of the party and also the means it adopts for political struggle. We must never forget that social democracy is the party of a class, not a sect, that it is a party of the masses, not of individuals, and that it aims to make history, not histories. History is made only by the masses. The more substantial any historical act, the greater will be the numbers of the masses involved. 115 And since the masses unite mainly through action and struggle, it follows that the Social Democratic Party faces the question of the form of its organization and the means of its struggle. But in this respect, it must always remember that its entire strength is in the working masses, that it must never isolate itself from the masses, 
that it must continuously expand its ties with them, and that it must adopt only those means that will not impede the development of class consciousness, obscure it, or contradict the practice of mass struggle. 116 We must also never forget that precisely because social democracy wants to make history, it cannot be guided just by the demands of practice. Immediate successes in history do not always lead to NAL success. Rira Bianchi Rira L.E. Dernier 117 And however difficult it may occasionally be to do something, knowing that you are doing nothing, there are a great many activities in which one must forego any hope of immediate success. The cause of social democracy T.S. into this category. In setting out its demands, it must never diminish them to please practical people, for the latter lose sight of the basic condition of revolutionary activity and reduce it to merely a doctrinaire attitude, the work of revolutionaries is to aim as far as possible to the left, to make maximal demands upon reality within the limits of existing conditions, and to leave it to the objective logic of these conditions, which have already been strongly enhanced by revolutionary activity, to determine the compromises that are permissible in view of the existing combination of social-economic relations. To anticipate this calculation, which is produced by reality itself and determined by the resultant of the maximum resistance of the given social-economic formation on the one hand, and the maximum of revolutionary forces that have formed within it, on the other, and to replace extreme demands with the results of a subjective calculation, would, of course, be very practical. However, to say it as gently as possible, it would also demonstrate nothing but the immaturity of revolutionary thought. 118. Part 3, Opportunism Dressed Up as Orthodoxy Let Comrade Lenin speak for himself. For wage workers we demand such reforms as would safeguard them from physical and moral degeneration and raise their ding capacity, for the peasants, however, we seek only such changes as would help to eradicate the remnants of the old serf owning system and facilitate the free development of the class struggle in the countryside 119. For the workers we demand reforms, for the peasants we seek changes. O oh wise Oedipus, solve the riddle. 120 he continues. In the workers section of the party program we have no right to go beyond the bounds of demands for social reform, in the peasants section, however, we must not stop at social revolutionary demands. In other words, in the workers section we are denightly limited by the minimum program, in the peasants section we can and must produce a maximum program. 121. Evidently, the minimum program walks on two legs, one is reformist, the other, revolutionary. In order to leave the reader in no doubt on this account, Comrade Lenin continues. What we set forth in both sections is not our ultimate aim, but our immediate demands. In both sections we therefore remain on the basis of present day, equals bourgeois, society. Therein lies the similarity between the two sections. However, their fundamental difference consists in the fact that the workers section contains demands directed against the bourgeoisie, whereas the peasants section contains demands directed against the serf owning landlords. We cannot present social revolutionary demands among the immediate demands in the workers' section, since the social revolution which overthrows the rule of the bourgeoisie is the proletarian revolution which achieves our NAL goal. In the peasants' section, we present social revolutionary demands as well, since the social revolution which overthrows the rule of the serf-owning landlords is also possible on the basis of the existing order. In the workers' section, we keep to our stand in favor of social reforms, for what we are demanding here is only what the bourgeoisie can concede to us without as yet losing its domination. In the peasants' section, however, we must, unlike the social reformers, also demand what the feudal-minded landlords will not and cannot give us, or the peasants, we must also demand what the revolutionary movement of the peasantry can take only by force. 122 That is why the criterion of direct and immediate feasibility is applicable in general only to the avowedly reformative sections and clauses of our program, and by no means to the program of a revolutionary party in general. In other words, 
this criterion is applicable to our program only by way of exception, and by no means as a general rule. 123. It turns out that to achieve the demands in the agrarian part of the program presupposes revolution, whereas achieving those in the workers' section is possible through reforms. 124. The program's authors are victims of the pattern. In Western Europe the social democratic parties have a NAL goal together with immediate demands that they present to the bourgeois state. But what makes sense in Western Europe is simply nonsense in our country. 125. If even in Western Europe factory laws are frequently nothing but a dead letter, if even there they are observed only when powerful workers' unions insist on the letter of the law, and workers are supported by a powerful social democratic party that knows how to defend the immediate interests of workers, then one would have to be extremely naive to think that in our country, where strikes are illegal, a factory law might provide a legal ground for the workers to present their demands. 126. It is the revisionist tendency in Western Europe that has provided our practitioners with the theory they are looking for. Whereas sober-minded social democrats in the West e.g. Edward Bernstein want to set aside the maximum program and keep only the minimum program, just for the time being, of course, what we are seeing in our own country is a unique attempt to make Western social democracy's minimum program, the overthrow of autocracy, into our maximum program, while simultaneously limiting our own minimum program to political rights for the workers and economic R reforms. All of this amounts to fear of telling the workers the truth, the whole truth, so long as the autocracy exists there is no possibility of any improvement in either the economic or the political position of the working class 127. No. What must be shown is that nothing but paper reforms are possible under the autocracy. Carthaginum delendum esse. 128 The issue is not reform or revolution, nor is it reform and revolution, it is simply revolution. No reform makes any sense whatever. So long as the autocracy exists. Only a vulgar Philistine could talk of improving the conditions of the working class within a system where unparalleled shame and infamy rule. 129. Whereas the program of the Osvobos Dini Truda group differed markedly from social democratic programs in other countries by not including any minimum program. The construction of the new draft resembles foreign programs just like two identical drops of water. Everything Russian in it, everything that suggested we have a way of posing various questions that is different from the way they are posed abroad, all of this has just vanished. Now it turns out that we are nothing special. We have the same kind of minimum program as our West European comrades. And what is a minimum program? It consists of the maximum demands that is, reforms that can be made upon the existing system? But it is more likely the case that even European social democracy will only succeed in achieving its minimum program by way of revolution. That is why Koskai doubts that any reform, such as the eight-hour working day, might be won by the proletariat prior to its seizure of political power. With us, there is no point even in speaking of a minimum program because we have yet to create the constitutional conditions in which such a program might be put forth. The existing society and state, to which the minimum program of West European social democracy is addressed, is with us still I'm Worden. The sole demand that we can make upon our existing regime is begun, and do it quickly. Only when we have achieved this demand will we present a whole series of political and economic demands to the regime that will emerge from the purgatory of revolution, not because they promise any tangible results, but only because their full and complete implementation will allow us to turn to the still more fundamental matter of destroying the foundations of the whole existing social system. When we conjecturally formulate in our program the demands that we will put forth at the time of revolution, we must never forget for a moment that our minimum program has no practical sine cans and refers to no positive tasks. All it must do is answer the question of what we should demand during the revolution, its purpose is to present these demands to the working masses so that they will know, on the day of revolution, whose banner to gather around, 
and so that they will not be deceived by the honest and incorruptible, wise, and educated liberals of Azemsky Sober 130 in that case the program will have enormous educational sine cans. But this program must always remind them that apart from revolution, and until such time as the autocracy is overthrown, there is no hope whatsoever for them of escaping from this hell. 131. The proletariat can never emancipate itself without RST seizing political power. Only the dictatorship of the proletariat will put an end to class antagonisms and eliminate class society. That is why, while waging an uninterrupted struggle against the factory owners, the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, knowing its own class interests, sees political struggle as the highest form of its class struggle. Only through this kind of struggle can it win the political freedom without which it is impossible to defend its immediate economic interests. By virtue of its own class interests, it is the most determined der for democratization of all forms of social and political life. A democratic republic is the form in which the class struggle of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie will freely develop. But it must be such in more than name. It must guarantee to every citizen the right to participate in the political life of the entire country, without excluding any class of the population. We have already said that it is certainly not the working class alone that will overthrow absolutism. A state upheaval can be affected by the aggregate actions of many forces which, though hostile to one another, are nevertheless revolutionary in their attitude to the existing system. 132 And we must never forget that overthrowing the common enemy is merely the RST step, which will immediately be followed by the struggle between forces that are hostile to one another. 133. Is it possible for social democracy to enter into an alliance with bourgeois democracy prior to the fall of the autocracy? Comrade Lenin says yes. But an essential condition for such an alliance must be the full opportunity for the socialists to reveal to the working class that its interests are diametrically opposed to the interests of the bourgeoisie. 134. I believe that such alliances are fraught with danger. Even in countries that enjoy political freedom, such an alliance inevitably results in weakening the social democratic point of view, social democracy becomes an appendage of bourgeois democracy and its extreme left wing. But Comrade Lenin tells us that the political demands of working-class democracy do not differ in principle from those of bourgeois democracy, they differ only in degree 135 again, this is one of those prejudices that are the basis of all the sins of opportunism 136. The fundamental characteristic of democracy is sovereignty 137 of the people, but it is an empty word without the people's complete self-government. The people's sovereignty, i.e., concentration of supreme state power in the hands of a legislative assembly consisting of representatives of the people, 138 as the RST point says in the program of Iskra and Zerya, must therefore be accompanied by the demand for complete self-government in the state, the provinces governi, the cities, and the villages obshchini. Self-government in the state is a necessary condition in order that the people not become a plaything in the hands of the rulers, that is, the bureaucracy. Complete democracy is only possible where the existence of bureaucracy, as an organ independent of the people, is ended. Every citizen in a democratic state, after reaching a certain age and regardless of sex, has the inalienable right to participate in every function of the supreme state power. The necessary guarantee for this is universal, equal, secret, direct, active, and passive suffrage, both in elections to the Legislative Assembly and in every organ of self-government. 139 Since bourgeois society by its very nature cannot guarantee equality in fact, it must at least provide full equality in all questions of rights. Inviolability of the person and the residence, freedom of movement and trade, unrestricted freedom of conscience, speech, the press, and assembly, the complete equality of all citizens regardless of race, religion, or sex, all of these demands are common to both workers and bourgeois democracy. But the latter cannot go so far as complete democratization of all civil and criminal law. Being tied up with the interests of the property owners, it ensures full protection only to those commodity producers who actually produce commodities, 
as distinct from their own human activity, hired workers, who sell their labor power as a commodity, or sell themselves, have completely inadequate protection. 140. Only workers' democracy can guarantee to all citizens a secular school and universal free, obligatory, general and professional education. It alone can make education genuinely universal and provide every participating child with books, clothing, and meals. 141 Only workers' democracy can introduce complete democratization of the entire national economy, only it can completely eliminate all indirect taxes, tariffs and duties, and establish progressive taxation of incomes, inheritances, and see a piddle. But workers' democracy cannot be limited to making these general demands that affect all classes. Representing the class of propertyless workers, who are for this reason compelled to sell their humanity as a commodity, it must ensure for this kind of commodity producer circumstances that do not undermine the very source of his existence, it must oppose the physical, mental, and moral degeneration that threatens the working class when the capitalist's freedom to exploit is not restrained by law. And it can only do this by putting forth the demand for universal labor legislation that would embrace all categories of citizens who live, in one way or another, by selling their labor power, including urban and rural workers as well as every kind of servant. This is a demand on which Russian social democrats will have to focus their main attention in order to ensure that during the revolutionary period it will be full LLED as completely as possible. Under the current political regime, any such reform is pure illusion. A partial improvement in the position of the working class can only be achieved and maintained through revolutionary struggle. The two essential points of such legislation are, RST, the complete and unconditional freedom of unions and strikes. And second, the eight-hour working day for every wage worker without exception. 142. If we once establish clearly the differences of principle between the demands of bourgeois and workers' democracy, then the question of how they relate to each other is easy to settle. In this respect, the experience of Marx and Engels is interesting. Once they recognized their mistake and understood that liberalism had renounced its own historical mission, they expected, again relying on the experience of the English and French revolutions, that the victory of reaction would only be brief and that the revolution would quickly break out again. But since they already believed that no social formation ever disappears until it has developed all its potential, they quite correctly concluded that the task of developing all the good aspects of bourgeois society must be assumed by petty bourgeois democrats. From the very beginning, however, they distrusted them and set out the main principles of tactics for the Workers' Party in the circular of the League of Communists, in March 1850. 143 They had no wish, besides, to become an appendage of bourgeois democracy. They insisted on creation of an independent workers' party, drawn from the workers' circles, in which the position and interests of the proletariat would be discussed independently of any bourgeois unions. The workers had to organize, and their local organizations had to support the closest possible connections with all workers' societies. They now adamantly opposed any attempt to form a broader opposition party that would embrace all democratic elements because this would jeopardize the special interests of the proletariat. They took the view that even in the event of a struggle against a common foe there was no need for any special alliance. In this case, the interests of both parties would coincide, and cooperation would occur on its own when it became necessary. But during the entire period of struggle, and afterwards, the Workers' Party must always put forth its own demands. Marx and Engels were again mistaken. The revolution did not resume, yet Engels was correct when he reissued this circular in 1885 and wrote that one can still learn something from it even today 144 he believed that in the impending revolution the petty bourgeois democrats might take the helm and social democracy would have to adjust its tactics accordingly. Personally, I think Engels overestimated the importance of petty bourgeois democracy. But whatever the case, bourgeois democracy has yet to say its NAL word and may yet be the savior of bourgeois society. Whereas, in the West, bourgeois democracy has been marginalized by social democracy, with us, as a political party, 
it has yet to utter even its RST word. Meanwhile, the elements needed for emergence of such a party do exist. How should we relate to it if it should take shape? We will extend no political credit to such a party even then. Preserving our own clearly distinctive position, social democracy, for its part, will support them if, of course, in addition to universal suffrage, they include in their program the demand for freedom of unions and strikes. Steady support and temporary joint action, where and when the conditions of battle demand it, together with merciless criticism of all the illusions of bourgeois democracy, that is the policy of social democracy in this regard. For its own part, social democracy must strive to retain and continuously fortify its own position as the most decisive and advanced gear in the struggle to emancipate all oppressed classes and the entire exploited masses. This brings us to the question of the peasantry. 145. Comrade Lenin thinks that there is hardly any need to prove at length that an agrarian program is essential to the Russian Social Democratic Party. 146. Yet he still feels somewhat uncomfortable. He is prepared to support the workers directly, without any reservations or conditions, but he is much more cautious in relation to the peasants. In our draft program the inclusion of the peasant demands hinges on two highly circumscribed conditions. We make the legitimacy of peasant demands in a social democratic program dependent, RSTLY, on the condition that they lead to the eradication of remnants of the serf owning system and, secondly, that they facilitate the free development of the class struggle in the countryside 147. The demands that Lenin proposed on behalf of the peasantry were the following, 1. Abolition of land redemption and quit rent payments, as well as of all services now imposed on the peasantry as a taxable social state, 2. Annulment of collective liability and of all laws restricting the peasant in the free disposal of his land, 3. Restitution to the people of all sums taken from them in the form of land redemption and quit rent payments, confiscation for this purpose of monasterial property and of the royal demes NES, and imposition of a special land tax on members of the big landed nobility who received land redemption. The raison d'etre of social democracy is recognition of private property in the means of production as the source of every affection in modern society. If social democracy were to take upon itself the defense and strengthening of one or another form of private property, it would be committing suicide because this would dull the class consciousness of workers and help to preserve the illusions of petty producers. This would undermine all the moral prestige that social democracy enjoys as the most far-sighted and truthful of all the parties. That is why orthodox Marxists unconditionally reject any agrarian program that would have the goal of assisting the peasants as a class of modern society. Loans, the revenue thus obtained to be credited to a special public fund for the cultural and charitable needs of the village communes, for, establishment of peasant committees a, for the restitution to the village communes, by expropriation, or, when the land has changed hands, by redemption, etc., of the land cut off from the peasants when serfdom was abolished and now used by the landlords as a means of keeping the peasants in bondage, b, for the eradication of the remnants of the serf owning system which still exist in the Urals, the Altai, the Western Territory, and other regions of the country, 5 empowerment of courts to reduce exorbitant rents and to declare null and void all contracts entailing bondage. Anticipating revolution rather than reform, Ryazanov replied that social democrats must demand expropriation of all large estates, this is the minimum demand that a revolutionary party can put forth during a revolutionary period. Instead of renting this land from the nobility, the peasants might then rent it from the state, which would promote collective farming by associations of agricultural workers, Ryazanov 1903a, pages 292-3. This was also the view of Marx and Engels in their address of the Central Committee to the Communist League, the workers. Must demand that the Konskat feudal property remain state property and be used for workers' colonies, 
cultivated collectively by the rural proletariat with all the advantages of large-scale farming and where the principle of common property will immediately achieve a sound basis in the midst of the shaky system of bourgeois property relations, Marx and Engels 1850, p. 328. On land currently in the peasants' possession, Riazanov thought the village commune might continue in operation, although individual peasants should have the right to leave. He concluded, it might happen, of course, that the expropriated land will not remain in the hands of the state, that the peasants will simply divide the seized land amongst themselves, or that the state, guided by the idea of a free turnover of the land, will put the land up for sale as at the time of the Great French Revolution, and that we will not be able to prevent this. But this is not so terrible. Even in this worst case, this will be the only way to create a real divide between the past and the future and, with a single revolutionary blow, to abolish all remnants of feudalism. Ryazanov 1903a, p. 293. We Russian Social Democrats says Lenin, with all the satisfaction of a new Columbus, will try to make use of the experience of Europe, and begin to attract the country folk to the socialist working class movement at a much earlier stage and much more zealously than was done by our Western comrades, who after the conquest of political liberty continued for a long time to grope for the road the industrial workers movement, should follow, in this sphere we shall take much that is ready. Made from the Germans, but in the agrarian sphere we may perhaps evolve something new 148. The something new is the discovery that there are two sides to all things in the world 149 whereas in the western agrarian program that proposed to multiply small farming and petty property would violate the principles of social democracy, in the east we have an exceptional case. We support multiplication of small holdings in the interest of eliminating the remnants of serfdom and promoting the free development of class struggle in the countryside, in other words, in the interest of the development of agrarian capitalism. That kind of agrarian program is truly something new. It is clear, says Koskai, that promoting the economic development of agriculture in a capitalist sense cannot be the purpose of a socialist agrarian program. But, when Koskai adds that such an idea never entered anyone's head, he is mistaken, he did not yet know that a new orthodoxy, which has discovered something new concerning agriculture, is coming from the East. He hadn't yet discovered that social democrats have to push capitalism forward or that there are exceptional cases when social democrats must multiply small holdings because this will promote the development of capitalism. Marxism has never assumed the task of promoting the development of class struggle or of introducing it, for this would mean promoting the development of capitalism. Capitalism is developing in the village and in the city, in industry, in the proper sense of the word, and in agriculture. In every case it replaces the struggle between social strata with the struggle between and within classes. In this process the development or introduction of class struggle simply does not involve us as revolutionaries. Our task is to clarify the uniformity of basic tendencies in capitalist evolution, both in the city and in the village, to show that class antagonism becomes increasingly acute, and to expose mercilessly all illusions concerning an identity of interests between the different classes of toilers. We must show that in both the city and the village, regardless of all variations in the form of capitalist evolution, independent producers are condemned to inevitable destruction and the number of proletarians steadily increases. Condemning any attempt to moderate the struggle between classes, both in the countryside and in the city, we must full LL our main positive task, the organization of the proletariat. The idea of introducing the class struggle into the countryside is just as absurd as introducing class struggle into the city. 150. The secret to all the obvious absurdities of Iskra's agrarian program is simply that it is practically oriented upon the period prior to downfall of the autocracy 151. Our agrarian program continues Comrade Lenin is, therefore, calculated in practice mainly for the immediate future, for the period preceding the downfall of the autocracy. A political revolution in Russia will at all events lead inevitably to such fundamental changes in our most backward agrarian system that we shall unfailingly have to revise our agrarian program. 
152. Comrade Lenin assures us that after the autocracy has fallen we will have to take another look. But what shall we do in a revolutionary epoch, at the time when autocracy is being liquidated? This is what is being asked by the social democratic agitators we have sent to the countryside. 153. How do we move ahead? When the authors of the Breslau Agrarian Program defended it by saying that it imparted a proper concreteness to the Erfurt Program, Koskai quite justly ably called this desire to stuff the program with concrete means to take Ramire. When they, like Comrade Lenin, referred to the need to push forward the development of agriculture, Koskai replied that Social democracy has no part of its task to place even the true interests of agriculture, those in harmony with the interests of society as a whole, in the forefront of its efforts, just as it does not perceive its role as expending its energies in advancing the interests of industry and commerce. This is not because it places a low value on these interests, but rather because it is certain that they have ample opportunity to express themselves in the modern state, and that the state will do everything it can to foster them. It must act in positive ways and push things forward only when dealing with the interests of the proletariat. Social democracy, whose duty is to be active and positive in the interests of the proletariat, should adopt a basically negative, defensive, posture when it comes to protecting the interests of society at large under present-day circumstances. The positive elements must take a back seat as long as it lacks a real determining unions on political life. 154. This refers to the Social Democratic Party at a time when it already enjoys political freedom and has numerous representatives in parliament and in municipal and rural councils. And what can we say of Russian social democracy? What can it accomplish in the way of something positive? What concrete means can it devise without incurring the risk of playing into the hands of all the knights of primitive accumulation, without obscuring the class consciousness of the workers? without creating illusions concerning the possibility of partial improvements in the condition of the toiling masses even within the limits of the autocratic system? The answer is, exactly nothing, nothing on behalf of the peasants, and nothing on behalf of the workers. That is why it is equally senseless to adopt any minimum program that is oriented upon practical tasks in the period preceding the fall of autocracy, whether we have in mind helping the workers or the peasants. In this sense, there is no difference in principle between the demands we make on behalf of the workers or the peasants. Every attempt to conceive such a difference in principle between the demands made on behalf of one or the other will lead, and can only lead, as we have seen in the agrarian program of Iskra, to abandonment of every principle of international social democracy. 155. Let us assume that the revolution has already broken out. A constituent assembly is summoned, in which the wise and educated, honest and incorruptible liberals will probably be the majority. Social Democrats must know in advance that the arena of their practical activity will not be parliament but the street, that even within parliament their only role will be as condits for the pressure being put on parliament by their comrades and the workers they have unionsed. Their main task will be to prevent the revolutionary tempest from cooling, to drive the revolution forward, and to lead it to its NAL consequences. The slogan for social democratic activity is revolution in permanentia, not order in place of revolution, but revolution in place of order. The stronger the revolution is in the countryside, and the more the party of order is compelled to dissipate its forces in search of countless enemies, the more successfully will social democracy complete its revolutionary work in the cities. This means that the more revolutionary are the demands made by social democracy, the more forcefully it intrudes in fact upon all the sacred and inviolable rights, the more the people in fact seize all their rights and freedoms, and the more numerous the circle of people who have an interest in preserving the revolution's accomplishments, the deeper will be the divide between past and future, and the more favorable will conditions be for the further development of social democracy. The outcome of the revolution itself will to a great extent depend upon the attitude of the peasantry. If we are concerned for the revolution's success, if we hope to secure a social-political victory for the revolutionary party, then we must put forth a whole series of measures in the interests of the peasantry. 
who have been unfairly treated by the entire existing regime. This does not mean that we will promise them blessings that we ourselves don't believe can be realized. In the words of the program of the Osvobostany Trita group, we can say that the triumph of the Russian revolutionary movement will be of primary vanity to the peasantry. And, if we are speaking of material vanities to come from the revolution, there is no doubt that in this respect the peasantry will gain more than the working class. But, even during the revolution, when we are making maximum revolutionary demands on behalf of the peasantry, we must still tell them that if private property in all the means of production continues, along with commodity production, then their eventual entry into the ranks of the proletariat will be just as inevitable as it was before, albeit with less torment. Not wishing to encourage any illusions with respect to their position, we must also avoid deceiving ourselves by overestimating the possible political role of the peasantry. The very conditions of their existence mean that they are an element that is generally incapable of joint political activity. So-called peasant wars have become an important political factor only where the peasant movement has temporarily merged with an urban movement. The peasants are an element of the population in which there is an identity, but by no means a community, of interest. They rise up like one man only when, throughout the entire country, they are struck by a series of spontaneous calamities that result from the existing social system and represent the NAL drop in their cup of misfortune. Local interests continue to prevail, so that whatever their capacity to resist at a particular moment, the peasantry is easily caught with petty bait. The initial outburst soon evaporates, and one village after another abandons the common cause to settle for minor concessions. 156. To this point I have been assuming that the Russian Revolution will remain an isolated event that will not extend beyond the limits of the Russian Empire. Personally, I consider this most unlikely. In my opinion, it is much more probable that a revolution in Russia would serve as the signal for the West European Revolution. The fate of Russia is today so tied up with the fate of Western Europe that such a fundamental upheaval cannot help but serve as a powerful impetus to the revolutionary movement of the European proletariat. The position of the latter is today unique. Reaction, supported by the entire bourgeoisie, has prevailed for many years and compelled the proletariat to be extremely cautious. The issue is not so much one of winning new freedoms as of preserving old ones that the bourgeoisie is prepared to give up. German social democracy, for example, despite extremely favorable circumstances, is taking no decisive step out of fear that everything won with such hard work will be lost through an ill-conceived outburst. The conditions of the Russian proletariat are different. It has literally nothing to lose and everything to gain. Because of its circumstances, it is also the most revolutionary force in the ranks of the European proletariat. For this reason, we agree completely with Koskai when he says. Having absorbed so much revolutionary initiative from the West, Russia itself may now be ready to serve the West as a source of revolutionary energy. The revolutionary movement that is airing up in Russia may become the most powerful means for overcoming the spirit of Abbey Philistinism and sober-minded politicking that is beginning to spread through our ranks, it may reignite the aim of commitment to struggle and passionate devotion to our great ideals. In 1848 the Slavs were the hard frost that killed the blossoms of the spring of peoples. Now, perhaps, they are destined to be the tempest that will break the ice of reaction and irresistibly bring a new, blessed springtime for the peoples. 157. This outcome will be all the more likely, the more aiming becomes the spirit of revolutionary protest that has made the proletariat the most revolutionary class of P. Resent de R. Usha. And if the revolution of the Russian proletariat becomes the signal for the European proletariat, if the Russian revolution merges with the West European revolution, if it genuinely breaks the ice of reaction that has frozen the revolutionary energy of the European proletariat, then our revolution will be the immediate prologue of the social revolution. Whatever happens, if we wish to give faithful voice to the most revolutionary class of present-day society, we Russian social democrats must work in such a way that the impending revolution, which will unquestionably occur on the basis of bourgeois relations of production and in that sense will certainly be bourgeois will also, from beginning to end, 
be proletarian in the sense that the proletariat will be its leading element and will make its class imprint on the entire movement. We must avoid diminishing the scope of our own revolutionary work in advance by persuading ourselves that our victory will t mainly the bourgeoisie. Instead, we must continuously broaden and deepen our efforts to create even now the conditions that will shorten the period of transition from the coming political revolution to the ensuing social revolution. We must work to convert the political into the direct prologue of the social revolution. For this purpose, we must repudiate revisionism in all its forms. In all our activity, we must place the question of revolution on the order of the day. We must prepare, and prepare ourselves, for the revolution. Regardless of what various Philistines may say, and no matter how hard various critics try to argue on behalf of peaceful progress, the words of Marx are every bit as true today as they were ftyve years ago. It is only in an order of things in which there are no more classes and class antagonisms that social evolutions will cease to be political revolutions. Till then, on the eve of every general reshoving of society, the last word of social science will always be le combat ou la mort, la lutte sanguinaire ou le neant. Say in zk la question est invinciblement posi. 158. Chapter 3 Orthodox Pedantry, 1903. G.V. Plekhanov. The fundamental theme of Plekhanov's reply to Ryazanov is stated near the end of this essay, one the real question is how to achieve the triumph of a democratic republic. Whereas Ryazanov anticipated movement beyond a bourgeois revolution, Plekhanov believed Russia was about to win a constitutional order that would nally eliminate remnants of serfdom and establish a law-governed regime of private property and civil liberties. In Plekhanov, the father of Russian Marxism, Samuel H. Barron summarized Plekhanov's thinking this way. In keeping with his long-held strategy, Plekhanov was most preoccupied during the revolutionary crisis of 1904-6 with the question of the relations between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. In his estimation, the developing upheaval could only be a bourgeois revolution, and, inevitably, the bourgeoisie would have a prominent part in it, but the proletariat was destined to strike the decisive blows. Provided each played its prescribed role, absolutism would be overthrown, the bourgeoisie would become the governing power in a democratic regime, and the proletariat would be in possession of the rights which would enable it to prepare for its economic emancipation later on. 2. Plekhanov's position, adds Baron, was a logical consequence of an unshakable attachment to Marx's theory of an economically determined sequence of historical stages. In that context, Russia's upheaval could be only a bourgeois revolution 3, with, of course, all the reservations already pointed out in our introduction to Ryazanov's criticism of the Iskra program. The background to Plekhanov's expectations can be traced through his successive drafts of a social democratic program for Russia. Although he believed the Russian Empire was subject to general laws of history, in the program of the Social Democratic Emancipation of Labor Group 4, 1883, Plekhanov had written that all socialist parties must take into account the species circumstances of their respective countries. In Russia, where rising capitalism coexisted with obsolescent patriarchal economy, this meant socialists must simultaneously organize the workers for the struggle against the bourgeoisie and wage war against the survivals of old pre-bourgeois social relationships, which are harmful both to the development of the working class and to the welfare of the whole people. 5. With a proper constitutional order, all the bourgeois freedoms would be established, including democratic elections and freedom of conscience, speech, the press, assembly, and association. At the same time, Plekhanov wrote, a radical revision of our agrarian relations would put an end to the peasants' redemption payments for land acquired in 1861, thereby facilitating the extension of private agricultural property in place of traditional communal organization. Just four years later, in the second draft program of the Russian Social Democrats, 1887, Plekhanov used similar language but elaborated his comments on agriculture. Capitalism was still striving to become dominant in the country as a whole, 
but the village commune remained a means of enslaving the peasant population to the state and hindering their intellectual and political development. Victory of the revolutionary movement would be RST and foremost pro-table to the peasants, and genuine emancipation of the peasants would accelerate class struggle, the disintegration of the village commune is creating a new class of the industrial proletariat. T. His class responds to the call of the revolutionaries more easily than the backward rural population. The proletarian ejected from the commune would return there as a social democratic agitator. 6. Although Plekhanov and Lenin had numerous differences over details while drafting the new Iskra program in 1902 3, for the moment the two men were in fundamental agreement. All the themes embraced by Lenin in the agrarian program of Russian Social Democracy 7 were easily reconciled with Plekhanov's statements. Both men agreed that capitalism had nally become the dominant mode of production, both stressed the urgency of eliminating remnants of serfdom, and both anticipated that the revolution would bring new juridical institutions compatible with political liberty. 8. Plekhanov's proposals for the Iskra program laid particular emphasis upon the need for coherence between the capitalist mode of production and its legal institutions. As the most outstanding of all survivals of our serf owning system and the most formidable bulwark of all this barbarism, the Tsarist autocracy is wholly incompatible with political and civil liberties which have long been in existence in the advanced countries of capitalist production, as the natural legal complement to that production. By its very nature it must crush every social movement and is bound to be the bitterest enemy of all the proletariat's emancipatory aspirations. For these reasons, Russian social democracy advocates as its immediate political task the overthrow of the Tsarist autocracy and its replacement by a republic based on a democratic constitution. Nine. In the NAL version of the Iskra program, adopted at the party's Second Congress in 1903, Plekhanov's reference to political and civil liberties as the natural legal complement of capitalist production was excised, after Lenin complained that the word natural smacks, reeks, of a sort of liberalism, but the fact remained that, for Plekhanov, the appropriate response to Russia's peculiar development was to make it conform with the West European pattern as expeditiously as possible. The job of the proletariat in the bourgeois revolution was to ensure the NAL triumph of a democratic republic and only thereafter to begin the struggle for socialism as the NAL goal. Plekhanov saw in Ryazanov's critique of the Iskra program an echo of Narodnik utopianism. Ryazanov expressed a clear respect for the Narodnik revolutionaries, notwithstanding their populist limitations, that contradicted the new view that the Social Democratic Party should be promoting the advance of rural capitalism. Whereas Plekhanov and Lenin attributed peasant distress to remnants of serfdom, Ryazanov answered that the real problem lay in the rudiments of capitalism. If remnants of serfdom were the issue, Plekhanov and Lenin thought the task of Social Democrats was to promote a consistently capitalist form of agriculture, which, in turn, would accelerate class struggle in the countryside. But if the peasants' affections were attributable to rudiments of capitalism, then Ryazanov insisted that the task of social democrats was RST and foremost to forestall further capitalist development by way of permanent revolution. This was one major source of disagreement. The other was closely related and concerned the role of liberals in the impending revolution. In the original program of Osvobostany Truda, Written in 1883, Plekhanov had denied any sine cant role to liberals saying they were incapable of taking the initiative in the struggle against absolutism. 10. The 1887 draft still spoke of the powerlessness and timidity of educated sections of the higher classes 11 but the Iskra program of 1903 declared that in pursuit of its immediate goals the party would support any opposition or revolutionary movement directed against the existing social and political order in Russia. 12. Plekhanov's response to Russian exceptionalism was to make Russia less exceptional. Ryazanov, on the contrary, thought an exceptional past pointed to an exceptional revolution, a permanent revolution, in which an entirely new socialist pattern would be established both for Russia and for Europe. While Plekhanov looked for allies among the upper classes of Russia, Ryazanov said. It is much more probable that a revolution in Russia would serve as the signal for the West European revolution. 
The fate of Russia is today so tied up with the fate of Western Europe that such a fundamental upheaval cannot help but serve as a powerful impetus to the revolutionary movement of the European proletariat. In terms of the role of liberals, Ryazanov was quite correct in saying that in 1902-3 Plekhanov had abandoned his own program of 20 years earlier. At the same time, however, Plekhanov could point to equally clear elements of continuity, particularly on agrarian issues. In his reply to Ryazanov, which we have translated here, Plekhanov denied any change of his own views and, by implication, any possibility that Lenin had played the role of serpent tempter in manipulating his thinking. As the father of Russian Marxism, Plekhanov was outraged by Ryazanov's critique and interpreted it as a personal insult. Giving the title Orthodox Pedantry to his response, Plekhanov contemptuously dismissed Ryazanov in an essay that was as condescending as Ryazanov's was insightful. While it provided little insight of its own, Plekhanov's response strikingly clarify at the differences between these two opposing appraisals of the peculiarities of Russian history and the impending consequences. 13. N. Ryazanov has devoted all of 302 pages to criticizing our draft program of the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party. 14. This is very any, of course, and I would be the RST to commend him for his diligence and thank him for paying us so much attention if only his critique shed just a little new light on questions concerning our program. Unfortunately, this is exactly what it does not do. Ryazanov clary es nothing and confuses a great deal. His critique is about as pointless as a virgin dedicating herself to God. Moreover, it is insufferably petty and pretentious. It cannot help but bring to mind Moliere's Precious's Ridicules 15 the reader can imagine, therefore, just how delightful. Thought, Plekhanov 1926, was much more nuanced so that Trotsky thought it provided a suitable background for his own analysis. This is what Trotsky wrote in 1922, it is perfectly true that a few years later, in 1914, Plekhanov formulated a view of the peculiar features of Russia's historical development which was very close to the one put forward in my book. Our Revolution Plekhanov quite rightly dismisses the schematic theories of both the doctrinaire Westerners and the Slavophile Narodniks on this subject, and, instead, reduces Russia's special nature to the concrete, materially determined peculiarities of her historical development. It is radically false to claim that Plekhanov drew any compromising conclusions from this, in the sense of forming a block with the cadets, etc., or that he could have done so with any semblance of logic. The weakness of the Russian bourgeoisie and the illusory nature of Russia's bourgeois democracy undoubtedly represent very important features of Russia's historical development. But it is precisely from this, given all other existing conditions, that the possibility and the historical necessity of the proletariat seizure of power arises. True, Plekhanov never arrived at this conclusion. But then neither did he draw any conclusion from another of his unquestionably correct propositions, namely, the Russian revolutionary movement will triumph as a working class movement or it will not triumph at all. If we mix up everything Plekhanov said against the Narodniks and the vulgar Marxists with his kidatophilia and his patriotism, there will be nothing left of Plekhanov. Yet in reality a good deal is left of Plekhanov, and it does no harm to learn from him now and again. C. L. Trotsky 1971a, ch. 27, on the special features of Russia's historical development, a reply to M. N. Pokrovsky. It is to read this new work from Ryazanov and what pleasure comes from exploring it. It is pure torment and about as bothersome as a toothache. But please do not think, dear reader, that I am speaking ill of Ryazanov's book just to take revenge because he criticized me, there now, you criticize us, and we laugh at you. No, not at all. Even if we were vindictive and able to take revenge on a party comrade because of his criticism, the essay by Ryazanov would still not lead us to think in such terms, the kind of criticism that he makes is no threat to us because every reader with the least sense will probably see at once that it makes absolutely no serious or thoughtful contribution to the subject matter. Moreover, speaking for myself, even if I were biased in my literary reviews, 
I would be more inclined to praise Ryazanov's book than to censure it. He frequently refers to my writing most approvingly, and in one place he even ranks me among the most accomplished theoreticians of modern socialism. This is obviously a very great compliment, so great, indeed, that I hesitate and fear to ask myself whether I am so deserving. After all, have I never written anything pedantic? Do I not myself remind people of Moliere's precious as ridicules? Nevertheless, I take some consolation from the thought that Riazanov by no means approves of me completely. To be precise, he praises only my older works, whereas the things that I have written in Zuryat and Iskra do not warrant his approval. Speaking honestly, I must say that I am not indifferent to my own past work, and I would be very upset to think that my book Our Differences, for example, or my articles in Social Democrat, suffered from the same kind of ridiculous literary pedantry that blossoms so luxuriously on the pages of Riazanov's book. But eventually I consoled myself with at least one thought, I told myself that if Riazanov felt obliged to praise my older work but could only shrug his shoulders in bewilderment at the most recent things I have done, the truth of the matter is that his view had nothing to do with the content or the merit of either. Riazanov approves of my past works not because he thinks they are good, but only because he must do so for certain reasons that are completely extraneous. In character. There is no reason, therefore, for me to be distressed by his praise. 16. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. What he wants to show, you see, is that the precursor of Russian social democracy, the Osvobozdany Truda group, 17, had the correct point of view until Lenin, the serpent, led it into temptation. He laments the fall into sin, but at the same time he understands that there were mitigating circumstances and, as if to shake free of the serpent's coils, he is even prepared to wipe things clean. He proposes that our party reject the draft program worked out by the editors of Zerya and Iskra and adopt instead the older draft of the Osvobostani Truda group with some Modi Katayans. He obviously considers his suggestion to be extremely attuning to the members of that group and hopes they will support it. That kind of music would be very pleasing to Riazanov, but we do not have the slightest intention of accommodating him. In the RST place, Riazanov is terribly mistaken in thinking that the current draft program, of which he is so critical, was imposed upon us, the former members of Osvobostani Truda, by the Serpent Tempter. The Serpent Tempter never imposed anything but always acted in complete ideological agreement with us 18 as a like-minded comrade who understood just as well as we did the enormous importance for our work of a correct theory, and who had no intention whatever of Sakri Singh theory to practice. 19 And if the draft program that we are now proposing to Russian social democracy is odd in some way, then the AWS are just as much our responsibility, mine, P. Axelrod's and Vizay Sulich's, as they are the responsibility of Lenin or any other member of our editorial collective. 20 It is high time for Ryazanov and other penetrating readers, who so love to gossip about Iskra and Zerya, to memorize my categorical statement on this matter once and for all. The legend of the serpent tempter, which is being so zealously cultivated nowadays by certain lovers of poetiction, must be disposed of for good. In the second place, our present draft program is, in fact, simply the old draft of the Osvobostani Truda group reissued with the appropriate changes. Riazanov does not accept the changes, but we are convinced that they are necessary. Indeed, if our party assigned us to write up a new program, taking the older draft of our group as the starting point, we would not hesitate in the least to put forth, paragraph by paragraph, exactly the draft that is now associated with the editors of Iskra and Zerya. We could not possibly write up any other draft, and the reason is simply that no other draft could possibly represent our views more accurately. 21. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Let us consider the practical tasks of our party. 22. According to Riazanov, Iskra resolves these tasks wretchedly, here the opportunism of our editorial board reaches a climax, here the pliability of the former Osvobostani Truda group is such that the old revolutionary program of Russian social democracy has been relegated completely to the archive. 
This is truly horrible. And if this horror is not just something thought up by our merciless critic, then one must acknowledge that the former Osvobas Dini Truda group, which produced the old revolutionary program of Russian social democracy and then relegated it to the archive at the insistence of the serpent tempter, is directly guilty of betrayal. But why does the prosecutor not frighten us? Let us look at the grounds for the accusation. Ryazanov is most distressed, for example, by that part of our draft program that says capitalism in Russia, while it has already become the prevailing mode of production, still encounters at every step remnants of the old pre-capitalist social order, which are hindering economic progress and preventing a comprehensive development of the proletariat's class struggle. As is customary for him, at this point Ryazanov resorts to irony. What's Hecuba to him? 23, he exclaims. How does economic progress find its way into a social democratic program? And can it really be the case that we must promote economic progress in order to facilitate the comprehensive development of proletarian class struggle? 24. It seems to Ryazanov that the word progress is not merely excessive but even completely impermissible in a social democratic program. He reminds us that Marx never spoke of economic progress, only of economic development 25 in our eyes, of course, the example provided by the author of Capital will always be very instructive, however, without dwelling on words, and preferring instead to detect their hidden meanings, we invite Ryazanov to recall the preface to the RST edition of Volume I of Capital where it is said, among other things, that Germany, along with all the rest of continental Europe, suffers not only from the development of capitalist production but also from the inadequacy of its development. Alongside of modern evils, a whole series of inherited evils oppress us, arising from the passive survival of antiquated modes of production, with their inevitable train of social and political anachronisms. We suffer not only from the living, but from the dead. 26. Is it true, as Ryazanov supposes, that Marx saw no need to help in overcoming these relics of the past? And if Marx did see such a need, then how does it happen that we are guilty of betraying Marxism when we aim to abolish the countless fragments of the pre-capitalist order that still survive in Russia? How can it be that a task regarded as necessary and inevitable in the program of Marx and his West European comrades has become inappropriate and even a matter that compromises us when it appears in the program of Russian Social Democrats? But why must you speak of economic progress? exclaims an agitated Ryazanov, why not speak simply of development? We reply, calm down your honor. Remember that we take a dialectical point of view, and from this point of view the process of development has two sides, emergence and destruction, in other words, progress and regression. Not being reactionaries, we necessarily side with progress and consider ourselves obliged to struggle against every phenomenon and every institution that delays the progressive movement of social relations. If we thought otherwise, then we would resemble those true German socialists of the 40s, who were so sarcastically mocked by the manifesto of the Communist Party and with whom you have so much in common. Like them, you have a pedantic love for clever expressions but are completely incapable of dialectical thought, without which it is impossible either to resolve or even to formulate properly the revolutionary tasks of our time. The real extent of Ryazanov's inability to abandon the point of view of metaphysics, which reasons according to the formula yeah is yeah, nay is nay, whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil, is obvious in the following example. In a review that I wrote and that was published in Zurya concerning Russia on the eve of the 20th century, a book by an anonymous author, I characterized a certain type of Russian liberals by using the words wise and educated, honest and incorruptible. Ryazanov apparently NDS this description extremely amusing. He continually returns to it and each time, so to speak, rolls about in laughter. What seems especially comical to him is the fact that I also included among this kind of liberals the unknown author of the work I was reviewing, who referred quite negatively to Chernyshevsky 27 and his co-thinkers. Obviously, Ryazanov is RMLY convinced that such an attitude towards our great enlighteners could only be adopted by people who are stupid, 
uneducated, disannuable and corrupt. That kind of conviction on his part shows what great respect he has for people who genuinely deserve such respect. But it also demonstrates his truly childish naivete and his complete inability to understand the dialectic of feelings and attitudes that emerges from social struggle. Chernyshevsky himself understood this dialectic very well, and that is why he would regard his infantile and naive defender with real pity. Ryazanov is very disapproving of our general attitude towards liberals, in which he sees one of the clearest proofs of our opportunism. He eagerly emphasizes this presumed evidence, knowing that this aspect of our tactical views is not yet fully understood by those Russian social democrats who have yet to overcome fully the prejudices of economism 28 here, as elsewhere, Ryazanov does not explain the question but merely confuses it. For that reason, I think it will be of some interest to pause and deal with it. Our relation to the different political parties that exist in Russia today can be denied by the words of the Manifesto of the Communist Party, which says, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things 29 It is obvious that the more profound and serious its revolutionary sine cans, the more we sympathize with any particular social movement. But it is only the party of the proletariat, only social democracy, that is revolutionary in the most complete and most profound sense of the word. By comparison, all other parties can be recognized as revolutionary only to a degree, only within certain limits that are sometimes very restrictive. Unable to take the proletarian point of view, the revolutionaries of other parties cannot help but include in their social-political propaganda and agitation an element of narrowness and narrow-mindedness. Insofar as this element contradicts our own propaganda and agitation, confuses the minds of workers, or is conservative or even reactionary, we consider ourselves compelled to enter a life-or-death struggle against it, allowing no confusion to result from reproaches leveled against us in this regard by certain naive readers or listeners. This is the reason for our passion for polemics, which everyone is aware of and which causes such indignation. But precisely because this passion is conditioned by our extreme revolutionary point of view and by that alone, we give their due even to our most stubborn and committed political opponents whenever they take any resolute steps in the struggle against the existing order, provided they do not attempt to obscure the class consciousness of workers, and we do so without being confused by any dogmas or schemes. And this is why we appear to be opportunists to certain irrationally zealous defenders of orthodoxy. That, in general terms, is our relation to other parties. And as for liberals in particular, we regard them as representatives of the bourgeoisie and relate to them in exactly the same way as Marx and Engels related to the German liberal bourgeoisie in the late 40s of the last century. The Communist Manifesto says. In Germany the Communists GHT with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way against absolute monarchy, the feudal squire Archie and the petty bourgeoisie. But they never cease, for a single instant, to instill into the working class the clearest possible recognition of the hostile antagonism between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. 30. Ryazanov himself knows very well that in this respect we are faithfully following the example of Marx and Engels, and that is why he declares that Marx and Engels were mistaken in their understanding of the prospective political role of the German bourgeoisie at that time. Without getting involved in an examination of this historical issue, I will limit myself to three brief observations. In the RST place, if our relation to the liberal bourgeoisie is mistaken, then it turns out that we are in pretty good company, namely, with the authors of the Communist Manifesto. Secondly, it is worth noting that in order to prove our deviation from orthodoxy, Ryazanov had to accuse Marx and Engels themselves of being in error. In the third place, the error that our critic attributes to us could not possibly be of any practical sine cans even if it were a fact. To use Ryazanov's words, this error consists of overestimating the progressive role of our bourgeoisie. Suppose we really are overestimating them. What are the practical consequences of such overestimation? Do we cease, as a result, to develop in the minds of workers a consciousness of the opposition between their interests? And those of the bourgeoisie? 
do we strive even in the least to curtail the class struggle that is occurring in our country? Anyone who is familiar with our publications and wants to keep a clear conscience will say that nothing of the sort has ever occurred and that we always clearly and resolutely defend the proletariat's class point of view. Our supposedly exaggerated expectations of the bourgeoisie do not cause us to diverge even by a hair's breadth from the line that we would follow if we had no such expectations at all. It follows that to reproach us for them merely means to encourage a completely futile argument over a question of expectations, for which there is no possibility of ending any exact way of coming to a conclusion. I am aware that it is precisely these expectations that explain our supposed heresy of wanting, as Comrade Lenin put it, to go out among all classes of society 31 it is precisely this wish that suggests to certain of our critics a betrayal of the proletariat. But here again we see that people are dealing with words without clarifying for themselves what their meanings are. When the ideologists of the French bourgeoisie in the 18th century went among the aristocracy, recruiting peers for a new social order, did they betray the point of view of their own class? Not at all. No such betrayal occurred, only a perfectly correct political calculation, or, if you will, instinct, which led to an even more consistent affirmation of exactly the same point of view. And will there be any betrayal if ideologists of the proletariat go among the upper classes with the goal of ending means and resources that might serve the interests of social democracy? It would appear that in this case, too, there will no betrayal, here again, the reaching out will be a matter of political calculation. There is, therefore, nothing here to debate from the standpoint of principle. All that remains is a question of practical opportunities. Do there exist among Russia's upper classes such means and resources as might render some service to our movement? Yes, they still do exist to a considerable degree, and it would be a very, very great pity for us not to make use of them. Furthermore, do there exist within our own midst such people, and even whole groups of people, who are not able to work among the proletariat but who could establish lasting and bany chale relations for us with so-called society? There is no doubt that such people do exist, so that this part of the question can be solved quite simply, a reaching out to all classes of society, within the limits we have noted, is both possible and necessary. Let there be no confusion among us regarding any betrayal of our principles in this matter. A betrayal can happen for completely different reasons. It is possible to betray the proletariat without departing even for an instant from its midst. All that is needed is to lose clear sight of the dividing line that separates its interests from the interests of other classes. But as far as this kind of loss is concerned, it cannot be encouraged by the propaganda either of Iskrat or of Zerya. The fact is that we are famous for our passion for polemics precisely because we have always, everywhere, decisively and ruthlessly defended the proletariat's class point of view. From all of this, the reader can see just how far Iskra and Zaryat are from any intention of consigning to the archive the old revolutionary program of Russian social democracy. If such a program ever existed, and it certainly did exist, then Iskra and Zarya must have been its best and most reliable defenders. They fearlessly defended it during the dismal period when real opportunists from all sides raised an outcry against it, and they are doing so now when thanks to these same organs the efforts of these opportunists have completely failed. To accuse them today of betraying orthodoxy at a time when, thanks again to Iskra and Zerya, a revolutionary direction has nally triumphed in our social democracy, can only be an act of displaying one's own mental poverty or of speculating on the mental poverty of other readers for some sort of reasons that are purely personal. Nothing further needs to be said on this matter. After lecturing us on the theme that there is no place in a social democratic program for struggle against the remnants of pre-capitalist social relations, Ryazanov then undertakes to demonstrate for us that the institutions, he speaks of phenomena, that we take to be remnants of the old social order, must in fact be regarded as rudiments of a new order, of capitalism to be precise 32 the proofs that he adduces in this case are so typical of this would-be critic that I cannot resist the temptation to reproduce at least a few of the more remarkable ones. He says. Meanwhile, 
there is an even greater question as to whether all those phenomena that are cited in the Iskra program as being due to remnants should really be attributed to remnants rather than to the rudiments of capitalism. Would there be any need for us to be concerned with the radical review of the conditions of the peasants' emancipation if this emancipation was prepared not by popular production 33 but instead by capitalism based upon core v labor, that is, by landlords who were already tempted by the practice of squeezing out surplus value together with the state, which was just as interested as they were in the development of capitalism. 34. These lines were written, as the reader will see, in an extremely awkward manner, and for that reason it is no easy matter to understand just what they mean. But to the extent that any understanding is possible, they have to be interpreted to mean that if the abolition of serfdom had been prepared by so-called popular production, as they say in the Narodnik literature, and not by capitalism on the basis of core v labor, then there would be no need for us now to be demanding a radical review of the conditions of the peasants' emancipation. But we have to ask ourselves whether popular production really could create conditions in which the abolition of serfdom would become a real economic necessity. Not a single reader with a head on his shoulders will hesitate to answer, no, over the course of time this production itself came to be the most solid basis for our serfdom in all its forms and variations 35 on this matter, there is no room for any doubt whatever. And once we are convinced of that fact, then we face a new question, just why did Ryazanov need his ridiculous hypothesis concerning the preparation of the peasant reform of 1861 by popular production? Apparently, he needed it only to give greater emphasis to the idea that if the peasants were emancipated in conditions extremely unfavorable to them, then this was due to none other than the development of capitalism itself even if it continued to be based on core v labor. And this idea, apparently, must lead us to the inevitable conclusion that the position in which the Russian peasant was placed by Legislative Act of 1861 was itself prepared by the development of capitalism. The only correct part of this conclusion is the fact that economic development, moving in the direction of capitalism, did make it imperative for the landowners to have such conditions of emancipation as would convert the peasant into a semi-proletarian who would be forced to sell his labor power. To the extent that the peasant became a seller of labor power, he fell into the same position that capitalist society requires for the working class as a whole, and that position will only be abolished by the socialist revolution. 36 Naturally, that position is neither a remnant of antiquity nor is it the focus of those paragraphs in our program that deal with struggling against vestiges from the old pre-capitalist order. The real point is that the common position of both the small holding peasant and the proletarian is complicated by the existence of a whole number of such institutions, thanks to which our seller of labor power is bound hand and foot and compelled to sell his only commodity in circumstances even worse than he would face in the legal position of a proletarian in modern bourgeois society. These kinds of institutions are survivals of our ancient order of serfdom, and it against them that the part of our draft, the part that provoked Ryazanov's confusing discussion of rudiments and remnants, calls upon revolutionaries to struggle. If Ryazanov thought these institutions, for instance, the fastening of the peasant to the land and other similar ones, are rudiments of capitalism, then he would have to support his opinion with something more serious than the comical hypothesis suggesting that we would not need to demand a radical review of the peasant's emancipation had it been prepared by popular production. But he did no such thing for the simple reason that he had nothing more serious to say, and what he did say resulted from considerations that have nothing to do with the tasks of a social democratic program. Is it not the case that the period from the epoch of the great reforms to the present time, continues Ryazanov, a period of capitalism's uninterrupted development, has created a whole series of rudiments that are preventing the comprehensive development of the proletariat's class struggle? 37 Let us suppose this is the case. Does it follow that the remnants discussed in our draft do not exist, or that there is no place to point them out in a program of revolutionary social democracy? It seems that this does not follow at all. But Ryazanov is still not niched. 
Is it not the case that this period i.e. the one just mentioned has created a whole series of rudiments that are not only helping to preserve and strengthen the most barbaric forms of exploitation of the multi-million peasantry, but are also creating new ones that are less barbaric but incomparably more renet? Has it not created a whole array of rudiments that are keeping the entire people in a condition of ignorance and deprived of any rights, and doing so to no less degree than the remnants of pre-capitalist customs? Is it possible that protectionism, the system of taxes, militarism, etc., etc. are all the results of serfdom? 38. How does one respond to this? If the period mentioned by Ryazanov has really created new, less barbaric but, at the same time, more renet forms of exploiting the peasantry, then this can be due to one of two things, Either these new forms rest upon old legal institutions bequeathed to us by our previous serfdom, or else they are based on elements of our civil law whose content corresponds fully with the production relations of the most modern capitalist society. In the RST case, any serious struggle against them is a struggle against remnants and is noted in the corresponding points of our program. In the second case, the struggle against new forms of exploitation is just one element of the social democratic struggle against capitalism. The tasks involved in this latter struggle are also quite clearly discussed in our program, and that is why new, less barbaric but more renet forms of exploiting the peasantry are neither surprising to us nor do they represent any argument whatsoever against any part of our program. As for the Russian system of taxation, even to this day it is based partly on the peasant's lack of any rights as an estate, and in that respect it doubtlessly rests upon remnants. And so far as protectionism is concerned, militarism, etc., etc. Whatever that means, such phenomena are essential characteristics not only of our conditions but also of Western Europe, and in that sense, of course, they cannot be attributed to any remnants. But I ask once again, so what? The only implication is that the answer to the question of how to struggle against them is not to be found in that part of our program that deals with remnants. That is all there is to it. The reader will surely have no difficulty in agreeing that this is absolutely no basis for Conramang Riazanov's view, namely, that there is no place for remnants in a social democratic program. Riazanov continues. The best that social democrats can do is to leave it to bourgeois democracy to struggle against the remnants of pre-capitalist orders, while simply pointing out for their own part that destruction of such remnants is inevitable wherever capitalism has already become the prevailing mode of production, and that within a commodity economy they are transformed from a source of prosperity into one of calamity. 39. Now pedantry, like everything else, has its own logic. Remembering only the terminology of orthodox Marxism and being unable to grasp its content, Ryazanov naturally arrives at conclusions that represent a most malicious parody of Marxism. We are to leave it to bourgeois democracy to struggle against remnants of our old order, and we will limit ourselves merely to showing that destruction of such remnants is inevitable wherever and so forth. No, Mr. Ryazanov. If we were to behave that way, we would thereby demonstrate once and for all, and with irrefutable clarity, that the Narodniks and subjectivists were correct when they accused Marxists of quietism, if we behaved that way, then we would leave it completely to bourgeois democracy to play the role of the revolutionary factor in the contemporary social life of Russia, reserving to ourselves only the miserable role of armchair pedants. The importance of this matter is evident in the fact that our peasantry, which in legal terms also includes the majority of industrial workers, is thus far in its struggle for better living conditions running up continuously against obstacles resulting from the existence of remnants that provide a skillful agitator with a multitude of irreplaceable opportunities for political propaganda. To dismiss these opportunities on the grounds that some thinker might regard remnants as rudiments would amount to following the example of the famous metaphysician who, sitting in his pit, hesitated to use the rope lowered to him on the grounds that it was simply a rope and insisted on trying to think of something else instead 40 if our party claims the honor of being the most energetic and decisive bearer of revolutionary ideas, then it is also obliged to struggle more energetically and more decisively than all other parties against remnants of pre-capitalist relations. 
otherwise, its claim will be groundless and thus ridiculous. Ryazanov notes that the pre-capitalist social order was not always based on serfdom. 41 As Marx says, we must never forget that it is very easy to be liberal at the expense of the Middle Ages. 42 And in a country such as Russia, where capitalism has already become the prevailing mode of production, we must destroy all the legends concerning pre-capitalist systems. 43 It is perfectly true that not every pre-capitalist order was based on serfdom. But in our draft we deal with a quite spicy C and very well-known pre-capitalist order that really was based upon ensurfment of the toiling masses by the highest estate, by the government or by its head. Just how would we describe this order if not as one based on serfdom? As for the ease of being liberal at its expense, I don't see the point. Under the inions of Narodnik propaganda, for a very long time the Russian reader was inclined, on the contrary, to idealize our pre-capitalist order, at least in economic terms, with the result that with us it was much easier to be liberal to its bainy tea than at its expense. And although capitalism really has become the prevailing mode of production in our country, in the RST place not everyone recognizes this, and in the second place, the capitalist mode of production with us still does not have its corresponding legal superstructure. We now have a deep contradiction between the economy and the law, whose abolition must be the RST great accomplishment of our socialist movement. And since our legal superstructure, insofar as it contradicts the demands of modern society, was inherited from our pre-capitalist order, it is not possible for any thinking Russian to be too liberal at this order's expense. It is also ridiculous to compare our relation to this order with that of today's citizens of Western Europe to the Middle Ages. Here, again, Ryazanov has put his foot into it. He wanted to sound like Marx when speaking of social relations that Marx himself, had he encountered them, would probably have described quite differently. Ryazanov is also very displeased by the fact that we described Tsarism as the greatest and most harmful remnant of our pre-capitalist order. Our critic attributes this to the enlightened historiography peculiar to bourgeois democracy 44 historically, he says. Our autocracy really is rooted in the past, but this is a condition that it shares with numerous other aspects of social life. Unlike other remnants, it is not a holdover or some accidentally preserved fragment of the past. Alas, it is very much part of the present. And if the authors of our draft did not divide the whole of history into two periods, one being pre-capitalist and the other capitalist, they would see how much the character of our autocracy has changed since the time of Ivan III. 45. Neither in our draft, nor in any of the commentaries on it, is there a single line suggesting that we attribute an unchanging character to Russian autocracy. We know perfectly well that its character has changed along with the development of our social relations. But the undisputed fact of such change does not in the least prevent our autocracy from being a remnant and hold over from the past. Is it really the case that the only institutions that go on the historical scene as holdovers or remnants are ones distinguished by their unchanging character? That really would be news. And why does Ryazanov think that we regard the autocracy as an accidentally preserved fragment of the past? Indeed, in this case too, there is not the slightest hint, either in our draft or in the commentaries, that would lead to such a thought. There is. However, such an unchanging character in Ryazanov's method of criticism, it consists of attributing absurdities to his opponents, which never entered their minds, and then triumphantly refuting these imagined absurdities. It goes without saying that this kind of method greatly facilitates Ryazanov's effort at criticism. We furthermore learn from Ryazanov the interesting news that our autocracy was always an instrument in the hands of one social class or another. It underwent especially noteworthy changes in the period from the end of 18th century up to the epoch of the Great Reforms, when popular production Nally gave way to capitalism based upon Corvée labor. And we will be much closer to the truth if we say that in its contemporary form our autocracy is a product of the rudiments of capitalism. Historical legends of the time when it was an instrument solely of the nobles are long gone, 
even though they recede only stubbornly in face of the vigorous and forceful shoots of capitalism. It is still trying to maintain an equilibrium between the landlords and the bourgeoisie, but the growing contradictions between its two sources of support, which result from the development of capitalism, must lead to its destruction despite all its attempts to adapt to the changing class structure. 46. So, the autocracy will perish because it is incapable of adapting to the changed class structure. Why can it not make the adjustment? Is it not because autocracy is the kind of political institution that does not correspond to a capitalist society that has already reached a sine cant degree of development? And, if that is the case, does it not mean that autocracy is a political institution that represents a relic from the old social order? Certainly, that would appear to be the case. Even Ryazanov senses that this is true, but he does not relent. He declares the autocracy to be a product of capitalist rudiments on the grounds that it has long ceased to be an instrument solely in the hands of the nobility and has begun simultaneously to serve the bourgeoisie in achieving its goals. But this conclusion would only be convincing if Ryazanov were to demonstrate that the bourgeoisie never wished, or was never able, to bend to its needs one or another holdover from the old order. And, since he provides no such proof and never will, his whole argument once again falls apart like a house of cards. In reality, every newly emerging social class always endeavors, often successfully, to use for its own purposes institutions that have grown up on the basis of the old social order, and it enters into con ICT with those institutions only when, with their help, it has already reached a certain level of development. There was a time, for example, when the bourgeoisie tried to transform feudal institutions into instruments for achieving its goals. But only someone who is incapable of adapting to the most elementary demands of logic could conclude, on these grounds, that such institutions were a product of the rudiments of bourgeois development. Ryazanov is also very displeased by our idea that the autocracy, by its nature, is hostile to all social movements. How did this wisdom end up in a social democratic program? Ryazanov menacingly exclaims, were those who prepared the draft unaware that the autocracy is hostile by nature not to all social movements but only to certain ones, not to the social movements of all classes but only to those of certain classes. 47 We have already heard from Ryazanov that our autocracy has always been an instrument in the hands of one social class or another. If that is the case, then it is clear that even in the reign of Nicholas Pavlovich there was some social class that knew how to make the unrestrained power of the Tsar into its own instrument. 48 We will not squabble with Ryazanov over the question of precisely which class the autocracy served at that time, for us, it is enough to know that if our initial premise is true, then it invariably had to serve one or several of them. Starting from that conviction, we ask Ryazanov to show us exactly which social movement, of which Spicy C class, did not face the hostility of the Tsar Sergeant Major's government. We openly admit that we are unaware of any such movement. The more that duty requires me to scrutinize Ryazanov's book, the more I am reminded of the exclamation that Engels once directed to certain critics of historical materialism, these gentlemen know nothing of dialectics. As I have already mentioned, what is beyond Ryazanov is precisely dialectics. He is a born metaphysician. And when a metaphysician is set loose to theorize, nothing good can be expected. For a metaphysician, as for the nihilist portrayed by Count Tolstoy, every movement is awkward and every teaching is coarse. And Ryazanov hands out his coarse teaching to us as the most orthodox orthodoxy. What fun! But our metaphysician turns out to be even more clumsy and coarse in his criticism of our agrarian program. In his article on the agrarian program of Russian social democracy, Comrade Lenin observed that on matters concerning the industrial workers' movement, we acquire a great deal ready-made from the Germans, but in agrarian matters we may succeed in working out something new 49 having barely nished reading these words, Ryazanov, as they say, is all ears. Hmm. New. That means something not covered in the works of Marx and Engels. And anything that is not covered in the works of Marx and Engels cannot be orthodox. 
that means Lenin is a heretic and must be treated as such. But Ryazanov's orthodox jealousy is even more aroused when he hears from Lenin that not everything that is appropriate in the West is also appropriate in the East. In that connection, Ryazanov lets loose the following spiteful tirade. The something new is the discovery that there are two sides to all things in the world. Whereas in the West an agrarian program that proposed to multiply small farming and petty property would violate the principles of social democracy, in the East we have an exceptional case. We support multiplication of small holdings in the interest of eliminating the remnants of serfdom and promoting the free development of class struggle in the countryside, in other words, in the interest of the development of agrarian capitalism. 50. From the point of view of dialectical materialism, everything in the world really does have two sides. A particular principle that is important when applied to one place or time stands a good chance of proving false when applied to another place or another epoch. But a metaphysician does not understand this, and that is why his jaw drops in astonishment when he hears that a principle that was acknowledged to be true in the circumstances of one place and time is declared untrue in others. He sees inconsistency in this, contradictions, betrayal. The great founders of Scientisi Socialism had no sympathy for metaphysicians. The Manifesto of the Communist Party was a work, by the way, that waged war against metaphysicians. The reader will probably remember the place where it speaks of German wiseacres, philosophers and semi-philosophers, who eagerly pounced upon French socialist literature but happened to forget that when these writings immigrated from France into Germany, French social conditions had not immigrated along with them. 51 These wiseacres, philosophers and semi-philosophers were pure-blooded metaphysicians. The authors of the manifesto could not excuse their ignorance of the fact that French socialist criticism, of which they were merely a silly echo, presupposed the existence of modern bourgeois society, with its corresponding economic conditions of existence, and the political constitution adapted thereto, the very things whose attainment was the object of the pending struggle in Germany. 52 Ryazanov is just as much a pure-blooded metaphysician, trying to disgrace us by pointing to West. European Marxists who have no wish to multiply petty property. Ryazanov is forgetting that the agrarian views of these Marxists, of which he is merely a silly echo, apply to modern bourgeois society and the corresponding economic and legal position of the peasant, that is, the very conditions whose attainment is still only being talked about in our agrarian program. When our peasant NDS himself in the same position as West European peasants are in today, then we too will take a stand against any attempt to multiply private property. But presently, when our peasant NDS himself in completely different circumstances, the example of West European Marxists cannot be convincing for us, being in different social circumstances, we must also reason differently. Of course, this does not mean that we must invariably multiply private property. No, that matter also depends upon circumstances, but it is obvious that when we are discussing private property we must take into account the species aspects of our position and not satisfy ourselves with some completely pointless reference to West European Marxists. Just what are the circumstances that give rise to our talk about multiplying private property? They are of two kinds. In the RST place, some multiplication of the private property of the peasants can result from the return to them of the famous cut-offs, that is, the land that they once used but was taken from them with the abolition of serfdom. 53. In the second place a sine cant multiplication of private property will result from giving the peasant the right to dispose freely of his land, that is, from the internal straight cation of communal land tenure. 54. Let us RST consider the cutoffs. What is their sine cants in the economic life of the peasant? They are the source of his enslavement. Here, for example, is what we learn about them from someone so familiar with our village life as A.N. Engelhardt. With the peasant allotments, any land that exceeded their entitlements was cut off, and this cut off land, which was vitally important to the peasants, became someone else's property and constrained them simply by its location. Usually it is a narrow strip that surrounds their land and borders all three elds, 
so that wherever the cattle might leap they invariably end up on the master's land. At RST, when the landlords did not recognize the importance of the cut-offs, and wherever the peasants were more pragmatic and placed less hope on the new freedom, they managed to obtain ownership of the cut-offs for money or for some other kind of payment, and such peasants are now relatively prosperous. But nowadays everyone understands the importance of the cut-offs, 55 and every buyer of an estate, every lessee. Even the German who can't speak Russian, RST of all looks for cut-offs, how they are situated, and to what extent they constrain the peasants. Here the peasants universally work the landlord's land for the cut-offs, they work in a circle i.e. are back where they started because they use their own horses and their own implements to produce, and just as in the case of serfdom they fully till all three elds. These cut-offs, often worthless, are valued not according to the land's quality or productivity but only by the degree to which they are indispensable to the peasants, by the extent to which they constrain them, and by how much can be squeezed out of the peasants for these cut-offs. 56. That is what the cut-offs mean to the peasant. Would their return be bany chael to the peasants? Clearly, the answer is yes. And if the answer is yes, then why should we not include it in our program? Because, our critics reply, this would amount to supporting private property and its multiplication. And why is support and multiplication of private property detrimental? Because it delays the economic development of society. There are no other grounds for saying it is detrimental. This means that wherever it would not delay society's economic development, for whatever the reasons, but would rather accelerate it, there are no possible grounds for objection. But that is precisely the situation in the case that concerns us. All the researchers unanimously recognize that the squeezing of the peasants as a result of the cut-offs, so vividly described by Engelhardt, is a powerful obstacle to the success of agriculture in Russia. Accordingly, returning the cut-offs to the peasants would sinecantly stimulate the economic development of our country. And since economic development in our country, as everywhere else, will ultimately lead to the triumph of socialism, i.e., to elimination of private property in the means of production, it follows that return of the cut-off serves the interests of socialist revolution and that support for private property and its expansion, in this case, will accelerate transformation of the means of production into social property. Therefore, we not only may but are even obliged to stand for return of the cut-offs to the peasants. To a metaphysician, of course, such a conclusion will seem to be a logical trick. But it is not our business to convince metaphysicians, we are concerned with people who are able to adopt the dialectical method of modern socialism. Let us note in passing that when Ryazanov attributes to us the intention to purchase all of the cut-offs, pages 264-5, he is seriously misrepresenting our thoughts. We provide for purchase only where the former landowner's estates have already passed into someone else's hands. But even in this case, purchase must take place, according to our demand, not at the expense of the peasants or of the state, but rather of all the landlords who will on this account be subject to a special tax. The reader can judge for himself how such a purchase compares to the notorious purchase operation described by our profound, wise, and resourceful Riazanov. And now we come to the village commune. 57 There is no doubt that elimination of communal land tenure would mean sine can't support for private property and its multiplication. Even more important, the result would be that numerous Russian peasants would for the RST time acquire land as private property. Can socialists agree to this without betraying their program? We believe they can, and with that belief we end ourselves once again in very good company. In March of 1850, the address on Spratch to its members from the Central Committee of the Communist League, evidently written by Marx's own hand, categorically stated that the party of the proletariat can least of all am allerweenest and accept perpetuation of communal property gemindee agentum, which is a backward form even compared to modern private property and must everywhere and inevitably be transformed into the latter 58 as we see, Marx did not in the least regard an expansion of private property, resulting from dissolution of communal property, 
as a factor that would impede the movement of modern society towards socialism. Nor could he possibly regard it in that manner. 59 As a powerful dialectician, he saw better than anyone else the truth of the view that there are two sides to everything. And that support for private property and its expansion, which is harmful and reactionary in the context of a bourgeois society that is already moving more or less rapidly towards socialist revolution, might still be a necessary and useful measure in cases where the issue is one of freeing bourgeois society from the fetters of the old regime and destroying backward forms of property that have become obsolete. But the address that I have just quoted also demands confiscation of the land of feudal property owners and its conversion into state property to be used for workers' colonies 60 here, the program that Marx and his co-thinkers supported at that time appears to part ways with our draft, and Ryazanov seems to be really orthodox after all because his draft of an agrarian program seems in this respect to correspond with Marx's program. But this only appears to be the case, for, here again, Ryazanov is trying to speak like Marx in the context of social relations that Marx himself would have addressed quite differently. If Marxism can really be called the algebra of revolution, then a program that is true to the spirit of Marxism must be a revolutionary program from beginning to end. But, in a revolutionary program, each separate demand is judged in terms of how it promotes the success of the revolutionary movement. If it turns out that implementation of any given demand would have the effect of strengthening the forces of counter-revolution, then it must be rejected regardless of the fact that on its own it might promise certain bane ts to the revolutionary class. Let us consider the demand to transform the land into state property from this point of view. 61 With us in Russia, the state has been accustomed since ancient times to regard the land not as belonging to so-called private owners but rather as its own property. The communal land tenure of the peasants actually meant that both the land and the peasants attached to it belonged to the treasury and were treated according to the treasury interest. That is why our communal land tenure has been the most stable economic foundation of Tsarism. In order to bring down Tsarism, it is necessary to destroy its economic foundation, and for that purpose the peasants must be placed in conditions of modern private property, and the Asiatic form of state land tenure that has been established in our country must be eliminated. That is why all projects for nationalization of the land or for transforming gentry land into state property are for us essentially reactionary despite their revolutionary appearance. 62 That is also why Marx would likely judge such projects to be in contradiction with the fundamental demand of our pending revolution. If he held a different view in Germany, it is because conditions there were also completely different. It is true that Ryazanov and the so-called socialist revolutionaries, from whom he has borrowed his agrarian project, say that after the revolution the land taken from the big landowners will no longer belong to our current police state but instead to a free democratic republic, which will have a completely different approach both to the land and to agriculture. But when they speak that way, Ryazanov and his social revolutionary teachers turn the question that we have been considering upside down. The real question is how to achieve the triumph of a democratic republic. If we simply assume that this question has already been resolved, then, of course, we also resolve all the difficulties associated with it, but at the same time we abandon the viewpoint of scientific socialism and transform ourselves into utopians. In reality, a democratic republic will triumph and become stable only in the event that the revolutionary movement destroys the economic basis of Tsarism, that is, the very state land tenure whose stabilization and expansion the socialist revolutionaries, read, reactionaries, and our poor Ryazanov are attempting to promote. I have just a couple more comments to make. Ryazanov says that, by working for return of the cut-offs to the peasants, we thereby acknowledge that the rest of the land is a perfectly legal possession of the gentry. 63 This argument resembles that of the anarchists like two drops of water, they never tire of telling us that by demanding a shortening of the working day, say to eight hours, we are thereby acknowledging the legitimacy of any bourgeois exploitation that does not exceed the eight-hour limit. There is no point in discussing these kinds of arguments. Ryazanov reminds me that, in my commentary on the draft program, I recognize that, 
at some stage of the revolutionary movement, we might have to put forth the demand for complete expropriation of the gentry's land. I understand this point perfectly well. However, I do not see here any contradiction with the demand for return of the cut-offs. There is no qualitative difference between these two demands, only a quantitative one, just as there would be only a quantitative difference between two draft laws, one of which might demand shortening of the working day to 10 hours, and the other, say, to 6 hours. Which of these demands we are inclined to support at the current moment depends solely upon the balance of social forces. Presently, when the revolutionary energy of the peasantry is very modest, we naturally confront it with more modest demands, but if the time should come when our peasantry displays much greater revolutionary energy, then, of course, we shall not hold it back. That is not our affair. We are showing them the way to a greater revolutionary goal. But, in this case, too, we shall remain true to the spirit of our program and not become supporters of the reactionary utopia that Ryazanov has adopted from the socialist revolutionaries. That is the whole issue and the principal distinction of our program. To conclude my conversation with Ryazanov, I cannot help but recall an observation by Catherine too. The royal empress once wrote, Disagreements often result, unfortunately, from the fact that some people discredit the efforts of others, however bany chale they might be, solely because they did not accomplish them themselves, and they do so even when they would never be capable of accomplishing them themselves. The same applies to Ryazanov. It seems to me that our draft displeases him precisely because he did not write it himself. On his own, our strict critic is capable of producing only an unintelligible medley of his own poorly understood Marxism, and he is, unfortunately, much too impressed by the reactionary utopian demands of the socialist revolutionaries. Chapter 4 To what extent is the Communist Manifesto obsolete? First edition, 1903, revised edition, June 1906, Karl Koskai. This essay was originally written as an introduction to the Polish edition of the Communist Manifesto, RST published in Krakow in 1903 and reprinted in Warsaw two years later. One the German version appeared in July 1904 in the Leipziger Volkszeitung, one of the main organs of the SPD's left wing. Two a Russian translation of that version was printed in 1906. Three the present version is a corrected edition of the English translation that appeared in the journal Social Democrat on March 15, 1905. Four it was checked against the RST German version, as reprinted in December 1904 in the journal from the Arsenal of Socialism, a compilation of old and new propaganda writings, five, as well as against the revised edition of June 1906, which appeared as a preface to the seventh German edition of the Communist Manifesto. Six note the explicit reference to the March 1850 address of the Central Committee of the Communist League and to a bourgeois revolution that, in becoming permanent, grows beyond its own limits and develops out of itself a proletarian revolution. Although Koskai made reference to the theory of permanent revolution, in terms of the debates within the Russian party the implications of his essay were studiously ambiguous. Like Ryazanov in his criticism of the Iskra draft program, in the original 1903 edition of his essay Koskai AF remed that now there is only one class of the population that, with all its strength, stands for social progress, and that class is the proletariat. He added that today we can nowhere speak of a revolutionary bourgeoisie, and he cited Marx's address to the Central Committee of the Communist League to argue that the proletariat must consistently raise its own independent demands against those of bourgeois democrats in order that its revolutionary potential could not be exploited for bourgeois purposes. Such remarks corresponded perfectly with the theme set forth by Ryazanov. At the same time, however, Koskai was clearly of two minds concerning the possible revolutionary potential of the Russian bourgeoisie. The events of 1848, he noted, had brought the era of bourgeois revolutions to an end in Western Europe, and the Russian bourgeoisie has already adopted the reactionary turn of mind of the bourgeoisie in the West. Yet, he added in the original version of his essay that this conclusion might not hold for Russia, 
where the peasantry and the intellectuals play an entirely different role than in Western Europe. Whereas European workers' parties might have occasion to cooperate with liberals for the purpose of defending rights already won, in this respect, Russia was also an exception, implying that Russian workers might cooperate with the bourgeoisie even for revolutionary purposes. Such remarks would have encouraged Plekhanov in his quarrel with Ryazanov, although Plekhanov would have been dismayed by the prospect of a bourgeois revolution that becomes permanent and grows over into a proletarian revolution. Even more perplexing were the revisions Koskai made to his essay when it was republished in June 1906. By that time, the Russian Revolution was in retreat following the dispersal of the Petersburg Soviet, the brutal suppression of the Moscow insurrection, and the ensuing Duma elections. Although the cadets won the largest number of seats in the first Duma and hoped for a parliamentary monarchy, the Tsar insisted upon his prerogative to dismiss the Duma at will and did so in July 1906, shortly after Koskai's revised essay appeared. Writing on the eve of this catastrophe, Koskai obviously hoped for a more progressive outcome and hedged his comments accordingly. While the proletariat alone stood for social progress, on this occasion he added that this rule does not apply to Russia. And, while it was no longer possible to speak of a revolutionary bourgeoisie in general terms, he also added in this context that Russia might be a possible exception. In short, both in its original and in its revised version, Koskai's introduction to the Communist Manifesto could be cited in support of diametrically opposed positions within the Russian party. Koskai had helped to initiate the Russian debate over permanent revolution with his article on the Slavs and Revolution, yet his cautionary remarks in this essay, and his simultaneous reference to the Communist Manifesto and the address to the Central Committee of the Communist League, without pointing out clearly the change of tactics that intervened between them seven, served better to echo and even amplify divisions among Russian Marxists than to assist in resolving their differences. All sides in the Russian debate could therefore claim to speak with Koskai's authority while Koskai himself avoided any definitive conclusions on the grounds that events in Russia might ultimately be determined as much by international circumstances as by domestic class struggle. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. To what extent is the Communist Manifesto obsolete? The following remarks were written, at the invitation of the Polish comrades, as a preface to a new Polish edition of the Communist Manifesto and were therefore RST published in Polish. Eight almost sixty years have passed since the Communist Manifesto was written, sixty years of a mode of production that consists, more than any preceding one, of a constant overturning of the old and a continual hurrying and hunting after the new. They have been sixty years of thorough political and social revolutionizing, not only of Europe but of the whole globe. Naturally, these sixty years could not pass without leaving their mark on the Communist Manifesto. The more correctly it comprehended and corresponded to its time, the more it must necessarily grow obsolete and become an historical document that bears witness to its own time but can no longer be definitive for the present. But this, it should be emphasized, is true only regarding some points, namely, those where the practical politician speaks to his contemporaries. Nothing would be more erroneous than to stamp the whole of the Communist Manifesto as simply an historical document. On the contrary, the principles developed by it, the method to which it leads us, and the characterization it gives in a few strokes of the capitalist mode of production, are today more valid than ever. The whole actual development, as well as the whole theoretical investigation of the period since the writing of the Manifesto, is nothing but an unbroken line of confirmations of its fundamental conceptions. Never was the principle more universally accepted that the history of all hitherto existing, civilized, society is the history of class wars, and never has it been clearer that the great driving force of our times is the class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. But neither the proletarians nor the bourgeoisie are any longer quite the same as they were six decades ago. Sharp and accurate as the manifesto's portrayal of them is, and although it constitutes even today the most brilliant and profound description possible within so narrow a framework, in some respects it does not any longer tally. At the time when the communist manifesto appeared, the most striking characteristics of the proletariat were its degradation, 
the lowering of its wages, the lengthening of its working hours, its physical and often its moral and intellectual decay, in short, its misery. Of the three great classes that made up the bulk of the people, the peasants, the petty bourgeoisie and the wage workers, the latter then stood, in every respect, at the bottom. They were poor, oppressed, and helpless, both in numbers and in economic importance, with the exception of England, they ranked below the two other classes. For most disinterested spectators, the working class was only an object of pity. It therefore required all the economic and historic knowledge and all the acumen of a Marx and an Engels to detect in the class struggle of the proletariat the strongest motive force in the social development of the coming decades at a time when the successors of the great utopians still regarded the proletariat as a helpless mass to which relief could come only from the upper classes. At the time, revolutionists expected everything from what was called the people, that is, essentially from the petty bourgeoisie and the peasants, the mass of wage workers was an appendix of the petty bourgeoisie and peasants and was intellectually, socially and often economically dependent upon them. Today, the position of the proletariat is entirely different. True, it is still subjected to the pauperising unions of capital, as it was 60 years ago, and capital even today strives to lower wages, lengthen the hours of labour, supplant the worker with the machine, displace the working man by the woman and the child, and thus degrade the proletariat. But the revolt of the working class, a class always increasing in numbers, and disciplined, united, organized by the very mechanism of the process of capitalist production itself, is also growing ever stronger nine the resistance of the proletariat continuously intensifies as its strata learn, one after the other, to overcome the degrading effects of capitalism. The situation of the peasantry and the petty bourgeoisie is quite different. While, for decades, growing numbers of proletarians were shortening their working time and increasing their wages, the working time of the craftsmen and small farmers remained the same or was extended even to the limits of physical endurance, the intensity of their labor grew, and their standard of living is approaching more and more the level of subsistence. Moreover, while the working class knows how to erect an ever stronger defense, an ever greater protection for women and children employed in the great industries, the craftsmen and farmers are increasingly forced into extensive exploitation of their own women and children as well as those of others. Hand in hand with this economic transformation goes an intellectual and political one. A hundred years ago the small tradesmen far surpassed all other classes of the people in intelligence, self-reliance, and courage, today, the proletariat vigorously develops those virtues while the small tradesman has become the prototype of narrowness, servility, and cowardice. A hundred years ago, the petty bourgeoisie still formed the heart of democratic opposition and bourgeois radicalism, which declared war upon the castles, thrones, and altars, and peace to the cottages. Today, the petty bourgeoisie have become the elite troops of reaction, the bodyguard of those in the castles, thrones and altars, to whom they look for salvation from the misery into which they have been thrown by economic development. A similar thing happened to the peasantry. Now there is only one class of the population in the capitalistically developed nations, this rule does not apply to Russia 10 that, with all its strength, stands for social progress, and that class is the proletariat. But all these transformations are, fortunately for social progress, accompanied by a complete shift in power relations. When the Communist Manifesto was written, the great majority of the population, in France and Germany, from 70 to 80 percenter, still lived in the countryside. In the cities, the petty bourgeoisie was dominant. Today, the urban population constitutes the majority in all the industrially developed states of Europe, and in the cities the proletariat is predominant. Moreover, its economic importance has grown still more than its proportion to the whole population. A hundred years ago capitalist industry, especially on the European continent, still served above all to satisfy the demands of luxury, producing silk stuffs, rugs, porcelain, paper, etc. Sixty years ago, economic life rested mainly upon handicrafts and husbandry. At present, 
The economic sine cans and the wealth of a country depend in the RST place upon its great capitalist industries, which produce no luxuries but rather articles of mass consumption and the necessities of life. A modern state can exist without peasants and handicraftsmen, as is shown by the example of England, but it cannot exist without capitalist industries and the corresponding means of transportation. The proletariat also grows along with large-scale industry and the means of mass transportation. It is already the strongest stratum of the population in purely numerical terms. In German industry, the wage workers were in 1882 for the RST times 66 per center i.e. two-thirds, of the gainfully occupied persons, in 1895, they were already three-fourths of the gainfully occupied persons. Today, the entire economic life of the country depends on them. Within their ranks there are even growing numbers whose conditions of life and work surpass those of the small artisans, merchants, and peasants. The situation of many strata of the propertyless workers is today better than that of wide circles of propertied people, i.e. those who possess their own means of production. 11. One can no longer say, as the manifesto did, that the modern laborer, instead of rising with the process of industry, sinks deeper and deeper below the conditions of existence of his own class. He becomes a pauper, and pauperism develops more rapidly than population and wealth. 12. Thus the proletariat occupies today a position quite different from that of 60 years ago. To be sure, one must look at things in a peculiar way to think that, as a consequence of these changes, the antagonism of the proletariat toward capital has been moderated. Quite the contrary. On the one hand the proletariat, like every other class, today has at its disposal greater access to the advantages of culture than in former centuries or even past decades. The enormous increase in the productive forces, which have been unchained by capitalism, has not passed by the working class without leaving its mark. We may speak of an amelioration of the condition of many proletarian strata if we compare them with the condition of the petty bourgeoisie and the small peasants, but the situation of workers is decidedly and rapidly worsening vis a vis the situation of their exploiters, the capitalist class. The productivity of labor has grown enormously under the rule of capital, the social wealth has enormously risen, but what the proletariat gets from it is very meager compared to the riches appropriated by the capitalist class. The condition of the proletariat is deteriorating compared with the living standards of the capitalist class and the accumulation of capital, its share in the product of its toil is decreasing, and its exploitation is steadily increasing. All the progress that it has nevertheless made has been won only by digging against capital, and the workers are able to maintain it only through a continuous struggle. In this way, not only the degradation of the proletariat but also its elevation, not only its defeats but also its victories, become sources of a continuous and growing anger against the enemy class. The forms of the struggle change and become more acute. Isolated acts of wild despair are replaced by the planned acts of great organizations, but the antagonisms remain and become ever more acute. Like the proletariat, the industrial bourgeoisie has also undergone a transformation during the last 60 years. When the Communist Manifesto appeared, that class had only just done away with the Corn Laws, the NAL obstacle to its domination in England, and on the continent of Europe it was confronted with the necessity of a revolution to subordinate political power to its own aims. It stood in hostile opposition to the powers that most clearly oppressed the bulk of the population, the clergy, the nobility, the monarchy, and finance. It was still cherishing great political aims and ideals that even gave it a sort of ethical idealism. It still believed that only the debris of feudalism stood in the way of general prosperity and that after it was cleared away, there would begin an era of general happiness. The revolution of 1848 brought the great disappointment and unveiled the class antagonisms that economic development, as we have seen, steadily intensi ed. Thus the industrial bourgeoisie and its followers were driven into the camp of reaction. It was unable to attain absolute power anywhere in Europe. It tried to obtain political power with the help of the petty bourgeoisie and the proletariat, 
and to preserve its domination with the help of those social powers against which it had mobilized the democracy. To this should be added the fact that industry has more and more surrendered to finance through the stock exchange, which has always been anti-democratic and has favored absolute power in the state. The Communist Manifesto could still declare. In Germany the Communist Party GHTS with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way, against the absolute monarchy, the feudal landowners, and the petty bourgeoisie. 13. Today we can nowhere speak of a revolutionary bourgeoisie with the possible exception of Russia. 14. However, not only are the bourgeoisie and proletariat in some respects differently disposed today from what they were at the time of the Communist Manifesto, but the course of development has also not turned out quite as had been expected. To be sure, the basic economic development has moved entirely along the path that the Manifesto outlines so clearly, and what it says in this respect remains classic to this day. But the political development has proceeded differently from what one could foresee at that time. Marx and Engels were well aware of the fact that the working class, in its condition at that time, especially in Germany, was unable to conquer political power and keep it. But they expected the impending bourgeois revolution, which they believed would take place in Germany sooner than elsewhere, to take a course similar to that of the English Revolution of the 17th and the French Revolution of the 18th century. They expected it, from the outset, to be a movement of the revolutionary bourgeoisie against absolutism and feudalism, but they hoped that in its further development the proletarian elements would more and more recognize and develop their antagonism towards the bourgeoisie, and that the revolution would strengthen the unions of the proletariat and cause it rapidly to intensify and mature. 4. During a revolution, every development proceeds at a most rapid pace, a revolutionary class advances as far in VE years as it would otherwise do in a century. Thus, the bourgeois revolution would be followed immediately by a proletarian revolution, and the conquest of political power by the proletariat would be won not as the result of a coup, but through years, perhaps decades, of revolutionary struggles. The Communist Manifesto says in this respect. The communists turn their attention GAY to Germany because that country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under more advanced conditions of European civilization, and with a much more developed proletariat than that of England was in the 17th and of France in the 18th century, and because the bourgeois revolution in Germany can be but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. 15. This expectation did not materialize, as we all know, it did not materialize just because the revolution of 1848 happened under more progressive conditions of European civilization than those of 1640 and 1789. It was war that drove the proletarian, the semi-proletarian, and semi-petty bourgeois elements of the English and French revolutions to the forefront and enabled them temporarily to seize political power, a life-and-death war that the revolution had to wage and in which it could only endure through the workers' characteristic disregard both for their own lives and for the property of the moneyed classes. In England it was the long war of Parliament against the feudal armies of Charles I, and in France it was the war against the Allied monarchs of Europe, which likewise lasted for years. But the revolution of 1848 kindled no war. The governments were not brought down by a protracted civil war, the barricade battles of a single day were sufficient to cause their collapse in Paris, Vienna, and Berlin. And, since the revolution extended over the whole of Europe, there was no foreign power to proclaim war against it. Absolutist Russia at RST kept very quiet. But, while the feudal absolutist opponents of the revolution of 1848 were much weaker than in the 17th and 18th centuries, the proletariat was much stronger. During the days of February, it immediately gained a dominant position in Paris. In place of a life-and-death struggle against the monarchy and nobility, for which it would have been necessary to call the proletariat to arms and ultimately to submit to its inions, the bourgeoisie was immediately forced to begin a life-and-death struggle against the proletariat itself. For this purpose, the bourgeoisie turned for help to the only recently subdued power of the state and its army, and thus it ultimately submitted once more to its yoke. 
the Battle of June was the catastrophe of the Revolution of 1848. It inaugurated a new historical epoch. It marked the moment when the bourgeoisie completely ceased to be a revolutionary class in political terms, and it brought to a close the era of bourgeois revolutions, at least for Western Europe. I will not discuss here how far this holds good for Russia, where the peasantry and the intellectuals play an entirely different role than in Western Europe. Since June 1848 a bourgeois revolution that could become the prelude to a proletarian revolution is no longer possible in Western Europe. The next revolution can only be a proletarian one. And, in Russia, too, the initiative for a revolution can only emanate from the industrial proletariat, even if it does not as yet lead to its exclusive domination. But all this has given the labor movement a totally different role from the one it had at the time when the Communist Manifesto was written. The strengthening of the working class, and its elevation to a position that would enable it to conquer and retain political power, can no longer be expected from a bourgeois revolution that, in becoming permanent, grows beyond its own limits and develops out of itself a proletarian revolution. This maturing and strengthening must take place outside of the revolution and before it. The proletariat must have reached a certain degree of development before a revolution is at all possible. The revolution must take place through methods of peace, not of war, if one may express oneself so paradoxically as to distinguish between warlike and peaceful methods of class struggle. Protection of the workers, trade unionism, organization of cooperative societies and universal suffrage now gradually assume a sine cans quite different from that of the period before June 1848. That which 60 years ago was still enshrouded in the utmost darkness is today as clear as daylight. Thanks to this fact, many a short-sighted mole, diligently digging for earthworms, thinks himself far superior in range and clarity of vision to the masters of the Communist Manifesto and even looks down with pity upon their intellectual errors. But the fact is that there were no socialists and revolutionaries who comprehended the new situation sooner than Marx and Engels. They were the RST to recognize that the era of revolution, for the near future at least, had come to an end. It was the International 16 that RST systematically sought to promote trade union organizations on the continent of Europe. Marx's capital RST offered a theory for the legislative protection of the workers, and in the 1860s the International participated energetically in the movement for universal suffrage in England. Not only the methods by which the working class becomes mature, but also the pace of development had to change as a consequence of the new situation. The place of rapid revolutionary impetus was taken by the snail-like movement of peaceful and legal evolution, which is too slow for a airy soul. Thus some things have reached a different outcome from what the authors of the Communist Manifesto expected at the time of writing. But they were the RST to recognize the new situation, and they did so because of the principles and methods they had developed in their manifesto. The new situation was itself a confirmation of those principles, though in a different form from the one they foresaw. If the legislative protection of the workers and the trade union organizations acquired during the following decades an importance that was still impossible to recognize in 1847, this was only due to the fact that a few months after the appearance of the manifesto the class antagonism between bourgeoisie and proletariat already affected the bourgeoisie in a manner that nobody suspected before February 1848. It was also due, therefore, to the fact that the delineation of this antagonism in the Communist Manifesto already proved to be truer for its own time than its authors had assumed. Very few of those who play the part of critics of the Manifesto suspect these kinds of connections. From the fact that a rapid and stormy development was replaced by a peaceful and gradual one, and that revolutionary methods of class war were replaced by legal ones, they conclude that an antagonism between bourgeoisie and proletariat either does not exist at all or is constantly diminishing. They preach cooperation between the liberal bourgeoisie and the proletariat and, in so far as they are socialists, they refer to the sentence of the manifesto that states. In Germany the Communist Party GHTS together with the bourgeoisie as long as it acts in a revolutionary way, against the absolute monarchy, the feudal landowners, and the petty bourgeoisie. 17. This sentence, it is claimed, 
sanctions the policy of forming a democratic bloc in order to capture the government, die Politik der Demokratischen Regierungsblocks, and the policy of socialist ministerialism that is practiced by some socialist factions in France and Italy and preached everywhere by the representatives of the new method. Here we have a Marxist dogma. Defended with truly dogmatic fanaticism precisely by the champions of critical socialism. 18 But we have seen that insofar as we may speak of a mistake in the manifesto and consider criticism to be necessary, this must begin precisely with the dogma that the bourgeoisie is revolutionary in political terms. The very displacement of revolution by evolution during the last FTY years grows out of the fact that a revolutionary bourgeoisie no longer exists. Besides, Marx and Engels understood by the term being with the bourgeoisie something different from what the supporters of contemporary socialist ministerialism understand 19 The address of the Central Committee to the Communist League of March, 1850, deals with the attitude of the communists towards bourgeois democracy, which, it was assumed at the time, would place itself at the helm of the state during a new revolutionary eruption. To quote. At the moment, while the democratic petty bourgeois are everywhere oppressed, they preach to the proletariat general unity and reconciliation, they extend the hand of friendship, and seek to found a great opposition party which will embrace all shades of democratic opinion, that is, they seek to ensnare the workers in a party organization in which general social democratic phrases 20 prevail while their particular interests are kept hidden. And in which, for the sake of preserving the peace, the spicy sea demands of the proletariat may not be presented. Such a unity would be to their advantage alone and to the complete disadvantage of the proletariat. The proletariat would lose all its hard-won independent position and be reduced once more to a mere appendage of chale bourgeois democracy. This unity must therefore be resisted in the most decisive manner. In the event of a struggle against a common enemy a special alliance is unnecessary. As soon as such an enemy has to be fought directly, the interests of both parties will coincide for the moment and an association of momentary expedients will arise spontaneously in the future, as it has in the past. It goes without saying that in the bloody conists to come, as in all others, it will be the workers, with their courage, resolution, and self sacrice who will be G.A.Y. responsible for achieving victory. During and after the struggle the workers must at every opportunity put forward their own demands against those of the bourgeois democrats. They must demand guarantees for the workers as soon as the bourgeois democrats set about taking over the government. They must achieve these guarantees by force if necessary, and generally make sure that the new rulers commit themselves to all possible concessions and promises, the surest means of compromising them. They must check in every way and as far as possible the victory euphoria and enthusiasm for the new situation which follow every successful street battle, with a cool and cold-blooded analysis of the situation and with undisguised mistrust of the new government. In a word, from the very moment of victory the workers' suspicion must be directed no longer against the defeated reactionary party but against their former ally, against the party which intends to exploit the common victory for itself. 21. This, then, was the form of common struggle of the bourgeoisie and proletariat against absolutism and feudalism, as Marx and Engels regarded it when they wrote the Communist Manifesto. It is something quite different from what the present-day socialist ministerialists ministry Ellen in France and Italy aim for. Of course, one may object that what took place at that time were revolutionary struggles. But a common revolutionary struggle is the most favorable case for a united action of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The danger that the political power of the proletariat may be exploited by the bourgeoisie, that the proletariat may lose the political power that emanates from its political independence, together with the need to distrust a bourgeois democratic government, are evidently much stronger in circumstances where the bourgeoisie can no longer be anything but conservative than where it still aims for the revolutionary conquest of new positions. But wherever cooperation of bourgeoisie and proletariat may today become necessary, it is, with the exception of Russia, not for revolutionary but for conservative purposes, for the preservation and security of the existing meager rudiments of democracy against the onslaught of reaction. In these struggles against reaction, 
the proletariat also has to stand its ground, here, too, its lot is to take on the most difficult work and it sometimes has to cooperate with the liberal bourgeoisie. But, even more than in the revolutionary struggle, there is a danger here that the proletariat may be betrayed by its allies. The proletariat must therefore face them with open distrust and above all retain a completely independent organization. By virtue of its class position, the proletariat is a thoroughly revolutionary class, and today it is the only revolutionary class. For a time, circumstances may force it to participate in a conservative response to reaction, but its forces can never be fully spent in that task. It must always give practical proof of its revolutionary character, which will break through even where, for the moment, it acts in a conservative manner. Its powers can only develop and increase through revolutionary action and revolutionary propaganda, and it destroys the sources of its strength if it limits itself to the role of a conservative guardian of the ruling liberal bourgeoisie against the onslaught of the clergy, the landed aristocracy and the mercenaries. Of course, these are questions that concern the socialists of Western Europe more than those who are active in the Russian Empire. The latter live under political and economic conditions that still greatly resemble those of Germany on the eve of the revolution of 1848. For that reason, the manifesto is still far more valid for them than for the socialists of Western Europe, not only as regards its fundamentals, its methods, and its description of the general character of the capitalist mode of production, all of which today still constitute the unshakable foundations for every conscious proletarian movement in every country, but also in many details that for Western Europe have become obsolete. With the modern conditions of international intercourse, however, no country, and least of all a capitalist country, moves along the path of its domestic development solely as a result of its own internal driving forces. Outside inances, and above all the effects of class wars in foreign countries, become almost equally important for its class struggles. The revolutionary battle of June 1848 in France proved decisive not only for the course of the French Revolution, but also for that of the German Revolution. And for the labor movement in England. Likewise, the relation between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie in Western Europe affects the relation between these classes in Russia as they face a political and economic situation that corresponds to the time of the manifesto but also embodies all the experiences accumulated over two generations of uninterrupted economic revolution since the communist manifesto. The political relation between bourgeoisie and proletariat, between liberalism and socialism, is for that reason a much more complex and difficult one in Russia than in Western Europe. To comprehend it correctly, the socialists active under Russian absolutism will have to take into consideration the more primitive conditions of their own country just as much as the more highly developed conditions of other countries. The Russian bourgeoisie still has a revolutionary task to fulfill, but it has already adopted the reactionary turn of mind of the bourgeoisie in the West. 22 Russian socialists will and be their best and most reliable guide in the Communist Manifesto. To be sure, there can be no single model for all the forms that the class struggle of the proletariat has assumed in every country, and the Communist Manifesto must likewise not be regarded in this way. The circumstances under which the proletariat has to conduct its political and economic struggles today are extremely diverse and complex. In every country many of these conditions are completely unique. Nowhere do they correspond perfectly to the conditions that inyance the writing of the Communist Manifesto. Nevertheless, it remains the proletarians' best and most reliable guide on their way to emancipating their own class and therefore the human race. 23 The Communist Manifesto is no gospel, no Bible, as it has been called, whose words are holy, but a historical document that should be subject to criticism, to criticism, however, that does not limit itself to stating how some sentences and turns of phrase no longer tee the case, and to criticism, furthermore, that endeavors to comprehend the work itself as well as those sentences that today are obsolete, thereby deriving new knowledge from them. To those who study the Communist Manifesto in this manner it is a compass upon the stormy ocean of the proletarian class struggle a compass to which the socialist parties of all countries are indebted for the fact that, despite all contrary currents, 
despite fogs and cliffs, they are always headed in the right direction. A compass that proved reliable by pointing out, for 60 years, the direction of economic development, and which all the facts have corroborated again and again. There is no historic document more gloriously conromed by the decades following the time of writing than the Communist Manifesto. Chapter 5 Revolutionary Questions, February 1904, Karl Koskai This essay 1 was Karl Koskai's response to criticism of his 1902 book The Social Revolution 2 by Michael Luesnia, Kazimierz Kelly's Kraus. Luesnia was a leading theorist of the Polish Socialist Party, PPS, which was the main rival of the Social Democratic Party of the Kingdom of Poland and Lithuania, SDKPIL, headed by Rosa Luxemburg and Leo Jogi Ches. Koskai's work was published in Russia at least twice in the aftermath of the 1905 revolution. 3. Luesnia gave the title Unarmed Revolution. 4. To his critical review, which appeared in Die Neue Zeit with this prefatory note by Koskai. Outside the circle of party comrades engaged in direct struggle with the Tsars, the views developed here, insofar as they relate to a violent revolution, may be valid for special circumstances in which international social democracy is not strongly represented. In German social democracy I know of nobody who holds similar views. But I feel that I am not entitled, as editor, to suppress a criticism directed at me, and for that reason I agreed to publish the article of our Polish comrade. One will understand, however, why we delayed until now the publication of this article, which reached us almost a year ago. During the period of the election campaign for the national and state legislatures, as well as of the debate about the vice president, it did not seem appropriate to us also to place on the order of the day a discussion over the question of the revolution. With the consent of its author, we have therefore postponed until now publication of the following article. A reply follows in the next issues of Die Neue Zeit. 5. Louis Nia began his article by praising Koskai for having raised the issue of the concrete forms that the next social revolution would assume, thanks to him we will be able to speak again about those things without being looked upon as lunatics by the fanatics of purely practical work. 6. Louis Nia then proceeded to criticize Koskai's description of the RST economic steps that the future proletarian government would be forced to take, such as unemployment relief, concentration of the workers in the largest and most efficient enterprises, and so forth. He then presented a scenario of the future revolution that proved, with the Baini T of hindsight, to be much closer to actual revolutionary events of the coming decades than Koskai's more pacey ST outlook. The following excerpt will provide readers with the essential ideas of Louis Nia's article, Unarmed Revolution. In yet another respect my views about the period of struggles i.e. the period of transition from capitalism to socialism diverge from those of Koskai, and here we come to the principal difference of opinion between us, which appears with an interrogation mark in the title of this article. I think that it is not a purely subjective feeling when I say that the chapter of Koskai's brochure on the forms and weapons of the Social Revolution 7 is fragmentary and gives an impression of indecision, of diptance, which is unusual in Koskai. One perceives here the latent inions of the continuing and yet to be overcome condition of the proletarian movement, in which one can think about the revolution, about the decisive struggle, only reluctantly and with anxiety. For that reason, people tend to persuade themselves that the revolution can and must be unarmed. But I think that, precisely considering that frame of mind of the majority of the Gders, it is much more useful to draw all the consequences and also to destroy those illusions without, of course, adopting in the least a ridiculously heroic pose. Koskai is surely correct when he thinks that the coming revolution will be very different from previous ones. For the RST time a revolution will be carried out making use of democratic forms and will not be directed against an isolated government but rather will lead to a struggle by part of the people, to be sure a larger and more energetic part, against perhaps a fairly large part of the people, many petty bourgeois and small peasants together with the capitalists and the large landowners. Koskai is very sagacious when he writes, the coming revolution will be much less a sudden uprising against the authorities than a long-drawn-out civil war, 
but he is totally mistaken, I think, when he adds, if one does not necessarily associate with these last words the idea of actual wars and slaughter. We have no reason to assume that armed insurrections with barricade battles and similar warlike occurrences can still play a decisive role even today. Why? Koskai answers, the reasons for this have been given so often that I have no need of dwelling on them further. 8 And he counts only on the mass strike, a still unknown method of struggle, on a war, and Nally on the unreliability of the military. Let's take a closer look at those issues. Naturally, we have no wish to speak about means that are today unknown and unforeseeable. As regards the mass strike, it is certainly a prejudice for people to reject that means of struggle in principle, indeed, a harmful prejudice when the partisans of the mass strike, due to certain historical circumstances, employ the incorrect expression general strike. One must only free this idea absolutely from all the misunderstandings and fallacies that cling to it and reduce them all to the single delusion that the mass strike is a magic means that replaces all others. Koskai rightly protests against the idea that the mass strike can make parliamentary tactics super use. But does he really believe, along with Alemane 9 and many others, that the revolution of crossed arms can replace the revolution of clenched STS, or rather of armed STS? In other words, can a decisive struggle of the people against the exploiters and the government, involving vital political demands, be fought by means of the mass strike without inevitably leading to clashes with the military? One has only to consider the demonstrations and assemblies that are unavoidable in a mass strike, especially a political one, the intense agitation that must possess the people in such life and death struggles, the provocations of the government, and most especially the strike breakers. The organized workers are everywhere the minority, and whoever cherishes hopes that the organization of the proletariat in capitalist society will be able to encompass the majority of the workers, or even the entire class prior to the triumph of the revolutionary movement, has to think about the unemployed. Is it not highly probable that if the strike lasts for some time, the unorganist, and especially the unemployed, will be invited to work in place of the strikers? Even given all the discipline and all the illusions about peace, would the strikers then be able to preserve legality? Would they be able to refrain from attacking the traitors when they become really noxious? The replacement of certain workers by soldiers, or the militarization of certain categories of workers, which has already been attempted against the railway employees in Italy, could also easily lead to clashes in which the workers would confront the military. What then? Is all lost? All the arguments against the probability of a new popular insurrection are only correct to the extent that today, in view of modern military technique, neither the greatest courage nor barricade struggles and so on can save the people from defeat when the unarmed or badly armed people confronts the military and the military does not shrink from carrying out the most horrible slaughters. To that extent, Koskai is also correct when he says, militarism can only be overthrown by rendering the military itself disaffected with the rulers, not through its being defeated by popular uprisings. 10 But the military must appear disaffected in the action itself, not in the consciousness of the rulers. Only when it goes through that test will one know what to expect from it. In its action, a part of the military can pass over to the side of the people. I say explicitly a part, because it seems to me impossible to expect that response from the whole military or even from its majority. The army is today an image of society, it consists of members of all classes. On the one hand there will be among the of Chael some friends of the people, but on the other hand there will be also very many soldiers, including soldiers of peasant and petty bourgeois extraction but also some from the working class, who, unnerved by clericalism, will be ready to take part in the repression of the revolutionary movement. Whether the military will for the time being repress the movement or join it will therefore depend on the composition of each army division in question, and also naturally on the strength of the popular movement in each particular place, on the moral impression that it is able to make on the minds of the soldiers. It is therefore improbable that the revolution will be victorious throughout the whole country at once. But is it not certain that the assailed regime will strain every nerve, with the help of the loyal part of the army, 
in order to wrest victory from the hands of the rebels and crush the rebellious troops. For the latter there would be no way back, they would have to help the masses arm themselves and set up a Ding organization, which would be made much easier by universal conscription. And so two armed camps would confront each other, the revolution and the forces of order. If the situation reaches that point, they would have to start a real civil war with actual battles and sieges. Let us recall the Paris Commune, then, too, a part of the troops passed over to the side of the revolution and fought, together with the armed population, against the troops of order. Only that prototype would be augmented a hundred times, hundreds of communes would arise, and the victorious ones would come to the help of the others. 2. Conceive the coming revolution in some other concrete form seems to me impossible. 11. Louis Nia concluded his article with an analysis of the outward, international aspects of the revolution, 12 where he developed the idea that Russia would continue, as in the 19th century, to be the bulwark of reaction in the event of a revolutionary outbreak in Europe, an erroneous perspective that led him to conclude that a war on European soil is highly improbable. 13 in his biography of Louis Nia, Timothy Snyder commented upon the reactions of the leading Marxists of the time to this exchange. As Plekhanov pointed out, Koskai was unable to meet Kelly's Krauss challenge to provide a credible scenario for socialist revolution in Germany. Plekhanov to Koskai, September 28, 1904, cited in Waldenberg's Polish book on Koskai, Timothy Snyder's note, p. 182. Rosa Luxemburg seized the occasion of this debate to attack Kelly's Krauss for the RST time. By this time, she and her allies had gained control of the SDKPL the Social Democracy of the Kingdom of Poland and Lithuania, and she chose its organ pair Zieglitz Sokjalistizny as her forum. In her own inimitable style she wrote in Volume 2, Number 2, 1904, this professor of retrospective sociology, Dr. Baron, knight of three titles, having striven vainly for years with the help of two pseudonyms to gain a name for himself, has nally attained his goal. He has received for his troubles a few kicks in the back from Koskai, but that's how it goes, that's just part of the European acclaim that in Mr. Ilihard Essie's opinion Mr. Michael Lewis Nia has now gained. Ilihard Essie was one of Kelly's Krauss' two pseudonyms. One has to hand it to the social patriots, they have indeed nationalized Polish socialism in the full sense of the word. For such Lewis Nias are the incarnation, in the world of socialism, of our own particular type of Warsaw publicist, who gains his notoriety by stomping on the corns of the famous in the street. 14. Rosa Luxemburg and Koskai were both dismayed by the way Louis Nia minimized the role of Russian workers in the coming revolution. When, in February 1905, Louis Nia submitted to Die Neue Zeit an article calling for a separate Polish movement to break away from the larger Russian issues and seek Polish independence, Koskai rejected the article with these words. I am little edi ed by the politics put forward by you in your article. You wrote the unbelievable sentence that Poland certainly is ripe for democracy, but perhaps not Russia. This statement is the worst betrayal of the Russian revolution that one can think of and simultaneously reveals the most short-sighted parochialism. The PPS seems still not to know that the history of all nations living in the Russian Empire will be decided in Petersburg, not Warsaw, that the destruction of Tsarism is the precondition of the independence of Poland, that today it is a question of combining all the forces of revolution against the Tsar. You think you will be able to win Polish democracy before the Russian is won, therefore you separate the Polish revolution from the Russian and you make a struggle of the Poles against Russians out of the struggle of the Polish and Russian proletariat against the Tsar. I cannot cooperate in that. 15. It was certainly Koskai's defense of the Russian proletariat as the future revolutionary vanguard of Europe, rather than his advocacy of the mass political strike as opposed to the armed insurrection, that led Trotsky to praise and quote extensively from Koskai's article in his book Results and Prospects. But Trotsky appears also to have adopted from Koskai a line of economic argument that reappeared in his own essay late in 1905 on the Paris Commune, included in this volume, and again in Chapter 8 of Results and Prospects, namely, 
the claim that once a proletarian party seized political power, the objective logic of its situation would compel it to begin implementing a socialist program. In the document translated here, Koskai cited the case of unemployment relief, which any workers' party would be compelled to initiate even if it did not intend immediate socialization of the means of production. Koskai reasoned that if every unemployed person were guaranteed a minimum living wage, every strike would be irresistible and the workers would be the true masters of the factory. He concluded that, wherever the proletariat has conquered political power, socialist production follows as a natural necessity even where the proletariat has not arrived at a socialist consciousness. Its class interests and economic necessity force it to adopt measures that lead to socialist production. If the proletariat has political power, then socialism follows as a matter of necessity. In his essay on the Paris Commune, Trotsky followed similar reasoning to claim, as Ryazanov had done in his earlier criticism of Lenin and Plekhanov, that any distinction in Russia between a minimum and a maximum program would vanish in the practice of permanent revolution. Whereas Koskai spoke specifically of unemployment relief, Trotsky declared that a workers' government in Russia would have no choice but to legislate an eight-hour day, which would precipitate lockouts and necessitate socialization of the factories. 16. Although Koskai specifically noted that a revolution in Russia cannot establish a socialist regime at once, in results and prospects Trotsky insisted that a workers' government in Russia would immediately have to take the path of socialist policy. It would be the greatest utopianism to think that the proletariat, having been raised to political domination by the internal mechanism of a bourgeois revolution, can, even if it so desires, limit its mission to the creation of republican democratic conditions for the social domination of the bourgeoisie. The workers cannot but demand maintenance for strikers from the revolutionary government, and a government relying upon the workers cannot refuse this demand. But this means paralysing the effect of the reserve army of labor and making the workers dominant not only in the political but also in the economic eld, and converting private property in the means of production into Asian. These inevitable social economic consequences of proletarian dictatorship will reveal themselves very quickly, long before the democratization of the political system has been completed. The barrier between the minimum and the maximum program disappears immediately the proletariat comes to power 17. In revolutionary questions, Koskai left the door ajar for Trotsky's interpretation of his argument. While he personally expected a Russian revolution to produce only a democratic government from which an impetuous and progressive proletariat would be able to demand important concessions, he also observed that the political rule of the proletariat in Western Europe would offer to the proletariat of Eastern Europe the possibility of shortening the stages of its development and Artie Chaley introducing socialist arrangements by imitating the German example. Koskai further explained how a Russian revolution might trigger a revolution in Europe when the upheaval in Poland was transmitted to Austria and Prussia. In Chapter 9 of Results and Prospects, dealing with the topic Europe and Revolution, Trotsky again followed Koskai's line of thought, if the German and Austrian governments attempted to suppress the revolution in Poland, war would follow between Germany and revolutionary Russia and would lead inevitably to a proletarian revolution in Germany. If a revolutionary government in Russia repudiated the Tsarist debts, it would also precipitate a crisis in France that could only end with French workers seizing power. In one way or another, Trotsky wrote, either through a revolution in Poland, through the consequences of a European war, or as the result of the state bankruptcy of Russia, revolution will cross into the territories of old capitalist Europe. In that case, Koskai's own proviso in revolutionary questions would become operative, a workers' government in Russia would be able, as Koskai himself said, to shorten the stages of its own development by following the example of socialist Germany. Although Koskai endorsed the mass political strike in revolutionary questions, in February 1910, under pressure from the conservative party apparatus, he refused to publish an article by Rosa Luxemburg that called for using the strike in order to achieve universal suffrage in Prussia and for raising the slogan of the Republic as a transitional demand in order to turn the issue of electoral reform into a channel for revolutionary action. 18. This resulted in a furious round of polemics in the 
course of which Koskai became the leading theoretician of the SPD centrists and developed the so-called strategy of exhausting the enemy or Madung strategy as opposed to the strategy of defeating the enemy Niederwerfung strategy, which was advocated by Rosa Luxemburg. 19 In her polemics against the centrists in the SPD, Rosa Luxemburg referred to revolutionary questions as an example the revolutionary positions that Koskai endorsed in 1904 but repudiated just six years later. In theory and practice she wrote. Comrade Koskai has proved yet another super use thing. If the general economic and political conditions in Germany are such as to make a mass strike action like the Russian one impossible, and if the extension which the mass strike underwent in the Russian Revolution is the spicy sea product of Russian backwardness, then not only is the use of the mass strike in the Prussian voting rights struggle called into question but the Jena Resolution as well. Until now, the resolution of the Jena Party Convention of September 1905 was regarded both here and abroad as such a highly signy cant announcement because it of Chaley borrowed the mass strike from the arsenal of the Russian Revolution and incorporated it among the tactics of German social democracy as a means of political struggle. Admittedly, this resolution was formally so composed, and by many exclusively interpreted so that social democracy seemed to declare it would only turn to the mass strike in case of an attack on Reichstag voting rights. But at one time, in any case, Comrade Koskai did not belong to those formalists, indeed, in 1904 he emphatically wrote, if we learn one thing from the Belgian example, it is that it would be a fatal error for us in Germany to commit ourselves to a spicy sea time for proclaiming the political strike for example, in the event of an attack on the present Reichstag voting rights. Revolutionaries Everywhere, Die Neuzeit, Volume 22, No. 1, p. 736. Rosa Luxemburg's Emphasis 20. Rosa Luxemburg returned to this reference in the NAL part of her article. She remarked that Comrade Koskai quite rightly reminds us that even before the Russian Revolution he gave an exact description of the working of a political mass strike in his article Revolutionary Questions, but she added that this only made his centrist turnabout even more evident. The more Comrade Koskai turned to broad theoretical generalizations to justify his position in the Prussian voting rights struggle, the more he lost sight of the general perspective of the development of the class struggle in Western Europe and in Germany, which in previous years he never tired of pointing out. Indeed, he himself had an uncomfortable sense of his present viewpoints in congruence with his earlier one, and was therefore good enough to completely reproduce his 1904 article series Revolutionary Questions in the NAL, third part of his reply to me. The crass contradiction is not thereby done away with, it has only resulted in the chaotic, ickering character of that article's last part, which so remarkably lessens one's pleasure in reading it. 21. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Revolutionary questions. I considerations against the consequences of a proletarian regime. The criticism that comrade Louis Nia offered of my two brochures dealing with the social revolution is, in some respects, a welcome occasion to complete what I said there and to correct some mistaken opinions that have been expressed regarding those writings. 22 people have put into them conceptions that are not mine, especially in the second part, on the day after the social revolution. I refrain here from answering the criticisms leveled at them by people like Mr. Von Bulow 23 and other bourgeois elements, who carry around our green guidebook Baedecker for travels to Utopia and complain that, in spite of that fact, they have been unable to end their way to our state of the future. Whoever does not feel at home in the Swiss mountains will be unable to climb a high summit even if he carries his travel guide. Instead, he will probably break his neck. In the same way, a member of the bourgeois classes will be unable to understand our views of the future if he doesn't feel at home in our entire literature. There is no Nuremberg Funnel 24 for journalists, members of parliament, and state chancellors that will allow them to speak with authority about socialism without having studied its fundamental works, and I have no intention of providing them with one. The following statements are therefore directed only against those critical considerations that have been voiced about my brochures in party circles. Many people saw in them a utopia, 
the construction of a socialist state of the future, whose model I built for future generations. But I had no intention of prescribing rules of conduct for a time that will see all social issues much more clearly than the sharpest seer can do today, for it will have at its disposal the experiences of the entire period from today to the epoch of the revolution. My intention when I wrote the brochures was very practical. I wanted to intervene in the struggles that have taken place in our ranks during recent years. I don't see in the antagonism between revisionism and consistent or orthodox Marxism any contradiction between pessimism and optimism, or between the expectation of a slow or a rapid pace of development, or between far-sighted theory and practical routine work. One can, indeed, endy a bit of all this in the great antagonism, but that is not what denies it historically. The antagonism arises from our historical situation. It is a product of the advance of social democracy, which in most of Europe has overcome the RST stage of a revolutionary party's growth, when it has to struggle in order for its existence to be tolerated. Social democracy has become a force. And that fact now raises the great question, should we remain a powerless party, as we have been until now, or does this new position of strength impose upon us new aims and new tactics? Until now we have said that we could emancipate the proletariat only through the conquest of political power. Should we also let that basic principle be our guide in the future? That would mean entering the practical struggle for political power when we have become so strong that our striving for power cannot be regarded any longer as purely platonic. But if we have become strong enough to claim political power in theoretical terms, we are still not strong enough to conquer it in practice. This is an extremely difficult situation. Is there no means to escape from it by renouncing the struggle for political power? Can one not, perhaps, manage without it? And will we not nally reach practical results more quickly if we tee into the existing state organism as one of the government parties and thereby share in the bane ts it can offer instead of eating the dry bread of opposition until the day of the revolution? That is revisionism's line of reasoning. Against it I attempted to show in the RST part of my brochures that the proletariat cannot emancipate itself without the conquest of political power, all the practical results that have been reached by means of social reforms and the organization of the proletariat make it more tea for the struggle but do not attenuate its antagonism towards the capitalist class, which instead grows continuously until those classes clash in a decisive battle for political power. In the second part, I tried to show that wherever the proletariat has conquered political power, socialist production follows as a natural necessity even where the proletariat has not arrived at a socialist consciousness. Its class interests and economic necessity force it to adopt measures that lead to socialist production. The conquest of political power, that is the alpha and the omega of both brochures, without the possession of state power, we cannot advance in the abolition of classes and class interests, if the proletariat has political power, then socialism follows as a matter of necessity. To prove that was the task of my brochures. If they have succeeded in doing so, they have accomplished a highly topical task. That has also been noticed by the revisionists, for that reason their criticism has been dismissive enough, and from their point of view rightly so. To be sure, their dismissal is in many cases instinctive, it is not always based on a clear understanding. For instance, a contributor to the Munchener Post commented in its panegyric on the brochure of Steinigan's 25 that it pursues. Always the same method, to reveal Koskai's contradictions by means of facts, in which task he does not lack a sense of humor at the right opportunity. Thus, for instance, he lets Koskai refute himself by pointing out that the reformist proposals in On the Day After the Social Revolution are nothing but what the revisionists of ill repute actually already want now, a social transformation. It is certainly nice of the revisionists to accept completely my reformist proposals, expropriation of the capitalist class, reduction of the hours of work to VE hours a day with the simultaneous doubling, even tripling, of wages, etc and the fact that they do not want to wait for the revolution but want to have all that at this stage proves clearly that the revisionists are actually more radical than I am. However, 
They not only want these good things at this stage but also earnestly believe that they can achieve them before the revolution and therefore under a bourgeois government. That is truly the most humorous self-refutation of my remarks and the most devastating revelation of my contradictions by the facts that has ever fallen to my lot. More serious is the criticism that Louis Nia leveled at the second part of my book. But it also proceeds from the erroneous assumption that my book should have developed the revolutionary program of social democracy and stated the demands that our party intends to implement after victory. In this regard, it compares the comments of my brochures with the revolutionary program of the Communist Manifesto. But I had not the slightest intention of delineating a program of that character. What social democracy wants it has already explained in its program. The way in which it will succeed in carrying out its demands as soon as it seizes state power is partially given there too. Until that happens, the realization of its demands depends on a series of factors that are today still impossible to recognize and about which it would be idle to ruminate and speculate. As I already mentioned, what I wanted to point out was something completely different. I wanted to examine what consequences necessarily follow from the political rule of the proletariat by virtue of its class interests and the necessities of production, whatever the theoretical convictions prevailing at the moment of its victory. I also abstracted from any inions of socialist ideas on the proletariat. I expressly placed at the beginning of my investigation the question, what will the triumphant proletariat begin to do once it seizes power? Not how it would begin upon the grounds of this or that theory or opinion, but how it must begin, driven thereto by its class interests and the compulsion of economic necessity. 26 However, it seems that I did not make my intentions sufficiently clear because almost all my critics are astonished by them. Some of them, like Gaylord Wilshire in his monthly, 27 were even disappointed or indignant because, for instance, I place in the forefront of economic transformations the need for the triumphant proletariat to undertake, whatever the circumstances, not socialization of the means of production but rather adequate unemployment relief, which entails that socialization. They have evidently overlooked the fact that I myself said, it is well recognized that the social democrats when they came into control would strive consciously for this solution, the socialization of the means of production. Dot. 28 But my objective was not to elaborate what social democracy wants, I assumed that to be known. I wanted to show that a triumphant proletariat, even when it does not have a socialist consciousness, will be forced by the logic of the facts to make arrangements that will lead to socialism. In order to provide a basis for my assumption of a non-socialist proletariat I had to go outside the sphere of the German, Latin and Slavic proletarian movements. Only the Anglo-Saxons offered me some foundation for my presuppositions. To be sure, it is unlikely that a non-socialist proletariat may conquer political power, for how can the proletariat seize power without coming into collision with the bourgeois parties, and how can it get rid of bourgeois conceptions without acquiring a socialist consciousness? However, let us suppose that we have in England a non-socialist, radical Labour Party, something along the Australian pattern, and that it wins a majority in the parliamentary elections, whereupon the bourgeois parties immediately and offhandedly abdicate. In short, historical development takes place in such a way that Messrs. Barth and Nauman 29 cannot raise the slightest objection against it. What will the new regime be forced to do before anything else? Surely, it must give adequate support to the unemployed. That cannot be denied by anyone with any knowledge of the English worker. Being foreign to all theory, the English worker is interested only in the most immediate demands and usually even in a single demand. Recognizing the situation, for two decades, English socialists have already striven to win over the workers to socialism through practical policy, i.e. by raising one or the other particular demand. But neither political demands such as the general suffrage and abolition of the House of Lords, nor economic ones, such as nationalization of the railways and mines, nor even the legal eight-hour workday, were able to shake the English worker out of his political lethargy. Only once, in the years 1885 to 1890, 
did socialism win sine cant unions over the proletariat of England. It was a period of high unemployment when socialists stood at the forefront of the struggle for national and municipal relief for the unemployed. It is also noteworthy that Gaylord Wilshire, in America, expected conversion of the mass of the workers to socialism as a result of the growth of unemployment, which had to result from the crisis that was incipient there. Unemployment, that is the frightful lash that must whip even the most thoughtless worker into bitter opposition to the present regime when his energy is not completely consumed, for the present regime proves to be absolutely incapable, even unwilling, to ght energetically against unemployment. And if unemployment hits the unorganist, badly paid workers the hardest, there is an intimate connection between lack of organization and low wages, it also threatens the unionized workers, even the unions themselves, with heavy sacri CES. No trade union can pay an amount even approximately approaching a full wage as unemployment relief, none can support the unemployed beyond a certain period, all are forced to increase substantially the workers' dues with the growth of unemployment. And, in this way, high unemployment threatens to break the union's power of resistance vis a vis the bosses. The struggle against emergency situations caused by unemployment is therefore the point where even the repolitish worker, who does not see beyond the most immediate tasks, gets rid of bourgeois conceptions and goes beyond the boundaries of bourgeois society, which can and will do nothing in earnest to relieve him of this distress. We must be content that a triumphant proletariat, even if it is still averse to any socialism, will exert itself to the utmost in order to provide adequate unemployment relief. Louis Nia eventually comes to the same conclusion when he declares. On the day after the conquest of political power the party of the proletariat must carry out one task unconditionally and immediately, the abolition of misery and the guarantee of a minimum of existence to those who cannot work, such as the invalids. That is also my opinion. When Louis Nia remarks polemically against me that it is impossible to abolish unemployment as long as production is not organized by the state, and that this organization must precede the abolition of unemployment, I agree with him totally. But in the section under consideration I spoke about adequate support to the unemployed, not about the abolition of unemployment. Those are two completely different things. Support for the economically active unemployed can only exist as long as it is impossible to abolish unemployment. Satisfactory state support for the unemployed, even if implemented by a triumphant proletariat, seems, when considered on its own, perfectly innocent and totally compatible with bourgeois society. But the bourgeois parties know very well why they do not implement it, because it has far-reaching consequences. If every unemployed person were guaranteed a minimum living wage, every strike would be irresistible and the workers would be the true masters of the factory. Therewith, however, private property in the means of production would lose all meaning for the capitalist, it would burden him with the responsibility and risk of his enterprise without granting him the possibility of controlling and exploiting it. Socialization of the means of production would be a necessity that the capitalists, under these conditions, would perhaps feel even more strongly than the workers. Continuation of production on capitalist foundations would then be impossible. But adequate support for the unemployed has yet another consequence. If the unemployed were guaranteed a minimum living wage, that would cause a considerable rise in wages and a reduction in hours of work if the workers are to have sufficient incentive to ensure the continuation of production. At present wages generally rise but little above the minimum living wage if they rise at all. More frequently they coincide with it, and sometimes they even drop below it. Continuation of production with adequate support for the unemployed thus requires not only socialization of the means of production but also a considerable rise in the present wages with a simultaneous reduction of working hours. But that is only possible if outmoded and inefficient small businesses are abandoned as rapidly as possible and production is concentrated in the most efficient enterprises in every branch where large-scale production is technically possible. If a certain development of large-scale businesses is a precondition for rule of the proletariat, this rule must, in turn, lead to the complete replacement of small-scale enterprises in most areas of production. 
we thus see that the foundations of socialist production must follow naturally from the political rule of the proletariat even if the triumphant proletariat itself has not yet attained a clear socialist consciousness. The only difference would be that after numerous experiments and under the compulsion of necessity, perhaps even of hardship, it would indirectly reach the point that a social democratic regime would have aimed for at the outset. Louis Nier raises a series of considerations against the necessary rise in wages. I believe that such an increase is only possible with a considerable growth of production. It seems to me that the most effective means to achieve this growth is abandonment of the numerous irrational, inadequately equipped enterprises and concentration of the workers in the best equipped and most productive enterprises, where two or three times the current number of workers can be employed with a corresponding change in shifts, without night work and with a sine cant reduction in the hours of work. Opposing this argument, Louis Nia asks RST of all, how would such a concentration, such a transfer of millions of workers to a small number of great factories, be feasible in practice? He refers to my example of the concentration of textile production from the 200,000 enterprises it presently involves into 3,000 great enterprises and remarks. The 3,000 great textile factories are located in a much smaller number of places than the total number of enterprises of that industry. What an enormous and complicated problem of transportation and housing. We are talking about many hundreds of thousands for the textile industry alone. Undoubtedly, we face a problem. However, Louis Nia does not want to assert that it is an unsolvable problem. If one considers what masses capitalism even today sets in motion every year, if one thinks about the migratory workers, the inux of Polish workers to the coal mines of western Germany, the emigration, etc., then the problem raised by Louis Nia loses much of its enormity. One must also keep in mind that large-scale and small-scale enterprises of the same branch of production often coexist in the same region, so that in those places the workers of the small businesses can reach the large ones without great migrations. For instance, in Royce Alter Erlini 30 we nd in the textile industry, within 300 square kilometers, 44 per center of the workers, 5,371 out of 12,165, in the 20 largest enterprises with more than 200 workers, 33.4%, 4,061, in 39 enterprises with 50 to 200 workers, and 22.5%, 2,733, in 956 small enterprises. Within that small state, it would be neither a formidable nor a complicated transportation and housing problem. To concentrate the 56 per center of the workers, 6,794, of the 995 enterprises with fewer than 200 persons in the 20 largest enterprises. The lion's share of these enterprises is in wool weaving. They comprise nine large enterprises, over 200 workers, with 3,366 workers, 32 medium-sized enterprises, 50 to 200 workers, with 3,406 workers, and 421 small enterprises with 1,843 workers. In a similar way, in most industrial areas small-scale and large-scale enterprises are intermixed, so that one can often transfer the workers of the RST category to the second without more ado. At any rate, a large number of the workers in the most backward enterprises can be absorbed without difficulty by the more advanced ones, and that would immediately mean a considerable increase in labor productivity. The more distant workers of the backward enterprises could certainly be recruited gradually into the most rational ones as soon as housing units were built for them in the proximity to the latter. Louis Nia's objections, therefore, do not prove that a rapid growth of labor productivity is impossible in the ways I adduced. They only show that this growth will be most rapid and extensive, all other conditions being equal, the closer the workers of the small, backward enterprises reside to the large, more advanced enterprises, and the more the different categories of enterprises are concentrated in a few industrial centers. That economic development continuously requires this concentration is well known. 31. 
the more the industrial population concentrates, the easier it is to transfer it from a series of establishments to others in the same branch of production, and the more insignificant become the apparently enormous housing and transportation problems pointed out by comrade Louis Nia. But he offers an even more substantial consideration against the increase in labor productivity. Even if such an immediate increase in production were possible, that would only bring about an increase in wages. In those branches of production where consumption can double in reality, in the RST place in the production of foodstuffs, where precisely the method of concentration can only be applied to a limited extent. As far as the textile industry is concerned, the consumption of its products can indeed increase, but whether a production twice as great as the present one can be consumed, especially in the countryside, seems to me doubtful. So to produce a rise in wages the amount of textile exports must grow, which is also true of other branches of production. But Koskai does not refer to the question of foreign trade. Again, there is problem here, but not where Louis Nia is looking for it. Suppose the productivity of labor in the textile industry doubles as a result of the concentration of workers in the most advanced enterprises. Would consumption of textile products double as well? Very probably that would not be the case. The mass of the population even today does not lack clothes, to mention only the category of textile products that is undoubtedly most important. The clothing problem often lies in the poor quality of the fabrics consumed rather than in an insufficient quantity. A rise in wages will therefore probably produce not so much an increase in the demand for textile products as an increase in demand for high-quality products and a simultaneous decrease in demand for shoddy articles. Since good fabrics last considerably longer than trashy ones, and since the arty chale stimulation of fashion by private entrepreneurs will disappear in a socialist society, causing fashion to change less rapidly, it is very possible, indeed that consumption of clothing fabrics will not keep pace with a doubling in the productivity of labor. Under these circumstances, the growth of labor productivity would entail reduction of the number of workers in that branch of production. The situation must not be very different with the production of foodstuffs, assuming that the community will produce most of its foodstuffs itself, which, even for Germany, would only be possible, without changing the mode of production, if it became a single economic area with Austria. But there is no doubt that, apart from the poorest of the poor, the masses of the population already ll their stomachs now, even if they have long been inadequately nourished. Likewise in this case, a rise in wages would cause a change less in the quantity than in the quality of foodstuffs consumed. The demand for potatoes and turnips would decline, that for rye and wheat would rise. Simultaneously the demand for horses would drop as a consequence of abolishing the standing army, reducing the number of private luxury vehicles, introducing electric engines in agriculture, etc. For this reason, the cultivation of oats would also decline. In contrast, the demand for milk and meat products would increase. Whether all these and similar changes in consumption will increase the manpower employed in agriculture, especially with the advancing application of machines, remains an open question. On the other hand, a good deal of additional manpower will be required for the construction industry. The living conditions of the masses of the population are today much worse than their food and dress. Even the aristocrats of labor are quite resentful about that. There are few wage workers, even petty bourgeois and small peasants, whose housing corresponds to the demands of modern culture or even of the most primitive hygiene. And living conditions under the capitalist mode of production worsen constantly, not only in relative but also in absolute terms. To end rapid relief from this situation is one of the most important tasks of a proletarian regime. To that should be added the housing problems caused by local displacements of population. We have seen that the new regime must strive to concentrate workers in the best organized enterprises. Alternatively, it must attempt to transfer industry to the countryside or to the small towns and to distribute the population uniformly over the entire territory of the state in order to abolish both the physical degradation generated by the great cities and the mental atrophy resulting from peasant isolation. To this should be added the growing need for public buildings, 
schools, hospitals, theaters, resulting from a proletarian regime. This must generate enormous building activity, and since precisely in that area the machine often does not prevail, the demand for workers must grow considerably. These few examples are enough to show that, in general, a change in the mode of production must also cause a change in consumption habits, which in turn must react back on production. The relations between the different branches of production will shift considerably, and great changes will be necessary in the number of workers employed in particular branches. That is surely a major problem that will present numerous difficulties, but denightly not those stressed by Louis Nia. He argues that wages can be doubled, with the corresponding increase in labor productivity, only in those branches of production where domestic consumption or else exports can be doubled. That would be correct if the workers of each enterprise were not paid with money, i.e., with vouchers for some of the products of the social production process, but instead with their own production, if the number of workers in each branch of production were XED and immutable. And if labor productivity had to increase to the same degree in each branch of production. The rise of wages in a socialist society will be determined by the growth of labor productivity in general, not in each particular case. It may happen that through concentration of production in the most efficient enterprises labor productivity will multiply tenfold in many branches, for instance in the footwear industry, while in others it will remain unchanged, for instance in the building industry, in the narrow sense. But, if average labor productivity grows, wages in all branches of production could be increased accordingly, those of the construction workers as much as those of the footwear workers. The productivity of labor varies enormously in particular branches of industry, in one place, production is still carried on by hand, while elsewhere workers produce a thousand times more with machines. In other branches, the product can only be manufactured from the outset with the help of machines. But wages always show a tendency to equalization, much like wants and living standards within a social class. The level of wages, when it exceeds bare subsistence, is a product of social circumstances as a whole, and therefore the wage level in each particular branch of production also depends on the productivity of society as a whole, not of the branches of production in question. Deviations from the average wage level among a particular stratum of workers are caused partly by special costs of production of their labor power, training, partly by the special living standards of the social stratum from which they are recruited, partly by exceptional conditions of supply and demand, etc., but they never stand in any relation to the species C productivity of their own labor. And there is no reason why that should change in a socialist society. Therefore, Louis Nia's objection that the rise in wages would end its limits in the impossibility of increasing consumption is invalid. The consumption of products of particular branches of production can have its natural limits beyond which it may not advance. But the needs of mankind, and therefore its consumption capacity, are in general unlimited, they grow with the productivity of labor. This fact was already recognized by the classical political economists, who believed they could conclude from it that overproduction was impossible. That is not true for capitalist society, whose consumption is determined not by needs but by the aggregate purchasing. Power of consumers But it does hold true for a socialist society, where general overproduction would be impossible and where, to the extent that labor productivity increases, new needs would be added to the old ones. But to refute the idea that a doubling or tripling of wages must founder on the impossibility of increasing consumption accordingly, it is not necessary to refer to some newly acquired need. The tripling of the average wage with constant prices would for the RST time bring the average living standard of the workers to approximately the level that today characterizes a modest bourgeois existence. It would only offer the possibility of satisfying in one way or the other needs that proletarians are already experiencing it would still offer no inducement for extravagances. From whatever angle Louis Nia's considerations are viewed, they prove to be unsound. I know of no other considerations that weigh against the consequences of a proletarian regime as set out in On the Day After the Social Revolution. Two Revolutionary Centers 
the considerations against unemployment relief and the rapid increase of production are just subsidiary matters for Louis Nia. The most serious fault of my brochure seems to him to be the complete overlooking of the Polish question. How can someone speak about the revolution and say nothing about Poland? Comrade Wilshire, on the other hand, reproaches me for behaving as if the United States didn't exist. Each reproach nully es the other. I could not include Poland in an analysis of the revolution in the United States or America in a presentation of the Polish question. But I never had the intention of dealing with either of those countries because that would not have corresponded with the aims of my writing. What I attempted to do was to analyze the problems of the future that are vital for our present work as well as the ways to solve them insofar as they are accessible to scientific analysis. I did not want to slip back from the scientific into the utopian point of view, i.e., I wanted to guard myself against the danger of describing desirable scenarios rather than pointing out discernible and necessary processes. Therefore, I had to limit my analysis to the simplest tendencies, common to all the capitalist nations, and their consequences. Only they can be distinguished with any degree of accuracy over a long period of time from the facts already at hand. By contrast, if we go beyond them to the concrete forms that the trend of development assumes in particular nations, we then come across such complicated phenomena that it is impossible to foresee with any degree of accuracy, even for the immediate future, which results the interaction of the innumerable factors under consideration will yield. In springtime I can say with complete security that at the end of the year there will again come another winter. But I can only forecast with a certain degree of probability the weather of the following day, even if I am a very learned and experienced meteorologist and well acquainted with the latest meteorological data. It is impossible for me to forecast the weather of the coming months. Something similar happens with politics. If I nd that class contradictions are becoming more acute in all the capitalist countries, that the proletariat cannot emancipate itself without conquering political power, that this conquest, regardless of all the purposes and aspirations by which it may be accompanied, leads necessarily to the development of socialist production, I do no overstep the boundaries of scientific analysis. Naturally, that still doesn't prove that these conclusions are correct, that depends on the correctness of the method and the observations by means of which they were obtained. But the possibility does exist of reaching a scientically grounded conclusion concerning these questions. That possibility diminishes the more we engage in analysis of the special development of particular nations. Each nation follows a different course of development, stands at a different stage, is enhanced by its neighbors, etc. If the general tendency of development in all nations is and must be the same, the particular course of development followed by each nation is different, and each faces the most diverse eventualities. That doesn't prove that we don't have to concern ourselves with these questions and that we can gain no insight into them. Every politician who does not simply drift with events but rather exerts a determining inyance upon them must attempt to take stock of the probabilities and alternatives of the special course of development of the nation in which he operates, his work will only succeed if his aspirations go in the same direction as this particular developmental path which is just as necessary as the general tendency of development of all nations even though this necessity is not so easily discernible. Nothing is more baleful than to sneer. At every far-sighted policy, at each prediction, as the fanatics of present-day politics and exclusively routine work are so gladly doing today. The practical politician, if he wants to be successful, must attempt to see into the future just like the theoretical socialist. Whether this foresight assumes the form of a prophecy will depend on his temperament. But he must, at the same time, always be prepared for the appearance of unexpected factors, which will frustrate his plans and impart a new direction to development, and he must therefore always be ready to change his tactic accordingly. To analyze the general tendency of the impending social and political development in capitalist society and the special course of development of particular lands, these are two totally different tasks. Study of the latter presupposes solution of the former. Therefore, any attempt to mix the two and perform both tasks simultaneously can only lead to confusion. 
That is why my chapter on the forms and weapons of social revolution, 32 as Louis Nia put it, is fragmentary, and gives the impression of indecision, of diptance, which is unusual in Koskai. He is totally mistaken when he thinks he detects here the latent inions of the continuing and yet to be overcome condition of the proletarian movement, in which one can think about the revolution, about the decisive struggle, only reluctantly and with anxiety. Analysis of the questions raised by Louis Nia was beyond the framework of my writing, but I have no reason to avoid them. It can do no harm if one occasionally deals with them. But one must not forget that in doing so we are no longer dealing with developmental tendencies that can be identified as necessary, only with those that are contingent and more or less probable. Louis Nia seems to assume that the Polish question is necessarily given in any revolution and, furthermore, that it is always posed in the same terms. His position on this issue is that of early democracy, formerly defended also by Marx, Engels and Liebknecht, according to which a revolution in Western Europe would face a reactionary Russia. The RST task of any revolution was therefore to paralyze Russia, which could be done best by establishing an independent Poland. The restoration of Poland and the European Revolution. Thus implied each other, they were inseparably connected, and each Polish patriot was also a gear in the European Revolutionary Army. This conception was self-evident and necessary as long as there was no revolutionary Russia and no Gding proletariat in Poland. The emergence of the latter has substantially cooled off the enthusiasm of most of the non-proletarian classes of Poland for the European Revolution. On the other hand, strengthening of the revolutionary movement in Russia has opened up the possibility of giving battle to Tsarism on its own terrain, and for this reason the possibility that Russian absolutism could again, as in 1848, strangle a Western European revolution has simultaneously diminished dramatically. Today, Tsarism resists the assault of its beloved subjects only with difficulty and thanks to the support of West European capitalists. If a victorious revolution in the West puts the proletariat in power instead of those capitalists, then support for autocracy will not only vanish but be replaced by vigorous support for the revolutionary opponents of Tsarism then absolutism must irremediably collapse, if it does not meet that fate even earlier. What need would there be then of restoring Poland in order to save the revolutionary cause? Consequently, the Polish question today has an entirely different sine cans from what it did a generation ago. Socialism, even democracy, includes the principle of popular sovereignty, of the self-determination and independence of each people. It goes without saying that a victorious European revolution would provide the impulse for establishment of an independent Polish Republic. But, for the revolutionary cause, that is no more important than any other national question that the bourgeois regime bequeaths to the proletarian one, such as, for instance, the creation of a Czech national state augmented by Slovaks, the union of the Serbs in a single state, or the union of Trentino with Italy. To be sure, German social democracy has no less reason to strive for a friendly understanding with the Polish comrades on this account. It must pay attention not only to their national feelings but also to their national susceptibilities. It is characteristic of small, dismembered nations, whose very existence is under threat, to go beyond national feelings and to develop a certain national oversensitivity even among proletarians, who readily see oppression even in circumstances where, with full equality of rights, it is merely a question of the preponderance of the majority over the minority. Unpleasant situations sometimes result, but the proletariat of a nation as great and solid as the German one should go beyond theoretical imperatives and show, according to the principle of noblesse oblige, some indulgence for the national susceptibilities of its weaker and more oppressed neighbors, though certainly it should not go so far as to let them interfere with the unity of organization and action. However, the exceptional position that the Poles occupied as the protective barrier of the revolution vis a vis Russia no longer exists, and with it has disappeared every reason for including the Polish question in a general analysis of the coming revolution. But there is also a further reason why the Polish question falls beyond the scope of my brochure. 
Louis Nia's remarks on the topic spring from the assumption that the next revolution will have its starting point in Germany, maybe especially in Berlin. That is surely not impossible, but it is only one of numerous possibilities and not the most probable among them. Today, at any rate, a whole series of states stand closer to the revolution than Germany despite the rapidity of its economic development and the growth of its social democracy. The German government is today the strongest in the world. It has at its disposal the strongest, most disciplined army and bureaucracy, and it faces a population that is prosaic and peaceful and lacks any revolutionary tradition. Of course, one can also imagine in Germany a government that mismanages the country to the point of disorganizing the army and the bureaucracy, and of driving the masses to desperation while at the same time embroiling the country in useless and costly, perhaps even humiliating adventures, those would be factors that could drive even the German people to rebellion. Rudiments of such a situation can already be found, occasioned by the growing greediness and distress of the bankrupt junkers, the growing fear of rising social democracy, the sharpening of class contradictions between capital and labor, as well as the growth of imperialism in all nations, and with it the growing danger of military conists. But those rudiments would have to grow considerably for the German people to take the initiative in the next revolution. Its eastern neighbor is much closer to revolution than Germany. Louis Nia warns us not to overestimate the revolutionary force of the Russian proletariat, but one must also not underestimate it. Louis Nia should be especially wary of that danger because the presupposition of his views on the Polish question is an unshakable, vigorous Russian absolutism, and they would be untenable without it. There is no doubt that the economic development of Russia lags far behind that of Germany or England or that its proletariat is much weaker and less mature than the German or the English. But all things are relative, including the revolutionary power of a class. More than anywhere else the proletariat in Russia today is the advocate of vital interests of the whole nation so that in its struggle against the government it faces almost no opposition from other classes. On the other hand, in the whole of Europe there is no weaker government than the Russian, with the possible exception of Turkey, because it has no support in the state other than a thoroughly corrupt bureaucracy and an army that already shows signs of disorganization and discontent. There is no other government whose conditions of existence stand in more irreconcilable contradiction with the living conditions of the nation or whose moral and economic bankruptcy is more evident. Until the 1880s, Russian absolutism found its remittest support in a vigorous peasantry. This support no longer exists, the Russian peasant is ruined, starved, or rebellious. Tsarism avoided impending bankruptcy with the help of West European capital, which enabled it to develop, as if in a hothouse, an expanding large-scale industry. Now this industry is collapsing and, instead of providing absolutism with rich revenues, it confronts it with a revolutionary proletariat. The Russian workers plunge into the struggle undaunted by death because they end themselves in a state in which they have nothing to lose but their chains. The more completely Western Europe withholds help from absolutism, the sooner it will be overthrown. To bring this about, to discredit Tsarism as much as possible, is today the most important work of international social democracy and socialists everywhere have grasped this fact. How they see to it in each country must depend on particular conditions. But whether one stigmatizes Tsarist barbarism in popular assemblies, as our comrades in Vienna did during the latest visit of the Tsar, or chases its representatives back into their hiding places by threatening to jeer them, as our Italian comrades managed to do, or whether one declares war against it in Parliament, as Babel succeeded so stunningly in doing during the budget debate, everywhere the comrades have done their duty according to their situation, with the exception of the ministerial. Socialists of France Meanwhile, despite all his valuable friendships in Western Europe, the autocrat of the Russias grows visibly less powerful. The war with Japan may greatly hasten the progress of the Russian Revolution if it does not result in a quick and mighty victory of the Russian army. Even in the case of a decisive Russian victory, absolutism can be badly hurt and become totally exhausted if the war should last, for example, as long as the Boer War. 
33. What took place after the Russo-Turkish War 34 will be repeated on a broader scale, a great R up of the revolutionary movement. Not only is the government weaker and the revolutionary movement stronger than they were then, the war against Turkey to liberate the Slavic brothers was popular, it was a struggle for freedom against the barbarians, at least that was the illusion of the combatants and initially served to enhance the Russian government's prestige at home. The war against Japan is an entirely different case, it is a war against a freer and more highly developed country in whose defeat the Russian people does not have the slightest interest. That can be seen clearly if one compares the war fever that raged through Russia in 1875, when the uprising in Bosnia and Herzegovina broke out, and that lasted until the declaration of war in 1877, with the indifference with which, even a few weeks ago, the threatening war was received in Russia as contrasted with Japan. A revolution in Russia cannot establish a socialist regime at once. The economic conditions of the country are not sufficiently developed for that. The best it can do is to bring about a democratic government behind which would be a strong, impetuous and progressive proletariat that would be able to demand important concessions. Such a regime would react powerfully upon the neighboring countries of Russia RST, by reviving and inspiring the proletarian movement itself, thereby giving it the impulse to attack the political obstacles to real democracy, in Prussia, for example, primarily the three-class electoral system, secondly, through releasing the manifold national questions of Eastern Europe. It seems beyond any doubt to me that a Russian revolution must revive panslavism in a new form. In its previous form panslavism is pretty decrepit. It was a revolutionary means towards reactionary ends, to spur on the Slavic peoples of Austria and Turkey to rebellion in order to conquer, as those peoples fancied, their national independence under Russian leadership, but, in actual fact, in order to extend the domain of Russian despotism. But the times are past when reactionary governments were allowed to play with impunity with the revolutionary liberation struggles of the peoples, when Napoleon conspired with Kossuth, 1859, Bismarck organized a Hungarian legion against the Habsburg regime and met halfway the revolutionary aspirations of the Czechs, 1866, 35 Rieger went on a pilgrimage to Moscow as an agent of panslavism, 1868, and General Ignatieff, as Russian envoy in Constantinople, could arrange the overthrow of the Turkish Empire according to all the rules of conspiracy, 1864-77. Since then, governments everywhere have grown more cautious and apprehensive. The government of a capitalist country only still dares to use revolutionary methods to serve its needs in places like South Africa or Central America. The Russian government is no exception to this rule. The rebellious Macedonians of 1903 totally deceived themselves when they thought that the Tsar would help them as much as he helped the Bosnians and Bulgarians three decades earlier. On the other hand, the situation in Russia has become so desperate that, at least among the Slavs of Austria, the longing for union with the Russians, which during the reform era of Alexander II was very strong, has disappeared completely. Thus the roots of panslavism have withered from both sides. A democratic Russia must tremendously rekindle the aspiration for national independence among of the Slavs of Austria and Turkey, as well as their endeavors to win the help of the great Russian people for that purpose. The Polish question will also become acute again, but not the way Louis Nia thinks. The Poles will point their bayonets not against Russia but against Austria and Prussia, and to the extent that Poland serves the revolution, it will become a means not to defend the revolution against Russia but to carry it to Austria and Prussia. Austria will then burst open, because the collapse of Tsarism will disintegrate the iron ring that to this very day keeps together the disparate elements of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. If that happens, the German Empire will be forced to include the German inhabited regions of the Habsburg monarchy in its own territory insofar as they constitute a cohesive whole. That will completely change the character of the German Empire. Today, roughly 35 million Prussians confront only 22 million non-Prussians. Inclusion of the German Austrians will make Prussians and non-Prussians approximately equal in strength, 
especially after the Prussian Poles, presently 3 million strong, are deducted from the non-Prussians. Such a proportion would raise the danger of a strengthened opposition of the South against the North, a reinforcement of particularism, and a weakening of the unity of the German Empire if it were to continue as a union of autonomous states. It would then be urgently necessary to complete the job neglected in 1870, to turn the federative state into a unitary one. The solution of the Polish question would thus be greatly facilitated because retention of the Prussian Poles in the current state federation serves the interests of a special Prussian state, not of the German people. The Russian Revolution, then, must impart a powerful impulse to proletarian movements in the rest of Europe and put the question of national unity once again on the agenda, not just in Austria and the Balkan countries but also in Germany itself in order to provide it with a definitive solution. Social democracy would then have to prove itself as the advocate not only of a new social order but also of a new national and territorial order, the advocate not only of proletarian class interests but also of general national interests towards which the other classes, which have grown conservative or fearful, will adopt either a passive or a directly hostile attitude. Couldn't those struggles possibly result in the rule of the proletariat in Germany? That, however, would have repercussions on the whole of Europe. The political rule of the proletariat in Western Europe would offer to the proletariat of Eastern Europe the possibility of shortening the stages of its development and Artie Chaley introducing socialist arrangements by imitating the German example. Society as a whole cannot Artie Chaley leap over particular stages of development, but the backward development of some of its particular constituent parts can indeed be accelerated by the proximity of more advanced parts. They may even come to the forefront because they are not hindered by the ballast of traditions that the older nations have to drag along. The most brilliant example of that rule is America, which leaped over the stages of feudalism and absolutism and was spared the grueling struggles against them as well as the burden of their ruins. That can happen. But as we already said, we have gone beyond the eld of discernible necessity and are at present considering only possibilities. History could also follow a completely different course. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. After Russia, Belgium seems closest to the revolution at present. The industrial proletariat is exceptionally strong there, and the conservative peasantry rather weak. 36. This social strait I Katayan is accompanied by political circumstances favorable to the revolution. Thanks to a franchise bias towards the propertied classes, the government is extremely reactionary, causing it to come into growing contradiction not only with the proletariat but also with the common interests of the nation. Wide circles of the people hate and despise the king. The army, thanks to a draft system that allows sending substitutes, is essentially recruited only among the propertyless classes, discontent is rife, and the troops are prone to mutinies. If a tense situation for the government were to coincide with AR up of popular anger, it would be enough to reduce the area ruled by Leopold and his successor to the Congo. Sure enough, a proletarian revolution limited to Belgium could not maintain itself for long. For purely economic reasons, that small area, with its 7 million inhabitants, could not by itself establish a lasting socialist regime amid capitalist surroundings. Besides, it would also face more immediate political threats. A republican Belgium, ruled by the proletariat, would mean a steady revolutionary focus and a summons to proletarians of the other European countries to follow its example, which would be a source of constant ferment for lower classes of the people outside Belgium. The governments of Germany and France would have to rush to extinguish this re, from which such threatening sparks would why in the form of agrarian and industrial agitators to the amiable thatched roofs of neighboring lands. But precisely the attempt to put out the revolutionary re could lead to its generalist are up. A people that defends its liberty is not so easily subjugated, as shown by the example of both South African republics, 37 where hardly 400,000 whites, among whom there were at most 40,000 armed men, were able to offer victorious resistance to the English World Empire for so long. The Belgian army, with its 150,000 men, would be reinforced by numerous enthusiastic volunteers from abroad, 
a task in which it would be mightily helped by the labor press. Each day of resistance would strengthen the ferment in the enemy camp and increase the danger of rebellion in its ranks. But all that would hardly be enough to avert the crushing of the young republic, given the enormous superiority of the neighboring powers, if another factor were not to come to its help, the antagonism between France and Germany, which in that case would serve the cause of liberty for the RST time. Would France remain quiet if Germany defeated and occupied Belgium, or would a French army perhaps assume the role of Prussian gendarmes and march out hand in hand with the German army to strangle the Belgians? In both cases, the French government would be threatened with having to face an explosion of popular rage in which the most sublime as well as the most abject feelings, national hatred and international solidarity, petty bourgeois obstinacy and proletarian revolutionary impetus, would unite with French law to sweep away a regime that is treasonous to the people, and this would be relatively easy because in such circumstances the French army would hardly ght with enthusiasm for the government. The government of the German Empire would then declare war against France to defeat Belgium. That would not be a war like the one of 1870, a war to achieve a unity for which the nation had ardently longed for decades, a war against an impudent usurper, which with a few quick battles would carry away the popular masses in the general ush of victory. It would be a war in which nobody would be interested with the exception of a few privileged strata of adventurers because it would meet the most determined opposition from the only great class of the nation that still cherishes ideals. It would be a war destined solely to butcher a peaceful people who asked for nothing but to be left alone. It would be a war that, even if it ended in victory, would only be won after long, eventful, and costly struggles because the armies of both camps are today equipped differently from 1870 and are animated by a spirit entirely different from that of Charles Louis Napoleon's pre-Dorian guards. It would be a war that could very well mean the beginning of the end. Here the Polish question could also play a role, but again a different one from what Louis Nia expects. For its own salvation, the revolutionary regime in Belgium and France would have to strive to provide material support to all revolutionary efforts abroad in order to split its opponents' forces and increase the excitement of the popular masses. Perhaps it would attempt to carry the revolution into Holland and Italy and to stir up unrest in Russia and Austria. Encouraging Polish aspirations would, among other things, be very suitable for this purpose. But the Polish aspirations would then be a means of weakening not only Russian but also Prussian reaction. However, we have already advanced so far that if we want to analyze the possibilities of revolution we cannot limit ourselves to Europe. When Comrade Wilshire argued in his criticism of my book that the United States is closer to revolution than Europe, he was possibly right. To be sure, I cannot agree with him when he declares that the centralization of capital has already advanced so far that not only the working class but almost all the social classes see their savior in socialism and will gladly welcome it. Perhaps no other class needs socialism more than the small traders and artisans. Their prospects in capitalist society are much more dismal, for instance, than those of skilled wage workers. In present society, they are headed for decline, and very often for decline into the lumpen proletariat. Yet, for all that the small artisans and traders are often the biggest opponents of social democracy. It is from these classes that its most fanatical enemies arise, as shown by the history of anti-Semitism. Socialism would save them, but socialism is the future, an unknown future, while present-day class interests force those strata to seek salvation in increased exploitation of the poorest of the poor. They are, therefore, even more hostile than the great capitalists to every advance of the workers, every law for their protection, and every organization of the workers into trade and consumer unions. The same is true of the small capitalists in America. They are oppressed by the great monopolies, they vent their indignation against them in the strongest words, as our anti-Semites do against capital, but when it comes to business, they seek to save themselves not through suppression of the monopolists but through increased exploitation of the workers. I do not expect the triumph of socialism in America to come from capitalists crossing over to the socialist camp, that dream of Bellamy 38 can today be safely laid to rest, 
but rather from the continuous sharpening of contradictions between capital and labor that the trusts must bring to the forefront not only for themselves but for the entire capitalist class. However much the nationalization of trusts may be in the entire nation's interest, only the proletariat can actually bring it about, the struggle of other classes against them will only be a sham. The monstrous growth of trusts, the crises and unemployment, all these factors, which in America already loom larger than in Europe, could very well have the effect of making the proletariat on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean seize political power earlier than we do, perhaps not with a clear socialist program, perhaps, in conformity with Anglo-Saxon traditions, at RST being only particular phenomena of capitalism such as unemployment or the trusts. But even in that case the proletarian regime would soon be driven to adopt measures that would result in socialist organization of production. Even if we succeed in imparting an understanding of socialist theory to the thoroughly practical American workers, so that the proletarian regime would be consciously socialist from the outset, even in that case, an American revolution would have a physiognomy completely different from a European one. Not only does political power appear completely different in the United States from the way it appears among us, but the social strait I Catayan is also different. It would therefore be going too far to describe the particular American conditions in detail, they would best be described by an American writer. But whatever forms the social revolution might assume over there, it cannot leave Europe untouched. An American revolution must sinecantly strengthen the European proletariat and its drive to conquer political power. It would either lead to victory of the working class in Europe too, or if the attempt fails, to mass emigration and desolation of the old capitalist countries. We must also keep an eye on that eventuality. The world is not so purposely organized as to lead always to the triumph of the revolution where it is essential for the interest of society. When we speak of the necessity of the proletariat's victory and of socialism following from it, we do not mean that victory is inevitable or even, as many of our critics think, that it will take place automatically and with fatalistic certainty even when the revolutionary class remains idle. Necessity must be understood here in the sense of the revolution being the only possibility of further development. Where the proletariat does not succeed in defeating its opponents, society will not be able to develop further, it must either stagnate or rot. Examples of states that decayed because they needed a revolution and were not in a position to produce a revolutionary class are frequent in history. Even contemporary Europe displays such an example in Turkey. The fate of Europe will be like Turkey's if the proletariat fails to conquer political power. If, on the contrary, it were to triumph in America, all the elements of the proletariat and even the intelligentsia, those with any intelligence or energy, would ock over the ocean to the new freedom, and Europe would soon be in a position vis a vis America that would resemble, for instance, that occupied today by southern Italy vis a vis Germany. It would cease to mean anything for social development and would be interesting only for its natural sites and its libraries and ruins as witnesses of former glory. However, there is no reason for holding such dismal expectations in view of the pugnacity and ding capacity of the European proletariat, which it combines with enthusiasm and readiness for sacri ce as well as prudence and self-possession. Even the English proletariat offers no cause for pessimism. It has already accomplished so much in the 19th century, and its lethargy is so recent by historical standards that one should certainly assume it is due to exceptional and temporary circumstances, that is, to the same exceptional position in the world market that also spoiled English capital and stunted its capacity to compete. Today, when it is evident to all that the exceptional position of England belongs to the past, the helplessness and passivity of English workers should disappear as well. In the struggle for liberal free trade, the English proletariat found itself in the same camp with the bourgeoisie, conversion of the bourgeoisie to protectionism must be followed by conversion of the proletarians to socialism. One can see the multifarious problems that emerge when one begins to consider the possibilities of the coming revolution. Only one problem did not surface, the Polish question as Louis Nia sees it. Considered in these terms, it is a problem of the past.
but though our exposition has shown that the revolution can be conceived in many forms, and that many more possible forms are also conceivable because new and unexpected factors could and will probably appear, factors that no one today even considers, one thing is certain, the revolution of the future will not revert to forms and problems that already belong to the past. Perhaps all this elaborate apparatus was too lengthy simply to come to this conclusion regarding the Polish question, the same result could have been reached more easily. But I also wanted to accomplish something else with these comments. I hope this discussion will clearly show the limits of political agitation in terms of accelerating the outbreak of revolution in Germany. In all the scenarii that I presented, and they seem to me the most probable ones, Germany remains barred from taking the revolutionary initiative and revolution is brought to it from the outside. How would these perspectives be altered, for instance, by a restriction of the franchise, by curtailment of the right of assembly, or by increased persecution of the socialist press in Germany? The German proletariat cannot, after all, be degraded to Russian conditions. But the more closely German conditions resemble those in Russia, the more the situation of the German government will resemble that in Russia. The more the government comes into contradiction with general national interests, the more it must cripple economic life because free development of capitalism presupposes the freest initiative of individuals in society. Development of capitalism will be all the more restrained, the more the individuals are constricted. Police oppression is incompatible with a thriving economy under developed capitalist conditions. A regime of protracted repression against social democracy would mean the economic decline of Germany, for the supporters of such a regime would be the most reactionary classes in economic terms, the Junkers and the anti-Semitic part of the petty bourgeoisie still organized in guilds together with that part of the peasantry that constitutes their following. If one sows Russian conditions in Germany, one will reap financial bankruptcy, industrial stagnation, and corruption and disorganization of the army and the bureaucracy, in short, all the weaknesses of the Russian government and, along with them, all the desperation of the Russian nation as well as the conditions making it probable that Russia will take the initiative in the coming revolution. I do not expect, as I already said, that the next revolution will start in Germany. But if the facts give the lie to this expectation, the cause will surely be an aggressive regime of repression against social democracy. I do not consider such a perspective to be likely because conditions in Germany are already too developed in a bourgeois sense. But I also do not believe that social democracy will be allowed to develop further in the present legal conditions. I expect an expanded edition of the zigzag course, a regime that will attempt to turn the working masses away from social democracy by means of great promises without having the power to realize them, a regime that embitters them all the more, the more they trust in it. Alternatively, the regime could improvise its way from case to case, aimlessly and spasmodically, carried away by T.S. of rage and violent measures, striking hard at particular individuals or bullying the entire proletariat, but ultimately only managing to provoke the workers' indignation without breaking their strength. But I do not expect a regime that will raise this ultimately suicidal policy into a lasting system of state terror, repressing every manifestation of proletarian energy. But whatever way the ruling circles may choose, peaceful legality, Russian terrorism, or unstable vacillations between the two, they will not forestall the class struggle of the proletariat. 3. The political mass strike. 1. The armed insurrection. Among the objections that Louis Nia raised against me, one still remains to be mentioned, and that is the crucial point of his discussion that also gave the title to his article, the allegation that, without force of arms, the proletariat cannot conquer political power. I remarked. We have no reason to assume that armed insurrections with barricade battles and similar warlike occurrences can play a decisive role even today. The reasons for this have been given so often that I have no need of dwelling on them further. Militarism can only be overthrown by rendering the military itself disaffected with the rulers, not through its being defeated by popular uprisings. 39. Above all, Louis Nia criticized the fact that I did not further develop reasons for this opinion. I was astonished that he still asked for the grounds of that view. 
if they are really unknown to him, he will nd them most tersely summarized in Friedrich Engels's oft-quoted preface to Marx's class struggles in France. 40 Since that preface was written, no new points of view or new facts have emerged, and no serious attempt at refutation has been made that would induce us once again to investigate this question. I could do nothing here but plagiarize Engels. Louis Nia's own comments only serve to con R.M. Engels's point of view. He likewise has to concede that today an armed insurrection of the people against the military would be madness. If he thinks that the coming revolution will be fought with force of arms, he does not mean a struggle between the people and the military but between two fractions of the military, one of which will go over to the people's side. That is surely a scenario that could become real, but it would still only be a special form of the general postulate of the military becoming disaffected. As long as that is not the case, it does not disprove the improbability of the military being defeated by popular uprisings. But do we have reasons to spend much time examining that special form? Reactions on future problems and the means of solving them are only sine cant if they are capable of enhancing the praxis and theory of the present, i.e., if their results can affect the force and direction of our action, the success of our propaganda or the clarity of our thoughts. Since we have no intention of carrying out propaganda within the ranks of the army in order to incite them to insurrection, and nobody in the entire German social democracy thinks of doing that today, we have no need to debate the forms that such insubordination could and should assume. 41 On the other hand, it is certainly important even today, if not for our action then at least for our propaganda and theoretical conceptions, to state unambiguously that we expect nothing from an armed uprising of the people and that we will not allow ourselves to be provoked into it under any circumstances. But there is another question that is no less important and is closely connected with that one. Though it seems impossible that the people could meet the weapons of the state with the force of arms, is the possibility also precluded that the proletariat could ever use force to ward off the brute force of its opponents? Should it surrender defenselessly in the case of a coup d'etat? Does it dispose of no other political weapon than the ballot? Politically, the Gding proletariat develops most satisfactorily under a constitution such as Germany's. It does not have the slightest reason for wanting to change it illegally and by force. But, precisely for that reason, it must be all the more prepared, the more its political power grows, for the overthrow of the existing constitution by its opponents, who will attempt to set up in its place a regime of violent repression of the proletariat and destroy its organizations, a regime of force that will categorically demand energetic self-defense. It is impossible for such a regime to provoke an armed revolt of the people wherever the masses are led by social democracy. If it should nally call forth violent resistance from the proletariat, the working class could use only one forceful measure, which it often employs already in its economic struggles as the last means of forcing an issue, the strike. If, because of its evident fruitlessness, this instrument proves at the outset as objectionable as the armed insurrection, that does not prove that the cause of the proletariat is hopeless. Even then we would have no need to despair for long. Today the proletariat so represents the future and even the present vital interests of the nation, that a government cannot repress it by force without conning and crippling the entire life of the nation, a condition that must sooner or later lead to its collapse in one of those crises from which no state is spared. To be sure, in that case the future of the proletariat would be insecure and more dependent on external events than on its own force, but victory would not be impossible. But the contents of the proletariat, its energy, self-assurance and the respect of its opponents, must grow considerably if it knows that it possesses a weapon by means of which it is able to checkmate the violence of its opponents using its own forces. And in this respect the discussion concerning the political strike, or the general strike as people still somewhat mistakenly call it, is of greater topical interest than the discussion of armed insurrection. To the different kinds of strikes. However different the conclusions that individual participants in this debate may have reached so far, one thing has, in any event, been demonstrated clearly, the political strike is not a weapon that people can always employ at will as soon as the organization of the proletariat is sufficiently developed. If it is to succeed at all, 
it can only be in special conditions. But those conditions cannot be studied in the usual strikes undertaken for economic reasons because political and economic strikes are two entirely different things. In economic strikes, the workers' strength derives, on the one hand, from the necessity of the reproduction process for the capitalist and, on the other hand, from utilizing the competition between capitalists and eliminating the competition among workers. The XED capital of the manufacturers, buildings, machines, and so on, also depreciates when it is not used. Sometimes, it is directly threatened with destruction during a stoppage of production, as with mines in the event of water inlagration when the pumps are idle. Sometimes the exchange value of raw materials also declines by being stored too long, for instance, sugar beet in the renaries. But these technical reasons, which make the interruption of activity involve a loss for the capitalist, are joined by other economic ones. The annual amount of pro-TS depends not only on the degree of exploitation of the worker but also on the speed of the circulation of capital. Let us assume that, out of a capital of 2 million marks, 400,000 correspond to wages, 1,600,000 to the constant capital during a turnover, and, for the sake of greater simplicity, let us set the XED capital at zero. The rate of surplus value amounts to 100 per center and its sum in each turnover is 400,000 marks. If the capital turns over once a year, it yields a pro T of 400,000 marks. The rate of pro T therefore amounts to 400,000/2,000,000 or 20 per center. If the capital turns over twice a year, the sum of surplus value, without increasing the exploitation of the workers, will reach 800,000 marks and the rate of pro T will rise to 40 per center. The rate of exploitation remained the same, but if the number of workers did not increase, their wages also doubled like the rate of turnover as a result, for instance, of more regular and productive employment of the workers, overtime, and the cancellation of holidays. The faster the turnover of capital, the higher the pro -t. However, a standstill in activity means a prolongation of capital's turnover period. Apart from the need for the fastest possible turnover of capital, a strike also exerts pressure on capitalists because they fear competition from their peers as well as the solidarity of their workers. Almost all these factors work best on behalf of the workers in periods of prosperity. It is during those periods that capitalists seek more eagerly after. Workers, when the number of strike breakers is lowest, when contributions to the strike fund owe most abundantly, when capital can turn over most quickly, when a disruption of the reproduction process lowers pro-TS most obviously, and when it is often more pro-table to concede a rise in wages than to interrupt production. All these things are well known and are repeated only in order to illuminate the contradiction between political and economic strikes. The economic factors that contribute to the success of the workers are progressively less relevant in a mass strike the more it becomes a general strike. The general strike itself eliminates them. Suddenly the social reproduction process is completely interrupted, the manufacturer cannot dispose of his niched products or receive any raw materials. What interest could he have in getting the workers into the factory? He has no need to fear that his competitors will snatch the workers from under his nose, nor will his clients betray him since they cannot possibly end better service elsewhere. And the workers? Apart from unusually favorable circumstances, the workers of a single factory are at a disadvantage vis a vis the employer even if they are united. But if they do not succeed at the RST attempt, if they are overcome after a tenacious siege, if they are rarely victorious, the workers of a factory can turn for support to their peers in the neighboring plant, the workers of a locality to their peers in the entire state, the workers of one branch of production to all the proletariat of the country and even of the entire world. This support, with the exception of the last scenario, is impossible in the case of a general strike. True, the idea of paralysing the entire economic life of capitalist society at once, thus making it no longer tenable, is very fascinating. But one must not forget that a mass strike, so long as it lasts, 
suspends not only capitalist production but also any sort of production whatever. And the workers are even more interested in the continuation of production than the capitalists because the latter are in possession not only of the means of production but also of all the large reserves of means of consumption. The capitalists can thus endure a general stoppage of production longer than the workers, in fact, they are in a position to starve them. A national mass strike whose duration would approach, for instance, that of the Krimitschka strike, 42 is totally impossible. If it does not triumph during the RST week, then the reserves of the workers and of the petty traders who provide them with credit would be exhausted. Then they can either submit or breach the existing legal order and provide themselves with food by violent means. However, they would then leave the terrain of the economic strike, the revolution of the poor with their arms crossed, and step into that of insurrection. To be sure, even today there are strikes that cease to be purely economic and exert an indirect social and especially political pressure against a particular group of employers when direct economic pressure proves ineffective, so that the strike attains indirectly what it was unable to obtain directly. Such strikes occur particularly when some stratum of workers comes into con ICT with the great monopolies. The position of the latter is too strong for the strike to upset them, but the strike causes so much harm to different levels of society, and the exceptional position of the monopolists creates for them so many enemies in bourgeois society, that the state or the community can force them through legislation to concede the demands of the strikers in order to prevent excessive damages to society. The great strike of the Austrian coal miners in the winter of 1900 provided such an example. Economically, it was going to be lost. The coal barons could endure it calmly. But it produced so many disturbances in industry, and the super pro TS that the coal mine owners pocket year in and year out are so enormous and arouse such bitterness that they have few friends even in bourgeois circles. In order to prevent a recurrence of the strike, the Austrian Imperial Assembly was nally willing to grant the nine-hour day, at least to the coal miners. It was one of the most remarkable results of the Union of Political and Trade Union action. Each one, on its own, would have been unsuccessful. Members of the Social Democratic fraction could have talked themselves hoarse in favor of shortening the working day in the coal mines, but without the strike they would have preached to deaf ears. The strike, in turn, would have ended to no avail without the intervention of the Social Democratic members of the Assembly, who did not rest until the government and the majority full LLED, at least in some measure, the promises they had made at the time of the Great Coal Emergency. Many sympathy strikes and anarchist general strikes pursue similar aims. When a group of workers is not strong enough to deal with its employers, workers in other branches of production often cease work in order to make the stoppage of production more effective in the enterprises originally affected. That is the case, for instance, when transportation workers refuse to deliver goods produced by strike breakers. However, the sympathy strike can go further and assume a more general, political character if it wants to cause inconveniences and losses to the whole of bourgeois society in order to force it to exert pressure on the recalcitrant group of employers. These general strikes are often lumped together with the political mass strike, but they only have an outward resemblance because, in both cases, great masses of workers from different occupations lay down their tools. However, their aims are very different. Sympathy strikes that turn into mass strikes aim at incrementally increasing the economic pressure of the striking workers on a particular stratum of employers by putting pressure on bourgeois society and the bourgeois state. That pressure arises from the fact that the entire capitalist class has everything to win and nothing to lose from some concessions by particular employers. The political mass strike, on the contrary, exerts economic pressure on the employers in order to force the entire bourgeois society and the state to capitulate before the workers. The political strike is therefore a strike of a totally unique kind, for whose analysis the experiences of other work stoppages are of little use. Apart from the Belgian and Dutch examples, we have no practical experiences at our disposal. But it is too dangerous an instrument for people to experiment with at random. We must attempt to come to denied conclusions about it even if the available data are insufficient. 
We will be greatly assisted in this task if we analyze the experience of the barricade struggles that the political strike is to replace. 3. The power of organization. In the comparison between the political strike and the barricade struggle, one coincidence is noticeable above all, neither operates through the factor that is decisive in the eld from which these forms of struggle developed. Just as the political strike has no prospect of being effective through the economic pressure it exerts, so the barricaders, even if they are successful, almost never prove tactically superior to their opponents. Trained troops are more than a match for a popular uprising not only because of their weapons but also through their organization, which includes both their discipline and being directed according to a plan. The superiority of organized over unorganized masses is enormous even if their weapons are similar. When 10,000 Greek soldiers, whose later retreat was immortalized by Xenophon, were victorious in their struggle against half a million Asians, that was due not to their superior armaments, or if so, only to an insignificant degree, but rather to their tight organization. It was also thanks to their organization, rather than better weapons, that the Lansknex 43 were able to cope with the rebellious peasants in 1525. Superior organization of the command apparatus constitutes the basis of any ruling power much more than its physical superiority. That is shown most clearly by the commanding position that the Catholic Church has reached and still maintains without, and even in opposition to, the power of weapons. The more independent of society the state apparatus becomes, and the more absolute it is, the more jealously it strives to deprive its subjects of any possibility of developing a broad organization independent of the state. But since social relations are always stronger than the state, it can only be successful when they do not work against its policy. Absolutism thrives where the mode of production isolates and disperses the population, making their organization more difficult while at the same time favoring the creation of a vast state organism, for instance, in large agrarian states that appear in Great Plains because the peasant does not go beyond the village organization. Where, on the contrary, the mode of production not only produces widespread states but also centralizes the population and concentrates great masses with the same interests, and where a lively exchange of ideas occurs in a few points of decisive sine cans for national life, it is difficult to prevent their organization. In that case, when formal and open organizations are forbidden the people build conspiratorial and secret ones, which are all the more energetic, even fanatical, the more the organization involves a life and death issue for the classes in question. Political pressure and dissolution of all organizations by the state can actually, under certain circumstances, become a bond that holds together the oppressed classes more closely than any open organization, a bond that raises to the highest degree the unity of their thought and will as well as their voluntary obedience to the authority of their own leaders in ways that the ruling classes cannot control. The strongest form of organization is the one based on voluntary and enthusiastic devotion. This is the form with which the church achieved its most brilliant triumphs. Much less vigorous and resistant, given the same instruments of power, is a coercive organization like the modern state, which becomes increasingly less vigorous the more it ceases to be an actual organization of the ruling classes and becomes an organization of elements who are paid, mainly badly, to serve them, and who are often forcefully pressed into their service so that the composition of the state apparatus will be increasingly less favorable to the ruling classes. For instance, let us look at the army under general conscription. Most reliable for the ruling classes are conscripts from the country who come out of their villages unorganist, who are intellectually sluggish thanks to their traditional mode of production and their isolation, and who are still steeped in patriarchal views and stand in awe before any fatherly authority due to their peasant circumstances, especially the peasant right of succession. Least dependable for the ruling classes are the industrial proletarians who are organized by large-scale industry and city life, endowed with a feeling of independence and lively intellectual life and, through their early economic independence, are LLED with contempt and even hostility toward all the traditional authorities. That is quite serious for the modern state power because the numbers of peasants both in society and in the army is declining rapidly. 44. 
but not only is the social composition of the army continually worsening for the ruling classes. The mechanism of government is today also much more dependent on the wage-earning class. Economic and political development leads towards the nationalization of more and more enterprises, RST of all of the transportation system, on whose undisturbed functioning the whole of economic life increasingly depends. The more commodity production develops, the more each person produces not what he needs but what he doesn't need in order to exchange it, and the more the quantity of products grows that must be transported before they reach the hands of consumers. The division of labor tends in the same direction within each enterprise. The number of enterprises through which a product must pass, from its original form as raw materials until it is ready for use, increases continuously. Commerce and transportation are therefore the occupations that grow most rapidly. In Germany, from 1882 to 1895, the number of people employed in trade and transportation grew by 49% or in industry by 29% or while in agriculture it was only a trying 0.23. The railway system grew by 53% or, the postal and telegraph system by 89% or. But it was precisely in transportation that modern giant enterprises RST developed and fell under the sway of Hainanese. Where the latter does not rule absolutely, the state soon attempts to take possession of those enterprises because of the great importance they have for the whole of national life and especially for development of its military forces. It is sine cant that France made as little progress with the nationalization of railways as with the income taxes, despite the presence of socialists in the government bloc, finance rules there absolutely. But, whether the railway system is private or state property, its undisturbed functioning will increasingly become a life and death question for the modern state. The railway employees will, for that reason, be placed under an ever stricter discipline, while at the same time more and more military forces will be trained to run the railway system. But, of all the major groups of wage workers, the railway employees, next to workers in state-owned mines, are precisely the ones most immediately interested in bringing about establishment of a government dependent on the workers. They are the most sensitive to a government that is hostile to the proletariat. On the other hand, a government will tend, all other circumstances being equal, to identify all the more with the capitalists, the larger the number of state enterprises and of workers exploited by them and the more direct the government's interest in capitalist protein. The increasing nationalizations of enterprises are then, for the time being, not a means of peaceful growing over into socialism but rather a means of bringing into the government mechanism itself the modern class contradictions and class struggles and of making it more sensitive to them. In the days of barricade struggles, the state did not yet depend so much on wage workers in its enterprises and in the army, and it was therefore not so susceptible. But, even then, the success of barricade struggles depended more on their disorganizing than on their tactical effects. Through the suddenness and universality of an outburst of popular rage, they confused and paralyzed the government, while simultaneously creating for it a situation that required its greatest strength, cold-bloodedness, and unity of purpose. Where barricade struggles did not manage to produce this effect, above all where the government was ready for them or even provoked them, the gders inevitably succumbed. What a contrast there was in 1848 between the February days and the June days in Paris, and between the March and the October days in Vienna. Given modern armaments, today it has become impossible to bring down a government, even the weakest and most foolish one, by means of armed resistance. Not only are the weapons of the military much more formidable than they were FTY years ago, the population is also much more defenseless. Today, one cannot mold the bullets for RIES, and even if the people did manage to break into an arsenal and provide themselves with weapons, these would be useless without the special ammunition. The consciousness of technical military superiority makes it possible for any government that possesses the necessary ruthlessness to look forward calmly to a popular armed uprising, and a less ruthless government would not have to fear such an uprising because it would not have brought about the harsh antagonism with the popular masses that alone can produce a violent outbreak of utmost desperation. Today, 
it is not to be expected that a popular armed rising would have so powerful a moral impact as to unnerve and disarm the government. What the barricade struggle no longer succeeds in doing should now be done through the political strike, disorganizing the government while simultaneously making the utmost demands on its strength, self-possession, and tenacity, forcing it either to retreat or resign. It would be a trial of strength between the state and proletarian organization. 45 With a single blow, all production would be paralyzed, the masses of the workers would be brought into the streets, the masses of the petty and great bourgeoisie would be driven into a state of frantic anxiety about their lives and property, and the entire armed power would be forced into a constant, exhausting activity because every proprietor in the country would crave for protection and the masses of striking workers would be everywhere and nowhere, avoiding any clash with the armed forces and gathering wherever they are not present. Each additional day of the strike would heighten the contradictions, extend the strike to those regions of the countryside wherever industry or large landed property are located, increase the number of vulnerable points, multiply the exertions of the troops, and sharpen the pains and passions of the strikers as well as the anxiety of the proprietors and the confusion of the government, which in one place will be carried away into the most horrible and senseless brutalities, while in another it will adopt the most cowardly subservience, all the while and reading all sides to put an end to the situation one way or the other while having no chance itself to come to grips with the passive resistance that would nowhere be tangible yet would paralyze it everywhere. If the government is nonetheless strong enough to withstand the political strike without breaking down and being thrown into confusion, if it manages, in the general standstill of social life, to secure the undisturbed functioning of all parts of the state organism long enough to wear out the strength of the workers, until they are faced with the alternative of either crawling back under the yoke or attempting to attain through desperate deeds of violence what they were unable to achieve. Through the revolution of crossed arms, then the victory of the government is likely, to be sure, a victory that the government would have paid for dearly. All the horrors that the bourgeoisie expected from the victorious strike will be imposed upon the workers. If, on the contrary, the strikers succeed in maintaining their cohesiveness and preserving their purposeful passivity long enough to disorganize the government at some points, then the proletariat is on the way to victory, whether because they manage to draw over to their side factors which the government needs, or because the government itself through ordre, contrary ordre, Disorder 46 sowed confusion, spreading weakness and helplessness among its followers. The propertied classes would then lose confidence in the ability of the government to protect them, they would increasingly fear that continuing resistance would bring ruin upon them, they would storm the government, give in, leave it in the lurch and reach an agreement with the rising powers in order to save what can still be saved. The government would feel the ground slip away under from under its feet, and state power would fall to the class that knew how to maintain longest its organizational unity in the crisis, the class whose composure and self condense most impressed the great, indifferent masses, and whose prudent use of force disarmed its opponents, that is, the proletariat educated by social democracy. For the preconditions of the political strike. For the proletariat to be able to reach victory through a political strike, it should rst of all constitute a preponderant part of the population who are intelligent and organized enough to maintain discipline when organization is formally dissolved. It should also be able to produce again and again from its midst new leaders, whom it should follow willingly if its customary leaders are arrested. It should not let itself be carried away by temptations and provocations into imprudent and hasty steps or into outbursts of anger or panic. Finally, it should not be distracted from its great goals by ancillary concerns. Industry must be highly developed, and the proletariat must go through a long school of political and trade union struggles before it comes that far. On the other hand, the government must exhibit certain distinguishing features for the strike to be able to unsettle it. The political strike is excluded beforehand in the case of a government elected by the people, one that does not lean upon external instruments of power that can be disorganized through a strike but rather upon the majority of the people. In Switzerland, for instance, the attempt to topple the government and conquer political power through a mass strike would be as hopeless as it would be super use. 
because the political strike can triumph only through its disorganizing effects on the government, not through its economic pressure on society, it can only be suitable in places where the government has attained a certain independence from the popular masses, as in the case of all the modern large states. But, in such states, the striking proletariat also has prospects of success only so long. As it faces an outwardly strong and brutal but inwardly weak and headless government that no longer enjoys the trust of the propertied classes or even of the bureaucracy and the army. A strong and far-sighted government, which impresses all classes of the people, cannot be defeated by a political strike. Luckily for the proletariat, modern development shows everywhere a tendency to weaken the government and make all classes discontented with it. That is no accident. As long as the state had great goals that were in the interest of the mass of the nation, its struggles easily produced great men behind whom stood cohesive and great parties. The case is totally different when, as at present, the state and the classes standing behind it have essentially attained all they wanted. There is no longer a great, common interest that could weld these classes together. Petty local and professional interests come to the foreground, and the parties of the propertied classes split more and more into small, short-sighted cliques. The governments are more and more coalition governments, whose tasks no longer consist in accomplishing a great program but in reconciling elements that tend to pull apart. That is only possible by prompting each party to abandon its traditional program, by increasing the legislative incapacity of the government, and by concentrating all its forces on some obvious measure, for instance, some custom duties or the police expulsion of a couple of priests and nuns, to the neglect of everything else. Energetic and far-sighted men of action cannot thrive in such an atmosphere. It favors spineless adders, masters in the art of delaying and covering up, who are apparently ready to serve, by means of promises, the most contradictory tendencies, yet who in practice care only for the next day with no concern for the long-term consequences. They are slick diplomats, often intelligent, always charming, skilled in the art of alluring those they are dealing with but incapable of overcoming any great antagonism, of satisfying any great interest, or even of impressing their subordinates with their superiority. They are suitable helmsmen for sunny days, but they break down in a storm, and their authority must wear out completely even before their own breakdown in view of the contradictory interests they serve, a contradiction that they seek not to overcome but only to conceal. The more unexpectedly and suddenly the storm breaks out, the more helpless they will stand before it. Here we come to the second similarity between barricade battles and the political strike. We have seen that the fate of both depends on their moral effect, on the sudden disorganization of the government. Because that was the decisive thing for barricade battles, and not the tactical overcoming of the army, they only had prospects of success where they broke out unexpectedly without giving the government time to make preparations. As a rule, that was the case only with spontaneous uprisings in which the people themselves mounted the barricades following a sudden inspiration, but the people were not always without organization and leadership. In France these were provided to a large extent by secret societies. Where such secret organizations not only make use of the uprising but prepare it for a long time and stage it, they are not easily defeated. However, the police everywhere have their spies, and the government is usually warned in time of their intentions. Finally, the timing stipulated beforehand for the uprising does not always coincide with a strong oppositional agitation of the popular masses. Something similar happens with the political strike if it is appropriate, it does not bring about victory through the economic pressure it exerts on the capitalists but through its paralysing and disconcerting effects on the mechanism of government. The more unexpected and spontaneous the strike, the sooner it will full ll its aims. What holds good for any strike is also true of the political strike, the best part of its effect is lost when one announces it beforehand for a spicy C date. The only purpose of this announcement can be to use the strike as a threat. But such threats must wear out quickly, and when they are not followed by the most decided action they must produce discouragement and mistrust in the ranks of the workers. 
the political strike thus has the greatest possibilities of success when it grows spontaneously out of a situation that produced the deepest agitation in the popular masses, such as a great wrong in iced upon them, a coup d'etat, or something similar, so that the masses are ready to risk everything and a watchword like the general strike Arbeit Saint Stellion can sweep away everything in its path. The suddenness, universality and force of the eruption can thus intimidate, bewilder and paralyze its opponents. Nothing is more mistaken than thinking that the entire working class must RST be organized in unions before the political strike can be started. This precondition would never be full LLED and would only have some justy cation if the workers wanted to defeat their opponents through the economic pressure of a protracted strike. The general strike succeeds in paralyzing enemies through its moral effects, and for this purpose it is not necessary to have a general organization but rather a general agitation of the proletarian masses in the same direction, an agitation that would, to be sure, subside fruitlessly if it did not have behind it an organization, or even a working class that went through the school of organization, to lend the movement brains and backbone. With the pertinent changes, what Marx wrote in 1852 about the armed insurrection can also be said about the political strike. Now, insurrection is an art quite as much as war or any other, and subject to certain rules of proceeding, which, when neglected, will produce the ruin of the party neglecting them. Firstly, never play with insurrection unless you are fully prepared to face the consequences of your play. Insurrection is a calculus with very and night magnitudes, the value of which may change every day, the forces opposed to you have all the advantage of organization, discipline, and habitual authority, unless you bring strong odds against them you are defeated and ruined. Secondly, once the road to insurrection has been taken, act with the greatest determination and on the offensive. The defensive is the death of every armed rising, it is lost before it measures itself with its enemies. Surprise your antagonists while their forces are scattering, prepare new successes, however small, but daily, keep up the moral ascendancy which the RST successful rising has given to you, rally those vacillating elements to your side which always follow the strongest impulse, and which always look out for the safer side, force your enemies to a retreat before they can collect their strength against you, in the words of Danton, the greatest master of revolutionary policy yet known, de Elades, de Elades, encore de Elades. 47. Mutatis muta and dis, that also holds true for the political strike. One does not play with it or pledge one's word to stage it at a denight date. When the time for it has come, when the working masses energetically demand it and the struggle against the government breaks out, the probabilities of victory will be all the greater the more quickly the decision to go on strike is executed without delay, without parleys, without interruption, before the opponents have collected their instruments of power and drawn up their battle plan, and the less opportunity they are granted to come to their senses and catch their breath. In that respect, the Belgian general strike of April 1902 showed us how it should not be made. First, the government was given an announcement regarding a life and death struggle at AXED date, then, after it had been given time to collect and arm itself, to assemble troops and complete its preparations, the general strike was launched. We have no intention of reproaching the Belgian comrades for those mistakes. Despite everything, they fought so magnificently and carried out such an orderly retreat that they made up for their errors as far as possible. And of course, it is much easier for spectators, especially after the event, to point out mistakes than for people engaged in action to avoid them. But the wish to spare any reproach to our Belgian comrades must not go as far as to conceal their errors, because in that case we run the risk of repeating them. We have no reason to blame the Belgian comrades, who have gone ahead into such thorny and unknown terrain, but we must learn from them to avoid entering upon the false path that led them away from the road to victory. From the Belgian experiment we can see that it would be a fatal mistake for us in Germany to proclaim the political strike for a XED date, for instance, in case of a restriction of the present franchise. Another circumstance also weighs against this commitment. Here we can notice a further similarity between barricade struggles and the political strike. 
whatever the starting point of barricade struggles, they always dash forth to overthrow the existing government, not just to wring out some isolated concession. And that is completely natural. A barricade GHT means risking one's life. And one runs into such risks only for the sake of a great goal. Only the consciousness of being able to shake off a yoke that has become unbearable could inspire in the masses the courage and the enthusiasm that they require to confront the armed forces. But the latter can only be made to waver by the feeling that the ruling regime is about to collapse. As long as the soldier knows that he will have the same chiefs tomorrow, even if his revolt against them turns out well, he will shun any insubordination and the cruel punishment that would inescapably follow. He can only be made to waver by his awareness that going over to the side of the people or remaining passive in the struggle will help to bring down the government and thus transform insubordination from a crime into an act of the highest civic virtue. Finally, the necessary disorientation in the government only appears when it perceives that any false step, whether in the form of weakness or ruthlessness, could cost it its very existence and not just a little more or less power or authority. Similar considerations apply for the political strike. Here also great things are at stake. If not directly their lives, then the Gders risk their economic existence in an entirely different sense than in an ordinary strike, when behind the strikers of one branch of production in any single locality stands the entire working class with its intact organizations and resources. A defeat in a political mass strike, if it has been fought to the utmost, means a defeat for the entire working class, the destruction of all its economic and political organizations and the complete crippling of the proletariat's ability to GHT for years to come. At the last Vienna Party Congress, Victor Adler 48 argued that he sympathized with the general strike because the glorious retreat of the Belgian comrades showed that it, the general strike, can be brought to an end in a sensible, cool-headed, and clear manner. From the context, Adler obviously meant by that expression not only the possibility of leading the general strike sensibly and cool-headedly to victory, but also the possibility of interrupting it without suffering a defeat when there are no prospects of victory. I would not count on the last possibility very strongly. A general who engages in battle with the expectation of being able to interrupt it at will if he realizes that the enemy is stronger than expected can be very dangerous. Whoever begins a battle must be resolved to GHT it out to a conclusion and must also count on the possibility of a defeat. In any great action that we undertake, only the beginning stands before us. How it will turn out in the end depends not only on us but also on our opponents. The possibility of a defeat should not deter us from struggling. One would be a pathetic warrior if one were to engage in battle only when victory is certain. There can even be occasions when one must put up a GHT when defeat is likely, because retreat without a struggle would mean complete moral bankruptcy. But the more devastating the effects of an eventual defeat, the more one must beware of entering into a struggle unnecessarily and the greater must be the prize for the sake of which one takes up the struggle. With a tottering, rotten regime, there is no need to prove that in the case both of a mass strike and of barricade battles the government loses its head all the more easily the greater the danger it faces, and only under such a regime can a mass political strike be declared. A resolute, centralist, and energetic government, with roots in the popular masses, thrives in the face of danger. The method of overthrowing such a government has not yet been found. But barricade struggles against the military have shown that the mechanism of government is thrown all the more easily into disarray the more the government is at risk. That also holds true for state employees. We have already pointed out that railway employees are even more interested in the installation of a proletarian regime than most other groups of workers. But they are precisely the ones who risk the most in a strike that does not end with their victory but leaves the government in place. Even a temporary victory can mean a defeat for them, as illustrated by the outcome of the Dutch strike, which led merely to the granting of some particular concessions and not to Modi Katayan of the government system in a proletarian sense. In most countries the railway employees must weigh very carefully whether to join a political strike if it has no prospects of leading to establishment of a proletarian regime. 
and the same rules that apply to the railway employees also hold true for other categories of workers upon whom the government depends for its functioning. That is one reason why the last Belgian general strike failed. The railway employees, the soldiers, and so on would have joined the strike much earlier if they had seen a prospect of successfully replacing the ultramontane government with an Ancelli Vanderveld 49 ministry. The chances for the political mass strike are poor where social democracy is not strong enough and ready to take possession of the helm of state in case of victory. If all the observations we have made here prove correct, then we must conclude that the political mass strike is a weapon that, under certain circumstances, can render excellent services, but the time to apply it successfully has not yet arrived. It is not a superior means with which to wring some concessions from the ruling classes or to preserve political liberties and rights that have already been won. But the political mass strike can be the means for workers to seize power in a NAL, decisive struggle, when legal political means have been taken away from them, when they have little to lose politically and in nightly more to win, and when the strike breaks out in a favorable situation that NDS the government either unprepared or in a dilemma. It is a truly revolutionary instrument and, as such, it is only suitable in revolutionary times. It should not be used to achieve some particular measures such as the franchise, the right of association or similar goals but in order to struggle for political power in its entirety. If the political strike is not applicable in present conditions, it is, on the other hand, very doubtful whether it is an instrument whose application is necessary under all circumstances. We have seen that we cannot foresee the forms of coming struggles for political power, events abroad, and we include in that category a revolt in Belgium, a disastrous war in Russia, or a civil war in the United States, could have such repercussions for Germany as to lead to the conquest of political power by peaceful means without any catastrophes. On the other hand, the durability and strength of the political instruments of power at the disposal of the proletariat at this stage have not yet been put to the most extreme test. Ultimately, the future could have many surprises in store for us. Nothing would be more precipitous than to commit ourselves to declare the political mass strike under certain conditions. But neither do we have the slightest reason to do so at present. I concur completely with Adler when, in the speech already quoted, he said. I am not in favor of reassuring our enemies that they are safe from the general strike. We would in that case be fostering a dangerous illusion. We do not want to renounce the general strike. When, how, and under what conditions we will use it, that has not yet been decided. 5. The necessity of discussing the political strike. If we can say almost nothing tonight about a future application of the political strike, what is the purpose of discussing a method of struggle that we will perhaps not employ at all and that, when necessary, operates all the more energetically the more unexpectedly it is used? Doesn't that mean brooding over as yet non-existent issues and, on the other hand, disclosing our cards prematurely to our opponents? To rack one's brains over the future would be pointless if our present actions did not help to shape the future and if our views of the future had no inions on our current activity. But where, on the contrary, such a reciprocal action exists, it is not only permissible but imperative to delve into the future. If employment of the political mass strike is not unconditionally necessary, it is even less unconditionally excluded. Precisely because, in order to be effective, it cannot be prepared beforehand for a XED date by a small organization, and because it must not be a putsch but a spontaneous outbreak of a profound, universal anger of the proletariat, we must discuss it openly. If the barricade struggles of 1848 began spontaneously, received the support of the people and were ultimately successful, that was only possible because many decades of practice with armed uprisings had familiarized the minds of the people with that method. Such schooling is today neither necessary nor desirable. Our present political rights enable us to discuss theoretically and in public the instruments of political struggle, which, before 1848, was impossible. By means of these discussions, we are able, to a certain extent, to supersede the necessity of learning from practice, and we would be fools if we did not avail ourselves of that opportunity. 
contemporary forms of democracy do not render super use the great decisive struggles between classes for political power, as the revisionists think. But they do dispose of a large part of the costly and counterproductive attempts to provoke decisive battles prematurely, before the rebellious classes have the power and maturity to take possession of political power effectively and to employ it successfully. But, if we want to avoid making any experiments with the political strike, then we must develop its theory all the more and make the comrades realize that if, one day, the proletariat must use the weapon of the general strike, it will only be able to employ it appropriately if it has already attained a political grasp of it beforehand. But public discussion of the political strike is not only an expedient replacement for the school of political experience, it could also exert a valuable inyance on our political life. Now, as in the past, Marx's saying remains true, Forstwald is the midwife of any new society. 50 No ruling class abdicates voluntarily and nonchalantly. But that does not necessarily mean that violence Schwaltetikite must be the midwife of a new society. A rising class must have the necessary instruments of force at its disposal if it wants to dispossess the old ruling class, but it is not unconditionally necessary that it employ them. Under certain circumstances, awareness of the existence of such instruments can be enough to induce a declining class to come to an agreement peacefully with an opponent that has become overwhelming. The more numerous and powerful the proletariat's instruments of force, and the more their existence is well known, the greater will be the probability of a peaceful transition from capitalism to socialism. To what extent that kind of social revolution is at all within reach does not depend on our peaceful protestations or on our renunciation of the ogre legend Fresselgent, 51 It does not depend on assurances or concessions that were either not seriously meant, and are therefore mere cant, or that can be construed as signs of weakness and will only strengthen the resolution of our opponents to refuse to grant any meaningful concession. Only through our instruments of power will we impose ourselves on our opponents and induce them to seek a peaceful contest with us, which we also wish for if it is at all possible without endangering or delaying the emancipation of the proletariat. The old saying, if you want peace, prepare for war, applies here more than in any other case. If the RST result of our discussions is the conclusion that we possess in the political strike a weapon that is surely double-edged and should only be employed in the most extreme situations, but also one that is dangerous and under certain conditions even lethal for our opponents, and the second conclusion is that the probability of eventually employing this weapon grows when all other weapons of political struggle have been taken away from us or blunted, then we have considerably improved our ability to preserve our political rights and prevent political catastrophes. That also applies, Nally, with regard to our own party. All the discussions of recent years sprang from a feeling in our ranks that with continuation of our present tactic and growth we are rapidly coming to a frontal confrontation with the ruling classes. If, in doing so, we dispose of no other political weapon than the one that has been granted to us by those classes themselves, namely, general suffrage, then our prospects would really be poor. It was then natural to look for a tactic that could postpone the decisive struggle for centuries, break it up into an endless series of meaningless mini-struggles or, in a Proudhon-like manner, circumvent the object of the struggle, political power. With all these attempts to avoid the enemy or even gain his approval, we run the risk of Sakri Singh, for the sake of the party's existence, what constitutes the foundation and the justi cation for that existence, thereby emasculating the party and leading to its gradual decomposition. It is completely different when the proletariat is conscious of having at its disposal several means of power mock middle that are independent of the goodwill of the ruling classes and that can give the proletariat the force with which to overcome its opponents even if they have recourse to the most brutal methods. In that case, the proletariat will calmly continue to advance along the road that it recognizes as the correct one on which it has already advanced so far, without letting itself be provoked by agitators who would gladly drown the gding proletariat in its own blood, but also without letting itself be intimidated by the warnings of those anxiously worried friends who desire its victory but abhor its struggle. It seems to me that one of the most effective means of kindling in the proletariat an inspiring and resolute feeling of its own force, together with 
Condens in its victory, is to spread the consciousness of the ultimate feasibility and effectiveness of the political strike. It is for the sake of that invaluable effect, above all, that analysis of its feasibility and methods is today so necessary. Chapter 6 What was accomplished on the 9th of January, January 1905, Parvis. Alexander Israel Help Hand, Parvis, was one of the most controversial and visionary Marxists to participate in the Russian Revolution of 1905. One his insight into Russian and world events came from his knowledge of Marx and his study of political economy, in which he earned a doctorate from a Swiss university in 1891. As early as 1895-6, he endorsed the tactic of the political mass strike, too initially as a means of proletarian self-defense and, by 1904, as a weapon of attack and a method of revolution that presupposed thorough organization of the workers in both the Social Democratic Party and trade unions Three Parvis was involved in most of the polemics as well as the intrigues of both German Social Democrats and Russian exiles. In the campaign against Bernstein's revisionism, he was one of the RST to explain cyclical crises in terms of a modern theory of imperialism. For but Parvis enters the historiography of Russian Marxism primarily through the profound Indians. Of his ideas on Leon Trotsky. In his biography of Trotsky, Isaac Deutscher says that, by 1904, not only were Parvis's international ideas and revolutionary perspectives becoming part and parcel of Trotsky's thinking, but, also, some of Trotsky's views on Russian history, especially his conception of the Russian state, can be traced back to Parvis. 5. Deutscher devoted an entire chapter to the intellectual partnership between Parvis and Trotsky. In my life, his autobiography, Trotsky wrote. Parvis was unquestionably one of the most important of the Marxists at the turn of the century. He used the Marxian method skillfully, was possessed of wide vision, and kept a keen eye on everything of importance in world events. This, coupled with his fearless thinking and his virile, muscular style, made him a remarkable writer. His early studies brought me closer to the problems of the social revolution, and, for me, nightly transformed the conquest of power by the proletariat from an astronomical NAL goal to a practical task for our own day six. In February and March of 1904, Parvis published two articles in Iskra on the world economy and the Russian autocracy that enhanced Trotsky's view both of imperialism and of the prospects for permanent revolution. The RST article, Capitalism and War, began with a declaration that the Russo-Japanese War is the bloody dawn of impending great events 7 there followed a sweeping picture of geopolitics in which Europe was making feverish preparations for world war. Surveying the rise of militarism and imperialist barriers to trade, Parvis traced the expansion of capitalism around the globe and particularly into Asia. Each capitalist state, he wrote, is an enormous and complex machine for squeezing labor out of the people and for the endless capitalist transformation of surrounding areas. Capitalism produced a torrent of commodities that periodically surpassed the capacity of domestic markets and compelled a never-ending search for new peoples and territories to conquer. In the struggle over colonies, all the great states of Europe, together with America, Russia, and Japan, were engaged in a titanic struggle extending into every corner of the globe. Russia, alone among the imperialist powers, with its weakly developed economy, sought conquests for reasons other than the internal contradictions of the capitalist mode of production. Far from requiring outlets to foreign markets, Russian industry was incapable even of generating the revenues needed to support a modern army. The financial poverty of Russia was as boundless as its efforts to conquer other countries, the Russian government uses foreign gold to acquire foreign lands, and it seizes foreign lands in order once again to acquire gold for itself. 8. Russia aspired to remain a great power, but its imperialist adventures were provoked mainly by domestic instability. The mindless quest of the Russian government for successes in foreign affairs is imperative in order to hide the empire's internal weakness. With its poorly equipped peasant army, in February 1904 Russia blundered into the war with Japan, which Parvis declared would destroy the political equilibrium of the entire world. 
In a subsequent article on the fall of the autocracy, Nine Parvis related the war to impending revolution. The government hoped war would drown domestic opposition in a wave of military patriotism, but the NAL outcome would be cataclysmic defeat. A vigorous and youthful Japanese capitalism needed markets and resources on the Asian mainland, but Russia stood in the way of Japanese expansion. Russian forces depended upon supplies by way of the Trans-Siberian Railway, but given the railway's limitations it was easier to reach New York than the besieged fortress at Port Arthur. In contrast, once Japan defeated the Russian EET, Japanese forces were supplied and reinforced at will. The damage in iced on Russia's credit was even more disastrous. Foreign bankers demanded a victory before extending new loans, but new loans were imperative merely to continue the war. With inevitable catastrophe in view, Parvis concluded. The only way out of the disgraceful condition into which the Russian government has driven Russia is liquidation of the autocracy. Revolution alone can restore the national vitality of the country. Most social democrats thought the war would at least compel the Tsar to introduce liberal reforms. Parvis went much further, believing the outcome might well be a government of workers' democracy headed by social democrats. The Tsarist state was a bureaucratic hybrid of European absolutism and Asiatic despotism, and its successor might be just as unique, a provisional workers' government in a country where industrial workers were a small minority in a sea of peasants. To most contemporaries, this suggestion seemed absurd, but not to Ryazanov 10 or Trotsky. Early in 1905, Trotsky invited Parvis to elaborate his ideas in the article we have translated here, which served as the preface to Trotsky's own pamphlet up to the 9th of January, the next document translated in this volume. In what was accomplished on 9th January, 11 Parvis scorned Russian liberals who entertained exaggerated notions of their own unions and popular support. In Europe, liberalism had nourished in the context of urban life and commerce, but Russian liberalism was an imported idea with shallow roots. Historically, Russian urban life bore little resemblance to that in Europe, the cities were primarily administrative outposts of the autocracy, and the commerce that bred modern capitalism was scarcely to be seen. The majority of Russian cities were merely commercial bazaars for the surrounding gentry and the peasantry. When foreign pressures nally forced Russia to import elements of capitalist modernity, an industrial proletariat emerged that was concentrated in large factories. Whereas Russian liberalism was a head without a body, the workers were a potentially powerful force in need only of organization and resolute leadership. Parvis believed that, in the RST stage of the Russian Revolution, the opposing forces of liberalism and socialism might end common ground, but overthrow of the autocracy would initiate a prolonged political struggle in which they would have to de-any their relations in terms of mutually conisting goals. While liberals would attempt to co-opt working-class support for bourgeois constitutionalism, the most crucial obligation of social democrats would be to maintain the proletariat's organizational independence and commitment to a working-class program. Social democrats must make use of liberal support whenever possible, but they must also prepare for prolonged class struggle and even civil war, in which the historical experience of Europe might be dramatically abbreviated and the Russian proletariat might emerge as the vanguard of international socialist revolution. With an accompanying revolution in Europe, Russia, despite its historical backwardness, might even initiate the NAL goal of building a socialist society. Even apart from a European revolution, if the Russian working class temporarily took state power it would propel revolutionary change to the furthest limits compatible with private property and bourgeois democracy. The greatest danger to the revolution was that liberals, upon discovering their own weakness, would compromise with Tsarism in the interest of preserving order. The inescapable conclusion was that workers alone could complete the revolutionary overthrow of absolutism. Social democrats would then end themselves in power, or at least holding the majority in a provisional revolutionary government with an extraordinarily complex agenda, on the one hand, they would have to institutionalize the revolution and establish the constitutional freedoms needed for further organization of trade unions and the workers' party, on the other hand, they must simultaneously begin to implement working-class demands that would inevitably intrude, 
as Koskai argued in Revolutionary Questions, upon private property in the means of production. The outcome of this dilemma would depend partly upon the European Revolution and partly upon the tenacity and skill of social democratic leadership. Parvis's vision was stunning in its audacity, but it also left profound questions unanswered, how far would a workers' government, once in power, be compelled by its own mission to move in the direction of socialism, and how far could it move before Nali being overthrown by political reaction. At the beginning of 1905, few Russian Marxists regarded Parvis as anything more than a well-intentioned but seriously mistaken romantic. Most agreed that the only way to avoid repeating the failures of the 1848 revolutions in Europe was to support the liberals rather than frightening them. The most authoritative spokesman for this view was G.V. Plekhanov, the traditional leader and elder. Theorist of Russian social democracy. The novelty of Parvis's argument can be seen most clearly by comparing his views RST with those of Plekhanov, speaking for the Mensheviks, and then with those of Lenin, speaking for the Bolsheviks. In his criticism of the Iskra draft program, Ryazanov had already made the argument for permanent revolution, to which Plekhanov had responded that the real question is how to achieve the triumph of a democratic republic. In 1905, Plekhanov returned to the same theme in an essay on the question of the seizure of power 12 he agreed that the dictatorship of the proletariat must be the RST act of a socialist revolution, but, in Russia, the real issue was merely a bourgeois revolution. Although the proletariat would play the leading role, the revolution would go no further than creating the conditions needed to prepare for socialist revolution sometime in the future. 13 Responding to the question of how the proletariat could play the leading role but then refrain from seizing power, Plekhanov claimed that Marx had already provided the solution. When liberals betrayed the 1848 revolution, Marx expected the republican petty bourgeoisie to resume the struggle against feudal remnants and urged workers to support these efforts while maintaining organizational independence. 14 With working class support, Marx expected the petty bourgeoisie to establish real bourgeois democracy. Plekhanov saw similar circumstances in Russia, the workers could not aim immediately for socialism, but they could dictate to the petty bourgeoisie such conditions as would sine cantly facilitate the future replacement of bourgeois democratic supremacy with the rule of the proletariat 15 of one thing Plekhanov was certain. The founder of Scientisi Socialism never even contemplated the idea that political representatives of the revolutionary proletariat might join with representatives of the petty bourgeoisie in establishing a new social order. Quite the contrary, after victory over the big bourgeoisie and the seizure of power by petty bourgeois democrats, the workers, according to Marx's plan, would have to come together as a strong opposition party. Which, through criticism and agitation, would push the petty bourgeois government forward. This was what Marx meant by the term permanent revolution, and Plekhanov insisted that Russian social democrats must adopt precisely the same tactics. 16 For Plekhanov, the lesson drawn from the experience of Marx and Engels was that the Workers' Party could never do more than criticize bourgeois liberals and republicans until the objective, subjective, and psychological conditions nally warranted direct struggle for the ultimate goal of socialism. When he made this argument, however, the object of his criticism was Lenin, not Parvis. By 1905, Plekhanov and Lenin had parted ways following the split between Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, and Lenin was now calling for a revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry and participation of the proletariat in the revolutionary government. In an essay on the provisional revolutionary government, Lenin argued that Plekhanov's inference is entirely false. When Marx and Engels set forth the tactics cited by Plekhanov, they expected the revolution to resume quickly after the defeats of 1848-9. Instead, Europe settled into political reaction. Reading from the same texts as Plekhanov, Lenin drew his own very different inference. If Marx and Engels had realized that the democratic system was bound to last for a fairly long time, they would have attached all the more importance to the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry with the object of consolidating the republic, 
of completely eradicating all survivals of absolutism, and of clearing the arena for the battle for socialism. 17. The problem with Lenin's notion of a democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry was obvious, in Russia, there was no revolutionary petty bourgeois party with whom to cooperate. Lenin thought such a party must eventually emerge, but this was hardly a practical basis upon which to base political tactics. In effect, Lenin wanted the proletariat to pressure republicans from within the marble halls of a provisional government that was really no more than a castle in the air. Within weeks of this exchange with Plekhanov, Lenin published another major essay, Two Tactics of Social Democracy in the Democratic Revolution, and compounded the confusion by insisting that even a consistently democratic revolution in Russia will not weaken, but strengthen the rule of the bourgeoisie, the most the proletariat could demand was realization of all the immediate political and economic demands contained in our program, the minimum program. Marxists are absolutely convinced of the bourgeois character of the Russian Revolution. What does this mean? It means that the democratic reforms in the political system and the social and economic reforms, which have become a necessity for Russia, do not in themselves imply the undermining of capitalism, the undermining of bourgeois rule, on the contrary, they will, for the RST time, really clear the ground for a wide and rapid, European, and not Asiatic, development of capitalism, they will, for the RST time, make it possible for the bourgeoisie to rule as a class. 18. Lenin and Plekhanov agreed that the revolution would be limited to creating, at best, a regime of democratic capitalism, their chief difference concerned participation of the Workers' Party in a provisional government. Lenin thought the working class was decidedly interested in the broadest, freest, and most rapid development of capitalism, which would create the most suitable conditions for class struggle 19 yet, at the same time, he admitted that. Our inyance on the masses of the proletariat, the social democratic inyance, is as yet very, very inadequate, the revolutionary inyance on the mass of the peasantry is quite insignificant, the proletarians, and especially the peasants, are still frightfully disunited, backward, and ignorant. 20. Notwithstanding this dismal outlook, he still insisted that the general democratic revolutionary movement has already brought about the necessity of an insurrection 21 most readers would have found this argument curious, the frightfully, scattered, backward and ignorant worker and peasant masses were, with Bolshevik leadership, to mount an armed insurrection, after which they would jointly create a revolutionary democratic dictatorship, and they were to do so in conditions that would inevitably strengthen the rule of the bourgeoisie. By comparison with Lenin's evident confusion, Plekhanov and Parvis at least put forth arguments that were coherent. Yet, when Lenin turned from Plekhanov, who he thought was lagging behind the revolution, to Parvis, who he believed was rushing ahead of it, he found himself on equally difficult terrain. While calling for armed insurrection, he dismissed Parvis's introduction to the windbag Trotsky's pamphlet as bombastic and totally unrealistic. When Parvis called upon social democrats to be more revolutionary than anyone else, Lenin replied that we will always be critical of such revolutionariness. And we will teach the need for a sober evaluation of the classes and shadings within the classes. Equally incorrect. Our Parvis statements that the revolutionary provisional government in Russia will be a government of working class democracy, that if the social democrats are at the head of the revolutionary movement of the Russian proletariat, this government will be a social democratic government, that the social democratic provisional government will be an integral government with a social democratic majority. This is impossible, unless we speak of fortuitous, transient episodes, and not of a revolutionary dictatorship that will be at all durable and capable of leaving its mark in history. This is impossible, because only a revolutionary dictatorship supported by the vast majority of the people can be at all durable, not absolutely, of course, but relatively. The Russian proletariat, however, is at present a minority of the population in Russia. It can become the great, overwhelming majority only if it combines with the mass of semi-proletarians, semi-proprietors, i.e., with the mass of the petty bourgeois urban and rural poor. 
such a composition of the social basis of the revolutionary democratic dictatorship, possible and desirable, i.e. the possible and desirable revolutionary democratic dictatorship will, of course, affect the composition of the revolutionary government and inevitably lead to the participation or even predominance within it of the most heterogeneous representatives of revolutionary democracy. It would be extremely harmful to entertain any illusions on this score. 22. Throughout 1905, the debates between Mensheviks and Bolsheviks raged with increasing acrimony, convincing Parvis that fratricidal quarrels among social democrats were consuming more energy than real efforts to mobilize the masses and organize the workers. In the meantime, the Tsarist government had made peace with Japan and issued reform proposals that portended some sort of elections. By mid-October, the St. Petersburg Soviet emerged and the capital city was paralyzed by a political strike. While the Bolsheviks hesitated to join a Soviet not subject to party discipline, Trotsky and Parvis immediately supported the incipient workers' government. Together they edited a new newspaper, Nakalo the Beginning, and used it to promote a strategy of permanent revolution, beginning with the mass strike for an eight-hour working day. Nakalo was to replace Iskra, whose editorial board had been torn apart by factional gding. In the last issue of Iskra, Parva summarized his impressions of the internal party struggle since Bloody Sunday. Organizational incompetence has brought us aimlessness in political thought and inability to give any decisive answer to the critical questions of the revolution. A victorious revolution is made by the class that leads it and controls state power. Since the revolution in Russia became a political fact, Russian social democracy has faced the task of seizing state power and making use of it in the interest of the working class in accordance, naturally, with Russia's economic conditions. The Mensheviks have recoiled from this undertaking and become absorbed in discussions of whether it might be best, at the very time when the revolutionary army of the proletariat is on the upsurge, to surrender political power immediately and voluntarily to bourgeois democracy. This is the same timid thinking that, mutatis muta and dis, led Bernstein to predict a colossal defeat for German social democracy should it end itself in control of the state in the near future. Like Bernstein, they have used this idea as cover for a fatalistic understanding of the historical development that results from class relations. If class relations were determined by the historical course of events in some simple and straightforward manner, then there would be no use in racking our brains, all we would have to do is calculate the moment for social revolution in the same way as astronomers plot the movement of a planet, and then we could sit back and observe. In reality, the relation between classes produces political struggle above all else. What is more, the NAL outcome of that struggle is determined by the development of class forces. The entire historical process, which embraces centuries, depends upon a multitude of secondary economic, political and national cultural conditions, but above all it depends on the revolutionary energy and political consciousness of the struggling combatants, on their tactics and their skill in seizing the political moment. Throughout the entire class struggle, state power plays an enormous role. With the aid of state power, a social class can maintain its supremacy even in spite of economic conditions. That is why in Western Europe capitalism has long stood in the way of the economic development of society. With the aid of state power, it is possible to accelerate the transition from capitalism to socialism in the same way as capitalism itself, simply by use of military force, has destroyed older economic forms and hastened the transition to capitalist production. Intermediate political forms are even more susceptible to change. For decades, Russian autocracy has itself maintained power by use of force despite the economic and political development of the country. Without a social revolution in Western Europe, it is presently impossible in Russia to realize socialism. But the question of what form capitalist rule might take, how strong its state power might be, what kind of parliament might exist, how democratic the further development of our fatherland might be, and what role the proletariat will play, all these issues depend on the victory of the revolution, on how it develops, on the revolutionary energy of the workers, on the political decisiveness of social democracy, and on whether we succeed, even for a short time, 
in using state power in the interest of the toiling masses. Whatever the form of organization, what is required above all else is joint work between the rival factions of Russian Social Democrats. In the course of its development, the movement will change and adopt the appropriate organizational form, yet people have been thinking the child must be made to tee the jacket. There is no iron straight jacket that can hold back growth of the workers' movement. Whether the revolution develops on its own or is organized, whether we enter a provisional government or send Democrats, above all social democracy must act as a single, uni-ed party. Whatever the tactic might be, it is RST necessary to create a political force in order to implement it. Apart from such a force, no theoretical discussions will serve any purpose. If there is such a force, then it will ultimately end its way to a proper tactic, the events will prevail over the ideas and plans of any chieftains. 23. The principal theme of Parvis's writing in 1905 was the urgent necessity of organizing the workers and preserving their tactical independence vis a vis all other parties and movements. Convinced that the Tsarist regime had sounded its own death knell in the war with Japan, he and Trotsky joined in single minded commitment to proletarian revolution. In the document that follows, Parvis makes the case for an exceptional revolutionary outcome based upon Russia's unique history and the resulting peculiarities in the alignment of class forces. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. What was accomplished on the 9th of January? The bloody Sunday of 9th January 24th begins a new era in Russia's historical destiny. Russia has entered the revolutionary period of its development. The old order is breaking apart and a new political formation is rapidly taking shape. Only recently, the ideological propaganda of revolution forewarned of events and for that reason seemed to be utopian, now it is events that are revolutionizing people's minds, and the determination of revolutionary tactics lags behind revolutionary developments. The revolution is driving political thought forward. In just a few revolutionary days, Russian public opinion has completed a more fundamental critique of governmental authority, and has more clearly denet its attitude to forms of government, than one might expect during years of development, even if the country enjoyed a parliamentary order. The idea of reform from above has been thrown aside. Along with it, any faith in the popular mission of the autocracy has simultaneously vanished. The revolution, making its imprint on all political tendencies and points of view, is generating a unifying ferment of opposition. Party differences are momentarily obscured by a common revolutionary task. At the same time, the revolution is driving the ideology of liberalism to its political limits. The liberal party now thinks of itself as being more radical than it can possibly be in reality, it is promising more and taking upon itself greater tasks than it could ever achieve with the help of those social strata upon whom it depends. The revolution is driving all opposition parties to the left and drawing them together in a common revolutionary idea. A revolution clary es the political change, but it also blurs the lines between political parties. This is an historical law that cannot fail to operate during our revolutionary epoch in Russia, where it nds particularly favorable conditions in certain unique aspects of the country's political development. In Russia there has not been and never could be a clear delineation of political forces. To produce such a classy cation of society's political forces, and to counterpose them in terms of their particular economic interests, is one of the historic tasks of parliamentarism. With the ideological formula of popular government, parliamentarism draws every stratum of society into the struggle for political power. In the context of this struggle, which is legalized and regulated, the various classes determine their mutual political relations and take measure of each other's strength. But, in Russia, the different political tendencies, with the exception of proletarian class struggle and social democracy, of which more will be said later, have hitherto developed only in the ethereal realm of ideology, they have sought contact with the people, or with society, only in a very narrow sense of the word, that is, with the bourgeoisie. The undained, formless, and eating masses are driven by political winds rst in one direction and then another, easily dissolving and then reassembling. 
parties adopt policies of the moment that can sharply contradict the requirements of their own political development, which are determined by the particular social strata upon which they are mainly based. The Russian Zemstvo, 25 for example, which presently represents the main support of liberalism in Russia, is creating for parliamentary Russia an agrarian party with acutely conservative tendencies. Absolutism suppressed any political struggle of the agrarians against industrial capital with the result that it made enemies of both of them. One of the effects of agrarian Russia's inability to give political expression to the struggle against advancing capitalism was a more intensive literary critique of industrial capitalism. Due to class divisions among the agrarians themselves and the unions of cultural developments in Western Europe, and in accordance with an imminent law that governs the development of all revolutionary criticism, this critique took on a democratic character. But because it did not lead to working-class socialism, which had already developed outside of Russia, it ultimately ended in a Tolstoyan doctrine. Failing to end cultural unity beyond capitalism, it ended up denying culture in general, that is to say, it raised its own idealistic asco to the level of an historical principle. In capricious and sometimes striking tones, mixing together an artistic reaction of life with the illusions of visionaries, and a vital urge for development with the romanticism of a bygone age, the ideas of this literary phantasmagoria became tangled up with political ideology and had the effect of further masking the underlying class motives of different political interests. This mixing of shin with politics spread to all parties in the form of Narodnishistvo. 26 With the exception of social democracy, it resulted in Bell's lettre taking precedence over radical tendencies. Everyone knows that political radicalism in Western Europe depended mainly on the petty bourgeoisie, that is, on the artisans and generally on that part of the bourgeoisie that took part in industrial development but at the same time was not part of the class of capitalists. It must be remembered that the artisans of Western Europe created the cities. The cities arished under their political leadership, and the master craftsmen put their stamp on several centuries of European culture. While it is true that the power of the craftsmen had long ago vanished by the time the parliamentary regime appeared, the existence of numerous cities remained a politically important fact, and within them only the emerging proletariat challenged the numerical predominance of the middle strata of society. As these social forces dissolved into the class contradictions of capitalism, democratic parties faced the task either of moving closer to the workers and becoming socialist, or else moving closer to the capitalist bourgeoisie and becoming reactionary. But, during the pre-capitalist period in Russia, the cities developed more along the lines of China than in accordance with the European pattern. They were administrative centers with a purely bureaucratic character and did not have the slightest political sine cans, in economic terms, they were merely commercial bazaars for the surrounding gentry and the peasantry. Their development had hardly progressed at all when it was interrupted by the capitalist process, which began to create large cities in its own pattern, that is, factory cities and centers of world commerce. The result is that, in Russia, we have a capitalist bourgeoisie but not the intermediate bourgeoisie from whom political democracy in Western Europe emerged and upon whom it depended. In Russia, as in the whole of Europe, the middle strata of today's capitalist bourgeoisie consist of the so-called liberal professions, that is, of doctors, lawyers, writers, etc., or those social strata that stand apart from the relations of production, and secondly, of the technical and commercial personnel of capitalist industry and trade and the corresponding branches of industry such as insurance companies, banks, and so forth. These diverse elements are incapable of producing their own class program, with the result that their political sympathies and antipathies endlessly waver between the revolutionism of the proletariat and the conservatism of the capitalists. In Russia, moreover, there are also other déclassé elements, or the refuse of classes and strata from pre-reform Russia that have yet to be absorbed by the capitalist process of development. It is in this urban population, which has never passed through the historical school of the West European Middle Ages, and which has no RM economic connections, past traditions, or ideal of the future, that political radicalism in Russia must end its support. That it should look elsewhere is no surprise. 
on the one side, it xes upon the peasantry, and, in this context, the bell's lettre character of Russian Narodnishistvo nds its clearest expression, substituting a literary apotheosis of labor and need in place of a class political program. On the other side, political radicalism in Russia attempts to base itself upon the factory workers. It is in these conditions that the Russian Revolution is doing its work of drawing together and unifying the different anti-government tendencies. This drawing together of diverse elements constitutes the strength of the revolution before the upheaval occurs, but it also constitutes its weakness afterwards. Following the overthrow of the government, against which a common struggle was waged, the diverse and contradictory interests of the many political tendencies that coalesced in the revolution re-emerge, and the revolutionary army becomes disorganist and disintegrates into its mutually hostile parts. Until now, this has been the historical fate of all revolutions in class-divided society, and no other kind of political revolution is conceivable. We all know that, in the revolutions of 1848, this internal struggle was already so intensive that it completely paralyzed the political force of the revolution and cleared the way for reaction and counter-revolution, which in France ended in the bourgeoisie's bloody reprisals against the same workers alongside whom it had just waged the revolutionary struggle. Following the overthrow of autocracy in Russia, the capitalist bourgeoisie will detach itself from the proletariat just as quickly as it did in Western Europe in 1848, but the revolutionary process will be much more protracted. This results from the complexity of political tasks that the revolution must full ll. It is a question not simply of changing the political regime, but also of creating for the RST time a state organization that can embrace all the numerous aspects of life in a modern industrial country and replace the scalp police system into which the autocracy unilaterally evolved. In addition, there is the confusion of agrarian relations in Russia and, as we have already indicated, the formlessness and social incoherence of the non-proletarian political tendencies within the country. In view of these objective conditions for the revolution's development in Russia, what are the tasks of the Social Democratic Party? Beyond the overthrow of autocracy, which is just the starting point of the revolution, social democracy must keep in view the entire subsequent development. It must not adapt its tactics to any single political moment, but must instead prepare for a long process of revolutionary development. It must develop a political force that will be able not just to overthrow the autocracy, but also to take the lead in this revolutionary development. The only such force is the proletariat, organized as a unique class. Placing the proletariat at the center and the head of the revolutionary movement of the whole people and the whole of society, social democracy must simultaneously prepare it for the civil war that will follow the overthrow of autocracy, for the time when it will be attacked by agrarian and bourgeois liberalism and betrayed by the political radicals and the democrats. The working class must understand that the revolution and the collapse of autocracy are not the same thing, and that, in order to carry through the political revolution, it will be necessary to struggle RST against the autocracy and then against the bourgeoisie. Even more important than the proletariat's consciousness of its political uniqueness is the independence of its organization and its real distinction from every other political tendency. We are told of the need to unify all the revolutionary forces in the country, but it is even more important that we take care not to divide and dissipate the proletariat's revolutionary energy. It is imperative, therefore, that the proletariat have its own unique organization and policy, not just in the interest of the class struggle, which continues before the revolution, during it, and even after it, but also in the interest of the revolutionary upheaval itself. At the same time, this must not entail either the political isolation of the proletariat or indifference to the political struggle of the other parties. It is imperative to grasp the political situation in all its complexity and to avoid simplifying things merely to end easy answers to tactical questions. It is an easy matter to say, together with the liberals, or against the liberals. Nothing could be simpler, but these would be extremely one-sided and therefore false responses to the issue. We must make use of all revolutionary and oppositional tendencies, yet, at the same time, we must know how to preserve our own political independence.
In the case of a joint struggle with temporary allies, all of this can be summarized in terms of the following points. 1. Do not blur the organizational lines. March separately, but strike in unison. 2. Do not waver in our own political demands. 3. Do not hide differences of interest. 4. Keep watch of our allies in the same way as we watch our enemies. 5. Pay more attention to taking advantage of the situation created by the struggle than to the maintenance of an ally. Above all else, this means organizing the proletariat's revolutionary cotters as the force that must eliminate the political ballast in the way of revolution. In this category I include the unions of all those social strata and political parties that march in unison with the proletariat up to the overthrow of the autocracy but then, because of their manifest hostility, political indecision and lack of resolution, end up delaying, weakening and distorting the political revolution. We must drive forward all the various tendencies of political democracy and radicalism. To drive the Democrats forward means to criticize them. There are some queer minds, however, who think this means luring them with tender words, as one would attract a lapdog with sugar. The Democrats are always ready to stop halfway, and, if we approve of them for the short stretch of road they have traveled, then they will stop. To criticize them in words alone is not enough. Political pressure is needed, and this brings us back to the revolutionary party of the proletariat. The class struggle of the Russian proletariat was clearly the net even under absolutism. The same condition that impeded the development of petty bourgeois democracy also promoted proletarian class consciousness in Russia, that is, the weak development of the handicraft form of production. The proletariat found itself immediately concentrated in factories. It immediately faced economic domination in the most advanced form of a capitalist who stands apart from direct production, it also faced state power in its most concentrated form of autocracy, which relies exclusively upon military force. To all of this social democracy directly added the historical experience of the West. The Russian proletariat has shown that it did not pass through these three forms of schooling for nothing. It has steadfastly pursued its own, independent revolutionary politics. It created the Russian Revolution, it united around itself both the people and society, but it also avoided any dissolution of its own class interests in the general revolutionary movement, putting forth instead its own political program of workers' democracy. In the interest of its class struggle, it demands political freedom, and along with civil rights it also demands labor legislation. Our task now is to make the eight-hour day just as much a central postulate of the revolutionary uprising as the budgetary rights of parliament. We must not only give a proletarian character to the political program of the revolution, we must also avoid, under any circumstances, lagging behind the revolutionary course of events. If we want to distinguish the revolutionary proletariat from all other political tendencies, then we must know how to stand at the head of the revolutionary movement and be more revolutionary than anyone else. If we lag behind revolutionary development, then the proletariat, precisely because of its revolutionary character, will not be embraced by our organizations and will dissolve into the spontaneous revolutionary process. Our tactic must be revolutionary initiative. The RST Act of the Great Russian Revolution is completed. It has placed the proletariat at the center of politics and united around it all of society's liberal and democratic forces. This is a two-sided process, the revolutionary consolidation of the proletariat and its rallying of all the opposition forces in the country. If the government makes no concessions, this revolutionary process will progress steadily. The proletariat will become increasingly united and steeped in revolutionary consciousness. Our task is to translate this into revolutionary organization. It is an open question whether society's liberal elements will follow this development or become frightened by the growing revolutionary strength of the proletariat. In all likelihood, they will waver RST in one direction and then the other, in their fear of revolution, they will turn towards the government, but the government's reprisals will then turn them back towards the revolutionaries. The democratic elements will remain under the unions of the workers. But these elements, as we have already indicated, 
are especially weak in Russia. Ever greater masses of peasants will be attracted into the movement, but their only capacity is to create greater political anarchy in the country. They will weaken the government as a result, but they are unable to constitute a coherent revolutionary army. This means that with the revolution's development a steadily increasing share of its political work will fall to the proletariat. At the same time, the proletariat will increase its own political self-awareness and grow in political energy. The Russian proletariat has already become a revolutionary force that has accomplished far more than other peoples in times of revolutionary insurrection. It is no coincidence that the people have risen up in such great masses throughout the entire country. The peoples of Germany and France won. Their freedom with far fewer losses. The resistance of the Russian government is incomparably greater thanks to the military power at its disposal, but this resistance will serve merely to amplify the proletariat's revolutionary energy. When the Russian proletariat nally overthrows the autocracy, it will be an army steeled in revolutionary struggle, RM in its determination, and always prepared to use force to support its political demands. In 1848, the French proletariat already succeeded in compelling the provisional government to include its representatives. Since the revolutionary government could not survive without support from the workers, it played out the comedy of state concern for their needs. The Russian workers, having already imposed their proletarian demands on the political program of the revolution, will be much stronger at the moment of upheaval and at least as forceful as French workers were in 1848 in expressing their class consciousness, they will certainly have their own people in the government. Then social democracy will face a dilemma, either to take upon itself responsibility for the provisional government or else to stand aside from the workers' movement. Whatever social democracy decides, the workers will regard this government as their own. Having created it through revolutionary struggle and become the main revolutionary force in the country, they will take even remeter control of the government than might be possible through election Lee ETS. Only the workers can complete the revolutionary upheaval in Russia. A Russian provisional government will be a government of workers' democracy. If social democracy stands at the head of the revolutionary movement of the Russian proletariat, then this government will also be social democratic. If it lags behind the proletariat in revolutionary initiative, then social democracy will be reduced to an insignificant sect. A social democratic provisional government will not be able to complete the socialist revolution in Russia, but the very process of liquidating the autocracy will give it favorable conditions for political work. All of us who have fought in Western Europe against participation of individual social democratic representatives in a bourgeois government have argued not that a social democratic minister should be concerned solely with the social revolution, but that, by remaining in the minority in such a government, and lacking Sufsian political support in the country at large, 